Chapter 16, Order and Chaos September 2, 1991, Hogwarts The witch then gave them a severe frown, I will provide each of you with a match. Using the information, I just gave you, you have until the rest of the class to transform them into needles. The first to accomplish such a task will gain a personal lesson from me, on any transfiguration topic you want, that is valid until the end of your schooling. If you don't realize it, it is not an opportunity I grant easily. Now, get on with it. Let's see what you can do. With a wave of her wand, dozens of matchsticks levitated from her desk and were divided between the students, each with a small pile to use. The entire class stared at the matchsticks in front of them waiting for more instruction, but the professor gave them a glare, are you waiting for the matchsticks to turn by themselves? Hurriedly, everyone started to try casting the two spells, while Harry was simply flabbergasted by the fact that no instruction beyond the name of the spells and the wand movements. He had read a few magical theory books during the previous month, and there hadn't been a single explanation why waving your wand in a certain pattern and muttering a few words in Latin could result in a spell. The only guide was a reference to arithmancy, which he still hadn't started studying. Curious about the effects, he picked up his wand, waved it at one of the matchsticks with the correct wand movement and muttered the spell, Virto. Suddenly, he could feel the magic travel throughout his body to the wand, then be expelled by its tip. The magic was different than any of his bastardized wandless spells. Its melody was a paradox of order and chaos that seemed to work, and yet the match stayed unchanged. Seeing that something was different, he retraced the steps to casting the spell while making sure to picture the change of the matchstick to become pointier. The melody changed again with the same frequency and organized chaos, and the magic traveled through his body to his wand and the matchstick slowly became pointier. He redid this process until it looked more like a wooden needle than a matchstick. It was baffling. There was no reason why the magic worked. When he tried using his wandless spells, he needed to convince his magic towards his arms and shape it, imbue it with intent, to get the result he wished for, and even then, it was chaotic. And yet with a few movements of his wand, everything was so automatic. The magic was absorbed by his wand, the movements did the control for him, and the intent was put in the incantation. It was just wrong that weeks of effort could be completed with a wand in seconds. No wonder wands were so commonly used in the magical world. Well, back to the assignment at hand, Harry decided to try his hand at changing the material of the spell, Muto. As expected, the spell worked immediately, and the matchstick started to turn silver. Harry, though, listened to the spell's melody. It was very similar to the alteration spell, but it was more robust, more fundamental, in a way. For lack of a better explanation, the chaos was more influential than the order. It was very hard to put into words, but McGonagall wasn't lying when she said that transfiguration was the magic of change. In a way, its melodies felt more like transitions between order, chaos, and then order, battling each other yet fitting perfectly. It didn't take Harry long to master the two spells. He could turn the matchstick pointy with a single spell, and then change its constitution with another. He even decided to add decorations a few times to make things more challenging. Although Harry couldn't make it so the needle could have multiple materials. Harry looked around to see how his classmates were doing, and they seemed to be absolutely stuck. No one was able to do anything, except for Seamus Finnegan that exploded one of his matchsticks. Even Hermione Granger and Neville Longbottom were looking at their matchsticks with frustration on their faces. Seeing that he didn't have any competition, Harry chose to make it interesting. He was going to try to turn the matchstick into a needle in one go. At first, he started to use the two spells in successions, with both the wand movements and the incantation, Virto Muto. It worked. The matchstick had turned into a needle, but the spells weren't really in succession. There were two distinct spells, but they sort of merged into each other. He could feel it in the song. The final order stage of the first spell had slightly merged into the second one, and in a way, the final melody became longer. This was new. He had never known that spells could merge like this before. Frowning, he remembered that the magic he had listened to all over the castle was not sequential. It was not a single melody, but a veritable symphony where every stage was working together. And so, he tried to find a way to combine the two spells. After all, wouldn't it be better to use one spell instead of two? He closed his eyes to feel the two melodies of the spell. Their structure was very similar, order, chaos, and finally order once more. He tried to combine the two melodies of order the preparation phase into a single one. The two spells combined seamlessly. However, it was in the chaos phase when something was wrong. 
the chaos was simply hard to combine with a similar element. After a few tries, Harry decided to simply follow the rest of the magic in the castle and simply turn the chaotic aspect into two melodies instead of a combined one. He compressed and stretched the tempo slightly until it just seemed to click. The final order phase was easily done. With that done, Harry grabbed his wand and waved it with the same tempo as the symphony in his mind, and spoke the words, Mudo Verto. The matchstick then turned into a needle with a simple spell. The wood became pointier while turning into metal at the same time. Harry grinned at his accomplishment before stiffening when he noticed the professor standing in front of him and the look of Ablaze was giving him. He looked up to see the deputy headmistress with a small smile on her face, Well done, Mr. Potter. It seems like you have a gift for transfiguration. Very impressive indeed. Twenty points to Slytherin. The entire classroom had stopped talking or trying to cast and was just looking at him with looks of awe and envy on their faces. Hermione Granger seemed to try to disintegrate him with her glare and Neville Longbottom was glaring hatefully at him for some reason. Harry simply shrugged. He didn't care what they thought of him. As the professor walked back to her desk, Blaze gave him a curious look, How did you do that? Shrugging, Harry answered, I just followed the instructions. Incantations and wand movements, until I got used to it. Ignoring his grumbling roommate, Harry looked at McGonagall who was telling him to come to see her at her desk. When he arrived there, she waved her wand, and the entire class became silent. He looked around in confusion before the professor answered his unspoken question, a simply privacy charm, Mr. Potter. They cannot hear us, and we cannot hear them. You asked to see me, Professor. Yes, I did. Do you realize what you were doing in the end? Said Professor McGonagall. I combined the two spells together. I wanted to change the shape and the material of the matchstick at the same time. The professor raised an eyebrow, yes, and in the meantime, you created a spell. You made up the wand movements and changed the incantation. Sure, it was a simple combination of effects, it is impressive, and also dangerous. I don't understand, it worked as it should have. Harry protested. Accidents during spell creation are very common, and they can be fatal. There's a reason it's a newt elective, after all. Many brilliant wizards and witches have lost their lives trying out spells that rebounded and killed them. In trying out what you did today, you could have accidentally not only injured yourself but your classmates as well, she explained with a severe tone. Harry looked down, embarrassed, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. The woman huffed in amusement, I'm not admonishing you, Mr. Potter, but try to be more careful next time. Speaking of this, how did you even do it without using any arithmancy? I guess it just came to me naturally, Professor, Harry replied. The professor grumbled something about prodigies and released a chuckle, well, I know that you will try to do that again. Although, I insist that you do it in the company of a professor or at the very least a prefect, in case you hurt yourself. Do not be afraid to experiment Mr. Potter but remember that your safety is more important than whatever spell you are trying to create. The young Potter gave her a bright smile but then asked, Professor, I had a question. What is it? I read our textbooks and I never saw any of the spells we did today. The professor gave him a slight smile, you probably won't find them in any recent textbook. They were standard when I was a student, but the ministry tends to regulate which books are allowed to be on the recommended reading list. Not one of them had the appropriate spells inside, choosing to rely mostly on the theory, with the spells that are necessary for students to complete their owls. I always give my first years this challenge to teach them the foundations of transfiguration books. Harry decided to ask her another question, I have to ask, are there any limitations to these two spells? Because I don't think I mastered transfiguration in a single spell. The professor had mirth in her eyes, I would be out of a job if you did, Mr. Potter. Yes, there are many limitations to these two spells. The alteration spell can only change solid structures with similar mass, and the mutation spell can only alter solid materials, and even then, a lot of materials cannot be turned into, like gold silver, and copper, although there are certain transfiguration laws involved. Your achievement may be notable, but there are many similar spells, that are more efficient, that have been created. You're not a transfiguration master yet, Mr. Potter, although, I can certainly see the potential for you to do so. Now, get back to your desk and help your classmates. Harry gave the professor a smile and walked back to his desk. Blaze gave him a curious look, what did she want? She just congratulated me and answered a few questions I had regarding the spells she gave us. 
Like what? Malfoy asked with a sneer on his face. Harry shrugged, like why they were not in the required books for the class. Apparently, she can only recommend certain books because of the ministry, and none of them had these spells in there. Finding no interesting gossip, they all returned to their assignments, while far more subdued since the prize was already taken by Harry. As for the young Potter, he simply practiced his new spell trying to make the change occur faster and more efficiently magically. He was quite proud of the results. He also tried to help Blaze, but it didn't seem to work. By the end of the class, the only other person who had any results was Hermione Granger, whose match was slightly pointy with a silver tinge. It wasn't anything close to even Harry's first attempt, but McGonagall seemed to think it was impressive, considering the small smile on her face when she awarded the young Gryffindor five points. The girl had given him smug looks after that, for some reason. Even in this life, he couldn't understand girls. Afterwards, Harry and the rest of the Slytherins made their way to the Charms classroom for their first lesson. Considering Professor Flitwick's reputation as a Charms master and a former dueling champion, Harry was especially excited about this lesson. Chapter 17, Charming Housemates September 2, 1991, Hogwarts Afterwards, Harry and the rest of the Slytherins made their way to the Charms classroom for their first lesson. Considering Professor Flitwick's reputation as a Charms master and a former dueling champion, Harry was especially excited about this lesson. Finding the Charms classroom was a lot more difficult than the Transfiguration one. Harry encountered his very first moving staircase on the way and ended up getting on the wrong one. Well, it wasn't the wrong one, it was the right staircase, but the wrong exit, somehow. Harry was still very confused about it. Whoever designed this castle had to be high, or something. Because no sane mind would think that this mess was a good way for children to move around. He had almost gotten lost despite the map but simply asked one of the portraits for directions, and they were happy to help. By the end, Harry was able to get to class a couple of minutes early and sat down at the front of his class. He was later joined by Blaze who seemed oddly attached to him for some reason. Oddly enough, Neville Longbottom and Ron Weasley arrived far later than even the other Gryffindor. Still, Professor Flitwick simply gave them a verbal warning and didn't really chastise them. Well, it was the first day of school, accidents are expected, really. With everyone having calmed down, the professor jumped on a stack of books with a very impressive sense of balance and introduced himself, Welcome to your first year of charms. My name is Phileas Flitwick, and I will be your senior charms professor for the next few years, which means that we will see each other for quite some time. As you well know, Charms is a core subject that is mandatory for you to have for the next five years. Everyone here will hopefully sit his owls in five years, after which you will decide if you wish to continue studying the subject further or not. Professor Flitwick was short, about as tall as the average first year, which was probably because of his ancestry as a half-goblin. Hybrids of that nature were quite rare, especially because of the goblin wars that ended barely a century ago. Even then, offspring of mixed races were rare and Harry didn't want to think about the possible complications that might have happened. The man looked jovial, and his smile lit the room. Immediately, the entire class was far more comfortable with the half-goblin than they were with Professor McGonagall. Flitwick looked more approachable by the rest of the children, at least compared to McGonagall, whose severe, no-nonsense attitude endeared her to Harry. The class even burst into laughter when he almost fell down the stack of books he was standing on when he called Longbottom's name. Harry sighed in exasperation as the boy was preening when that happened. People really needed to stop enabling the boy, or he wouldn't amount to anything. Although, the professor had given Harry an odd fond look when he said his name. Not that it would change anything, really. After the roll call, Flitwick started lecturing, the magical field of charms, by definition, is imbuing a property to an object or a person. As you can imagine, it's a very large field that dabbles with dueling, enchantment, ward building and breaking, and so much more. You can see charms everywhere, and it is without a doubt the most currently used field of magic in the world. We will start today with the simplest charm that every single wizard and witch needs to learn, the wand lighting charm. With a wave of his wand, the name of the spell appeared on the board, the wand lighting spell, commonly known as Lumos because of its incantation, is a spell with no wand movement, that charms the end of your wand to light up. Usually, charming a wand in any way is very dangerous but this charm was perfected in a way that doesn't truly interact with the magic of the wand after being cast. You will study the theory in more depth should you take arithmancy in your third year, but the spell is remarkably easy to cast, 
yet its theory is remarkably complicated as well. Flitwick then flicked his wand while saying Lumos and the tip of his wand illuminated itself. The small professor then continued, another characteristic of the spell is the fact that its power output cannot change. You cannot blind someone by overpowering a Lumos charm, but variations of the charm where this restriction is removed can do some serious damage. Now, everyone, take out your wands and flick them while saying the incantation clearly, Lumos. In a single breath, the entirety of the class spoke the word Lumos loudly. Unexpectedly, a third of the class, including Harry, had the end of their wands light up with white light. Well, that was easier than transfiguration, that's for sure. Harry's classmates were looking around with wonder, having cast a spell successfully, probably for the first time in their lives. Although Harry didn't pay attention to their looks, and simply decided to listen for the spell's melody. It was surprisingly beautiful for such a simple spell. It felt more like classical music, in its restriction. But what was more remarkable was the fact that it didn't behave at all like transfiguration. There wasn't any of the chaos and order, just a melody but it wasn't the one that played it. It sent a command with the energy and the object that played it. In a way, it was a fundamental difference between it and transfiguration. It was like the wand sent the energy and sheet music, but it was the charmed object itself that played the music. The main question was how charms react if the object itself was playing another melody if it was already charmed. Harry absent-mindedly muttered, Knox, to dispel the light and raised his hand. The professor immediately called on him, Professor, how does a charmed object behave if someone adds an additional charm to it? The half-goblin let out a proud grin at the question, What a wonderful question, Mr. Potter. It depends on the charm, really. Sometimes the strongest charm wins out, sometimes both cams cancel each other out, and sometimes they can even damage the object. However, there are techniques that can combine charms into layers, which is aptly named, charm layering. Alas, this is a far more advanced subject than this year. Take ten points to Slytherin for a very good question. Harry nodded, satisfied with the professor's answer. It must depend on the song, really. If the songs harmonize, it would be theoretically possible for the two melodies to be played at once as a single symphony. However, if they don't synchronize, they can either cancel each other out, or just the one with the stronger power source take over. The professor then continued to explain the properties of the extinguishing charm, Nox, which can actually cancel out most sources of light, at least if they have been charmed to glow. It doesn't really work on enchanted objects, since they usually have an independent power source powering the enchantment, nor would it work on something like sunlight since it's reapplied. But it is technically possible to extinguish the candle using the charm. When the professor started teaching variations of the charms to make the light have different colors, Harry started to hear the difference in each spell and slowly understand it. Discreetly, by the end of the lesson, Harry had started to slowly modify the Lumos charm to have its colors change on a cycle and was prodding to see which part of its melody handled the power limiter, although to no avail. Spells just felt unstable whenever he changed things willy-nilly, and he chose not to cast any of them, remembering McGonagall's warnings. Still, it was a fun class that ended too quickly in Harry's opinion, but they were finally done with the classes. It was looking like Monday was going to be Harry's favorite class. Charms and transfiguration were fascinating. Harry looked down at his schedule and groaned in exasperation. He had most of the classes with the Gryffin doors. Why the school tried to encourage this needless rivalry, Harry didn't know. It was like whoever made that schedule wanted to make the professor's life miserable. Harry didn't miss the obvious glares Longbottom and Malfoy were sending at each other, that's not mentioning Ron Weasley even calling Harry a slimy snake when they hadn't even talked to each other yet. Still, the Weasley had latched onto Longbottom like some kind of lackey, which wasn't really uncommon, since Malfoy had two of his own. Harry was oddly reminded of stories of gang wars, not schoolyard fights. The sight was so ridiculous it was almost funny. Also, for some reason, Hermione Granger and Neville Longbottom wouldn't stop glaring at him. He never even talked to them ever before. Well, he did talk to Granger on the plane, but he was perfectly polite and helpful. Sure, the girl might be slightly jealous of Harry's skill with his magic, but the way she looked at him made him really uncomfortable. Longbottom, on the other hand, was a mystery. They never interacted with one another, not that Harry particularly cared about a spoiled boy that was probably going to be hunted down by the not-so-dead Dark Lord that killed his parents. Harry really wished that he won't be constantly glared at for most of his lessons. At least the theoretical lessons were with the junior professors. 
It turned out that it was impractical to have a single professor be responsible for the classes of every single student in every single house. There are over 200 pre owl students in the castle, which means that each teacher will have to give out and correct assignments for every single one of them. That's not mentioning the newt students and practical classes. So, each core class professor can have up to three junior professors that help them mark grades and give out non-critical lessons. Although OWL and NEWT students were handled entirely by the senior professors to prepare for their exams. That meant that half of Harry's classes were taught by these junior professors, not that Harry have ever met them. Curiously enough, the defense against the dark arts teachers was not given to junior professors. Harry heard a rumor from Blaze that the curse actually impacted the junior professors as well which ended up with two dead teachers and a severely injured one. So, Dumbledore elected to only have a single defense professor, because it was traditional. It's not like Dumbledore could publicly say that he was worried that each year would end with a small massacre of defense professors. Still, Harry removed all thoughts of defense curses. He had a date with the most wonderful place in Hogwarts. The most beautiful, that's for sure. He wanted to find the infamous Hogwarts library. Harry went to the Great Hall to get some lunch and asked one of the seniors where the library was. After memorizing its supposed location on the first floor, Harry walked around asking paintings for directions until he found its doors. Harry drew the entrance on his map and with a deep breath, stepped through the open door. The room was vast, with towering bookshelves stretching up to the ceiling and winding staircases leading to upper levels. The shelves were filled with books of all shapes and sizes, some old and tattered, others new and gleaming. The room was dimly lit, with the only source of light coming from the flickering candles on the desks and the chandeliers hanging from the ceiling. As Harry wandered through the shelves, he was amazed by the sheer volume of books that surrounded him. The covers of the books were diverse, some leather-bound with gold lettering, while others had brightly colored covers with intricate designs. Harry took a deep breath. The air was thick with the scent of old parchment and leather-bound books. It was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. Chapter 18 Silence in the Library September 2, 1991, Hogwarts As Harry wandered through the shelves, he was amazed by the sheer volume of books that surrounded him. The covers of the books were diverse, some leather-bound with gold lettering, while others had brightly colored covers with intricate designs. Harry took a deep breath. The air was thick with the scent of old parchment and leather-bound books. It was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. It was without a doubt, the worst thing he had ever experienced. Oh, it looked beautiful from the outside, an endless sea of books and knowledge, and Harry was an academic at heart. But damn, the experience to find a book and read it in the library was so tedious it wasn't even funny. Well, first things first, there is no real organization system for the library. Outside of having sections for school books so that students could find them easily, there were no dedicated sections for general magic. Well, the books were roughly sorted into the general magical field, but nothing more. For example, there is an entire wall dedicated to transfiguration, but it included everything from conjuration to human transfiguration, and there was no order to differentiate any sections in the field. There aren't even any labels on the intended audience of each book, be it for pre-owl students, newt students, or even mastery holders and above. It was just so incompetent, it wasn't even funny. At least, the books were more informative in terms of content and language. The school books were really written for children, not for adults. Although Harry wouldn't imagine a first- or second-year student understanding what appears to be a mastery thesis just for the fun of it. Unless they're walking around with a dictionary, that is. It was in times like these that Harry missed the internet. He had really taken it for granted when it came to academic matters. Theories were reviewed, tested, disproved, and the findings were published and accessible with a few pushes of buttons. The worst thing was that each section library was actually divided into two main categories. The part that Harry aptly called spellbooks, which is geared towards students and simply gives step-by-step -step instructions on how to cast spells, but practically no theory behind it, nor how it was created. It was just recipes, and for all how these were useful, Harry wanted to explore magic, not spells. He wanted to see what made it tick and understand how the symphony in his head worked. That was the beauty of it. The other books were mostly theory books, with more theory than spells. A book can contain less than a dozen spells and be over a thousand pages thick. But these spells were explained on a very fundamental level, which drastically eclipsed his knowledge of theory. Funnily enough, he discovered that while scheming the charms section of the library, he saw a book titled, Light Charms, An Exploration of the Fundamentals and Well, 
there were so many theories and formulas referenced that he was lost a couple of pages in. And the damn thing was about the variations of the Lumos charm. So, yeah, he's going to get started on arithmancy on his own because if he doesn't, most of the library would be useless for him. Well, that settled on which electives he was taking in his third year. Still, with how many theories were being referenced, Harry chose to pick up one of the theoretical owl recaps for every theory visited until their owl years. Oh, Harry had no inclination to cast any of the spells, but it would provide a better understanding of the fundamentals of magic, as well as an understanding of some of the more complicated tomes in the library. He did that for the tomes in Transfiguration, Charms, Arithmancy, and Potions, as well as an interesting book that should explain wand magic. This should keep him busy for a few weeks to digest everything. Harry decided to return to the common room and read these books at his leisure. To do so, he walked towards the librarian, Madame Irma Pants. The young Slytherin put the five books on her desk, I'd like to check these out please. The woman looked at him blankly, you're checking out four owl books and a magical theory one. Harry nodded, yes, we are allowed to take away up to five books, right. The librarian glared at him, if these books are so much as damaged if there is a slight rip in any of the pages, you will pay for the damages and will be banned from the library. Trust me, I know. These books have been enchanted to resist magic, so no repairing charm will help you. Yeah, these books weren't exactly rare, to be honest, and thus easily replaceable. They were your average owl revision books, or more accurately, written for students taking their owls that have been homeschooled. As for the enchantment bit, Harry could feel the book's melodies somewhat. They felt protective, for the lack of better terms. There were probably just the usual copyright charms to make sure the books are not mass copied, with a few extra wards for being a part of the library. The books on the back, the handwritten ones that go deep into the theory were far more violent than them, so they must depend on the book. Still, Harry simply nodded and accepted her condition. He then signed the paper the librarian gave him and waited for him to be given the books, you have two weeks to return the books, any tardiness will result in a fine and a ban from the library until you return the books. You will not be able to take out any other books until you pay the fine. Now go away. Harry thought hummed, I'm sorry, but I had a few questions about the organization of the library please. What is it? The witch responded with obvious irritation in her voice. Well, I don't really understand how it's structured on the way back. I can see in the front where the spell books are sorted by years of study and their reference books, but after the newt books, it feels very chaotic. That's because it is chaotic, the librarian drawled back, there are hundreds of thousands of books in this room. I cannot keep track of them all. The further back you go, the less used the books are. They tend to only be checked out by old students checking a mastery in one subject or another, not a student of Hogwarts. They already know the exact books they need and so they look for them. I haven't had a single complaint so far in my organization, so do not look so outraged. Now, go away. I have better things to do than to pander to a first-year student that still hasn't finished his first week of magical education. Well, that woman was rather unpleasant, that's for sure. All he asked was for her to explain how she organized the books, nothing more. Is she really trying to demean an eleven-year-old boy for her own gratification? It didn't matter, Harry didn't care about the prickly woman. He had gotten his books and so he turned, put the books in his bag and left the room, seeing the library rules printed on the golden plaque. The library rules were reasonable. You are not allowed to eat or drink in the library. You are not allowed to cast any magic inside the library. You are not allowed to take out a book without checking it first there are alarm charms to enforce that and you are not allowed to damage any of the books in any way. Of course, there is the whole late fee and paying for damages thing, but overall, they were very understandable. A miscast spell could burn down the library, and the library housed a lot of rare books that were worth thousands of galleons. Still, the way to the common room was a lot quicker. He might start to get used to the chaotic ways of Hogwarts any day now. Harry passed by the hall for a quick snack for dinner and went to the common room, starting to read his magical theory book. It was very informative. It turned out that magical cores weren't really a thing. A wizard's body acted more like a buffer to magic, where it would absorb magic from the environment and channel it through the body to be unleashed as spells. The magic was absorbed by the heart, or at least near the heart on a metaphysical plane, and spread out through the body using metaphysical channels for each spell. The better the channels, the more powerful the wizard. The channels start to stabilize around a child's 11th birthday, which is why students are invited to Hogwarts at that stage. 
The thing is that a wizard never runs out of magic as long as there is magic around them, instead, their bodies are taxed with every spell, which is why spells are designed to be fired at once in bursts, and not in a continuous way, which would quickly tire the caster. It was also the reason why Azkaban was a prison, since the island was almost devoid of magic, meaning that wizards can't cast anything. In a way, magic was like a muscle. You could train your channels to grow as you grow up. Before the eleventh birthday, it could be dangerous and accidents were prone to happen to overzealous wizards that have tried to train their heirs before Hogwarts, the results were not good ones. Still, a student can slowly use these channels to widen them, allowing them to hold and pass through more magic, making them more powerful. However, on the seventeenth birthday, the magic stabilizes, and the channels stop growing or shrinking. Of course, there are probably a lot of dark rituals to circumvent these limitations, which is what Harry imagined Voldemort had done, considering how inhumane he was rumored to look. Harry was distracted from the book by Blaze who was looking down on him with a frown on his face, where were you? I just went to the library, Harry replied. Malfoy, who was standing behind Blaze, snickered, you should have been a Ravenclaw if you like reading so much. Harry shrugged, there's nothing wrong with reading a book. Well, you have to make up for your mood blood mother somehow. The blonde boy replied with a smug grin on his face. This last sentence had gotten Harry's attention and the common room seemed to quiet suddenly. He slowly put a placeholder in the book, put it in his bag, and then turned to face Malfoy, what did you just say? His voice was barely above a whisper, but the blonde boy shivered slightly, I said. Harry interrupted the boy, I didn't think you were stupid enough to repeat it. Now, let's get something straight, Draco dear. I don't give a damn about you. I don't care if you're a bigot or secretly a troll. You can go around terrorizing Hufflepuffs with threats of your father all you want, but you will not insult my parents. Are we clear? Draco stiffened, how dare you? The boy tried to raise his wand at Harry, probably to cast some kind of spell, until the green-eyed boy simply grabbed the wand out of his hands. The baffled look on the boy's face was priceless. Harry though didn't even look at the wand and instead was staring Draco straight in the eyes. I said, are we clear? With each syllable, Harry was projecting his anger at the boy with his magic. It wasn't even a spell. It was barely more than a party trick, where Harry just changed the symphony, he was releasing to be a violent and angry one but without any intent, but the Malfoy scion seemed to be close to pissing himself. His nod was shaky, and Harry stopped releasing the magic, while suddenly smiling gently, well, that's very good, Draco dear. It's good that we have an understanding, right? Harry handed him his wand and patted him on the shoulders, try not to hurt yourself, dear. Draco had stopped trembling and started to glare once more, my father will hear about this. And you'll tell him what? That you called someone's mother a mood blood in the middle of the common room and that he asked you not to do it again after taking your wand from you and giving it back without using any magic. Good luck with that. Harry didn't even wait for an answer and just grabbed a bag and went to the bedroom. After all, that book wasn't going to read itself. Chapter 19, Trouble Brewing September 3, 1991, Hogwarts Draco had stopped trembling and started to glare once more, my father will hear about this. And you'll tell him what? That you called someone's mother a mood blood in the middle of the common room and that he asked you not to do it again after taking your wand from you and giving it back without using any magic. Good luck with that. Harry didn't even wait for an answer and just grabbed a bag and went to the bedroom. After all, that book wasn't going to read itself. When Harry woke up, having recollected what happened the day before. He really shouldn't have terrified the Malfoy boy this much. The blonde was nothing more than a spoiled brat, that had never been denied or reprimanded in his life. For some reason, the boy just didn't understand that insulting people in public was just a bad idea. Although, the boy did reveal his status as a half-blood, not that it mattered, really, most of Slytherin was made up of half-bloods. Pure bloods really were a dying breed, if they ever were a breed in the first place. The ministry's definition of a pure blood was also very weird. While normally, a pure blood is a wizard or witch whose great great grandparents are all wizards and witches. And yet, for some reason, old families like the Malfoy seemed insistent on not introducing a drop of muggle blood in their families and only considered a wizard or witch as a pure blood if there they didn't have a drop of muggle blood in at least ten generations, which was frankly absurd. With that in mind, Marriage to half-bloods and the odd muggle-born are somewhat common. Honestly, normal people do not care about that, since the number of pure-bloods was so slim. 
less than a tenth of the population could be considered to be pure bloods. Similarly, Muggleborns were also quite rare. No one knew where they came from, or why they developed their magic, but barely three or four students are Muggleborn every year. Everything in between was considered a half blood, which was a very large pool of the population. While Slytherin boasted that it didn't have any Muggleborn students, half bloods were so common that they couldn't be discriminated against, and the fact that they are raised in the magical world seemed to calm them. Even the child of a Muggleborn and a Muggle was technically a half blood and was considered part of the magical world from birth. Now, if Malfoy knew that Harry grew up in the Muggle world, things could have ended differently. But all the boy did was loudly insult his mother in the middle of the common room. Oh, Harry was angry, that's for sure and wanted to punch the boy in the face. Even if he wasn't enraged by the boy insulting his mother, he would have done something similar because it was a bad idea to roll over and let Malfoy walk over him. The boy would have tried to stretch the line as all spoiled children did slowly getting more daring each time. And Harry needed to nip that in the bud to have a peaceful year, even if he had gained the blonde's enmity for it. Which really didn't matter to him. Harry had no intention of befriending the boy, and Malfoy probably had no intention of being civil to him. Still, when Harry went to the common room and started reading one of his owl books. Owls included all of the critical elements in all the previous years of magical education, which practically made the books into some kind of student notes for every magical discipline. And they weren't even written with children in mind, which was Harry's biggest issue with his school books. Considering that he had potions and herbology as his classes for the day, Harry chose to read the potions book. The first year school book was nothing more than recipes of potions, which wasn't what he was looking for. Luckily, summaries of the common ingredients in potions and interactions between them were in the owl book. Harry was so absorbed in his book that he didn't notice Blaze sitting next to him, we're going to get our breakfast, do you want to join us? Harry looked up and saw him standing next to two girls, a blonde girl with blue eyes that he recognized as Daphne Greengrass and a black-haired girl with round glasses and hazel eyes that he recognized as Tracy Davis. The two girls were looking slightly nervous. Harry nodded, sure, let me just pack up my stuff. Harry put a bookmark in his book and put it in his bag. He then grabbed it and joined the other Slytherins to make their way to the Great Hall. While they were walking, Greengrass asked, Say, Harry, where did you get your school bag? Just a small shop in Diagon Alley. It was recommended to me by the trunk shop when I asked if they had any expanded school bags with featherweight enchantments. They just pointed me to a store that sold them. They're very practical and I leave all my books inside if I need them. Davis glared at him, Lucky you. I think I'll ask my mum to get me one. Walking up and down so many steps with heavy bags is so tedious. Blaze chuckled, I told you before, Tracy, that you don't need to bring every book with you to class. Hey, I don't bring every book with me. Daphne chuckled, you do because you're scared of losing them like you did all your old toys. The three of them continued to bicker while Harry just stayed silent and listened to them. He forgot what it was like to just be around people. Harry was alone for so long, with no one to keep him company but himself that he didn't realize that the simple presence of other people his age could change things. Blaze, Daphne, and Tracy were just joking around like all kids their age did, and Harry was completely lost on what he should do. Finally, Tracy chose to include him in their conversation during breakfast, so, Harry, I heard you made Malfoy piss his pants. Daphne just hit her friend's shoulder and glared at her, Tracy. That's such an inappropriate thing to say, she then looked at him, I'm sorry for her. She wasn't taught any manners. Hey, I was taught manners. I just choose not to use them, Tracy replied. Harry snorted, it's all right. And I didn't really hurt Malfoy, he just insulted my deceased mother, and I kindly asked him to not do it again. Blaze snorted, he was shaking at the end of it. Well, I not so kindly asked him to not do it again, Harry drawled back. The three Slytherins grinned before Daphne explained. I'm glad someone finally put Draco in his place. He was such a prat growing up, constantly bragging about his mother and father. You're all familiar with one another, Harry remarked. It wasn't exactly a hard deduction to make. The first year Slytherins had already been divided into groups the moment they were sorted. They definitely knew each other before attending Hogwarts. Yet, yeah, we were all introduced to all of the other Slytherins in our year, Blaze answered, for parties and stuff like that. Although our parents are all friends and are partners in a few businesses, so we saw each other a lot and became friends. As for Malfoy, we only met him during the ministry balls, 
during Daphne's birthday parties since his father had to invite him because they're both in the Wizengamot. But from what I heard from Daphne, I didn't want to be friends with him. Well, that was pretty much elitism at its best. The parents only wanted their children to meet other children with similar stations, be it politically or financially. Magical Britain was also a somewhat close-knit society. There were barely more than a hundred thousand wizards in the British Isles, and so everyone knew the others, or at least, the ones similar to their station. Although Harry stifled a snort when he heard Daphne mutter, I wish I hadn't known him. Their conversations continued, on the way to the herbology greenhouse, for their lesson, which they had with the raven claws. Professor Sprout seemed to prefer practical applications over just reading books and so taught them the basics of growing plants. They were barely more than basic gardening techniques like replanting, watering, and cleaning a few plants. Harry had never taken care of a plant in both of his lifetimes and yet didn't have any difficulty following the professor's instructions. Although, some of the other Slytherins were very disgusted with the idea of playing with dirt. Pansy was practically in tears when her nails were ruined, and Draco was threatening everyone, even the plants, of telling his father about what he was forced to do. Tracy and Blaze didn't look particularly happy doing it either, but Daphne seemed a natural at it, and finished her task before anyone else, without a single stain on her robes. She must have some experience taking care of plants. Thinking back on it, the lesson was probably meant for kids to get used to the idea of getting dirty during herbology lessons. Everyone ended up sprinting to the bathrooms to clean their hands after the lesson. And they all made their way to the history classroom for their other lesson, this time with the Hufflepuffs. Well, they weren't kidding when they said that it was taught by a ghost. The man was just slowly droning what seemed like the exact word for word from the book he recommended, and he didn't even try to change his tone at all. The sad thing was the history of magic could be a very fascinating subject, especially when it came to large-scale magical battles and disasters. It was fascinating, and yet the man was boring. Having read the book, Harry simply swiped back to his potions book and chose to continue reading it until the next lesson. Everyone was asleep minutes later. Adults would have a hard time paying attention to the lessons the ghost was lecturing on. Harry wondered if the man was as boring before his death. The worst thing was that Professor Binns didn't have any junior professors, since he didn't have one when he was alive, and he always taught in his routine schedule. Hell, the schedules were often very similar every year to match the ghost's own schedule for teaching that he refuses to alter even after his death. As for assignments, he never asked for any homework, and he corrects only the finals thanks to the schoolhouse elves. According to Gemma Farley, he doesn't even change the exams every year and copies could easily be bought from older students. Now, the only thing Harry could see going on would be if he stopped using the book for some reason. And so, he endeavored to owl order a dictation quill to take notes for him when he does something better during the lesson. By the time the bell rang, the entire classroom, Slytherins and Hufflepuffs alike, were asleep, and Harry was halfway through his potions book. This lesson was two hours long but they thankfully only had one of them a week. In the end, it was time for the lesson he dreaded the most. Potions. He had no idea if Professor Snape held any animosity towards him. Did James Potter bully the severest Snape as well, or did they not even know each other? Or perhaps, maybe Snape was never friends with Lily Evans at all. From the looks of it, potions looked like a very interesting field of study, and Harry was interested in the specifics. As he made his way to the dungeons, Harry hoped that the professor didn't dislike him on principle, since he was one of his Slytherin. Harry took a look at his schedule and realized that the class was also with Gryffindors. Well, that was a recipe for disaster. Chapter 20, Fame and Glory September 3, 1991, Hogwarts From the looks of it, potions looked like a very interesting field of study, and Harry was interested in the specifics. As he made his way to the dungeons, Harry hoped that the professor didn't dislike him on principle, since he was one of his Slytherin. Harry took a look at his schedule and realized that the class was also with Gryffindors. Well, that was a recipe for disaster. Well, by the end of the potions lesson, Harry was pretty sure that Snape hated him. What the hell had James Potter done to him that he would be this petty to students? That man was without a doubt a menace that shouldn't be around children. Harry had always thought that the stories were romanticized from the point of view of a child. He wasn't abused like the Harry from the stories, he wasn't starved, nor was he bullied by his cousin. As such, Harry somewhat expected Snape to be frosty, not some unhinged man picking on children. Well, first of all, when Harry entered the classroom, he made sure to sit in the back, 
to avoid being called on by Snape. Blaze followed after him and they sat together, waiting for the professor to show up. Everyone had shown up before the professor, he had a fearsome reputation especially when it came to reprimanding Gryffindors. Even Weasley arrived early and sat down obediently waiting for the professor to arrive. The door opened suddenly, and the professor entered the classroom dressed in black with his cape billowing behind him. It was cool, but it was also the highlight of the lesson. The man instinctively seemed to search for Harry and glared at him. After a few seconds, he started his speech, For those of you who do not know, I am Severus Snape, the current senior potions professor in this school. I will have the misfortune to teach you the subtle arts of potions that most of you will fail to truly grasp. Potion brewing is without a doubt one of the most dangerous fields of magic you will learn in this school. A single mistake could cause an explosion that would not only endanger you but also the others around you. Most of the accidental deaths that occur in magical Britain have been attributed to potions, be it an accident by a sub-PAR brewer, or getting poisoned drinking a faulty potion. This is your first and final warning, if you do not take this field of magic seriously, you will answer to me. And believe me, you will wish that you would be dead. The professor looked around the classroom making sure that he had the students' attention before continuing, as there is little foolish wand waving here, many of you will hardly believe this is magic. I don't expect you will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of liquids that creep through human veins, bewitching the mind, ensnaring the senses. I can teach you how to bottle fame, brew glory, even stop or death if you aren't as big a bunch of dunderheads as I usually have to teach. Like most of your want subjects, this class will be divided into theory and practice. I will be responsible for the practical aspects of your lesson, while you will have your theoretical ones with a junior professor. In this room, there are ground rules that you will follow. First of all, you are not allowed to brew any potion outside this room, since you will only risk killing yourselves. Secondly, you will follow my instructions to the letter. If you purposely choose to mess around with potions, you will answer to me. Finally, you will not be allowed to take any of the ingredients and potions outside this room. Am I making myself clear? The entire classroom nodded at once, now, let's begin our lesson, what are potions? Some of you might foolishly believe that it's simply a combination of magical ingredients, but they would be wrong. A potion necessitates magic to be brewed. A squib or muggle cannot brew a potion, although, I will leave the intricacies for your theory lessons. Longbottom. Said Snape suddenly, since you like not paying attention, why don't you explain to me what you would get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of woodworm? The scarred boy, who was snickering with Weasley, stiffened and blushed in embarrassment, I don't know sir. The question wasn't really that hard, but it was mentioned in the potion book in the description of both ingredients. The draft of living death was a very well-known potion that were used on unconscious prisoners after large battles. Prisons tended to be full in times of war, and so, wizards used this potion to make sure they wouldn't escape or cause mayhem. The potion was so popular in the past that there are many muggle fairy tales inspired by this potion. Perhaps this question was just too complicated for you, Snape drawled, maybe this one would be more your speed. What exactly is a bezoar? The boy was clenching his fist, I don't know, sir. The rest of the Slytherins were snickering and Harry could understand why, even if he didn't like it. Bezoars are relatively common ingredients that every child knows about because they can neutralize most poisons. It was also on the first page of the potions book Snape recommended. The fact that Longbottom didn't know that was honestly disturbing. But still, this had gone past a simple punishment, Snape was actively embarrassing Longbottom in front of their peers. The professor was smirking now, one last time. Tell me three ingredients used in the cure for boils. This was a point-blank question about the first potions they were going to brew. Anyone who had even looked at the book would have known that. Unfortunately, it seemed like Longbottom didn't. The scarred boy glared at the professor, I don't know, sir. But why don't you ask Hermione? She seems to know the answer. I have better things to do with my time than to play with potions. True enough. The young Muggleborn was shaking her hand in the air and had actually stood up for the last question. But the way Longbottom was talking back to the professor was beyond insolent, but it was the typical response from a spoiled child that liked flashy magic. That will be ten points from Gryffindor for your insolence, Longbottom. And drop your hand girl, you're embarrassing yourself. The bushy-haired girl had dropped her hand down. Harry noticed that she had watery eyes. Now, that was a very rude thing to say to a young girl that seemed to want to fit in. Oh, she was a know-it-all, 
that's for sure, and she wanted to show the world how smart she was. But she was a girl that wasn't even in her teens yet. The potion master was being purposefully cruel to her. The man then kept asking questions to the Greyfinder students. He tended to give out ones just hard enough that they wouldn't be able to answer them. He didn't ask a question to any of the Slytherin, something that was entirely unfair. He even asked Granger what Harry realized were third-year potions. He was doing his best to beat everyone down as much as possible. Harry stopped paying attention when the man was humiliating Seamus Finnegan and was brought back to reality with the professor's loud voice, Potter. The entire classroom looked back at Harry at once, with disbelief clear on their faces. After all, he was the first Slytherin the professor was going to humiliate. The man's glare was far more intense than it was with even Longbottom, you think you're too good to pay attention, don't you? Well, answer me this, what are three ingredients used to make a draft of peace? Harry tried to remember if he had ever read about a draft of peace, and he did. It wasn't in the first year textbook, it was in the owl book he was reading. The man was asking him questions about an owl level potion. Powdered moonstone syrup of hellebore, and stewed mandrake, said Harry with a dry tone. The man actually reeled back when Harry answered his question correctly. Actually, the entire class was gaping at him, especially Hermione Granger who probably didn't even know the answers. What does the Wigan Weld potion do? Harry simply shrugged, it is a healing potion that is known to cure minor injuries, although it is infamous for being an antidote to the draft of living death, awakening victims of this potion from their endless slumber. The professor didn't seem satisfied, what is the Felix Felicis potion? Felix Felicis, commonly known as liquid luck, is a magical potion that makes the drinker extremely lucky for a period of time, during which everything they attempt would be successful. It is known to be toxic in large quantities, and is very extremely to brew, which takes six months to complete. The professor looked flabbergasted at the answered question, then asked, what is Golpaylot's third law? Harry simply shrugged. I know that it is referenced as a law for making antidotes, but I am unsure of its content. This question was a theoretical one that is explained to Newt students, not first years, and the man seemed to see how caught up he had gotten with his questions. There's a difference between embarrassing unprepared students and asking them post-owl potions questions. The man just sniffed and started speaking to the rest of the class, now, this is not a rule, but I will heavily recommend you read the instructions carefully before you even attend your practical potion lessons with me including researching the ingredients used to brew a simple cure for boils. Now, clear your desks and start brewing. The instructions are on the board. The ingredients necessary are in your desk's drawers. You will brew this potion individually. You have 90 minutes. Harry took a piece of parchment and started writing the instruction on the board. They were somewhat different to that of the books, but Harry chose not to question them, and listen to the professor. It was honestly, a rather riveting experience. Harry stopped caring about what the professor was doing and just started brewing. What he heard while brewing a potion was amazing. The idea was to combine the abstract properties of certain elements and other ingredients to enhance, reverse, or even just stabilize the concoction. Harry saw how the powdered snake fangs acted as stabilizers to the potion, the protection provided by the porcupine quills, that enhanced the small anti-boil properties of the horned slugs. The symphony kept changing and the magic channeled by the rod while stirring was like someone slowly changing the key to the potion's melody. The rod seemed designed to help accelerate certain reactions and encourage certain results from particular combinations. These were standard ones that automatically used the user's magic in a certain quantity, hence the standardized number of stirs for potions. After all, specialized stirring rods are required where the magic channeled is actively controlled by the brewer, which is necessary for delicate potions. By the end, Harry's potion was the exact red from the instructions, and he bottled it and put it on his desk. While the professor was busy with Seamus whose potion had blown up and caused him and Weasley to grow giant painful boils on his face. The man was berating them instead of telling them to get to the infirmary. Still, by the end of it, Snape's reaction to his potion was him muttering, passable. In a disappointing tone and go back to praising Malfoy for his potion which was more orange than red. At least it was better than whatever abomination Longbottom had brewed which the professor mocked loudly for everyone to hear. By the end of the lesson, Harry just grabbed his bag and started to leave, ready to leave, only to see Longbottom waiting for him by the door, I bet you like that, hey, traitor. Harry was confused by what the boy was talking about, do you mind clarifying? Just go away with your Slytherin friends, the scarred boy responded. Harry just rolled his eyes, 
muttered I'm too tired for this, and turned to leave for his common room. He had his fill of childish petty professors and weird scarred boys that glared at him for no reason. Chapter 21, Valencoir September 6, 1991, Hogwarts Harry just rolled his eyes, muttered I'm too tired for this, and turned to leave for his common room. He had his fill of childish petty professors and weird scarred boys that glared at him for no reason. The rest of the week ended unremarkably. Most of the week was with minor professors, who were obviously inexperienced and slightly boring. They definitely didn't have a mastery over the fields as the senior professors do, which was proven by the fact that they didn't teach any OWL students or above. They were boring, wooden in their teaching, and didn't even attempt to engage the students during their classes. Honestly, they were disappointing, so much so, that Harry didn't even remember their names after lessons were done. All they did was practically read the books without really explaining anything. They probably seemed self-explanatory to them since they were adults, but their students were children, and Harry mourned the drop of competent wizards and witches because of them. Although Harry was introduced to two other senior professors. Professor Sinister was the senior astronomy professor, and was quite good at teaching, although Harry would have liked her classes more if they weren't in the middle of the night and had to climb all the way up to the astronomy tower to get there. Although, the telescopes were very impressive. They were enchanted to just ignore the light pollution and were good enough that Harry was able to see one of the moons of Jupiter as if it was as close as Earth's moon. Still, as interesting as all of this was, the entire field was based on memorization, and was only useful for picking herbs and brewing certain potions that could depend on certain celestial bodies. Harry still had no idea why these magics depended on planets and moons that far away, but he wanted to find out. Now, that would be an interesting astronomy lesson. As for defense against the dark arts, well, it was a sham of a lesson. Well, not really, Coral was surprisingly competent as a professor, even if he was jittery and his room stank of garlic. The man taught them basic cast as a first lesson. It was basically a lesson on how to channel magic into a wand to create small blasts of energy. It wasn't even that hurtful, just a small projectile of magic. It didn't even have a melody. It had no intent, no complexity. From the looks of it, defense was not really about fighting, but more about general theory and applications of magic. Oh, there will probably be lessons on jinxes and hexes, but it seems like it's mostly used to bridge whatever is missing in the other core classes. Funnily enough, the class wasn't even named Defense Against the Dark Arts at the beginning, just Battle Magic. A dark-inclined headmaster changed it to Dark Arts. He didn't last long at his post, and his successor a light-aligned headmaster changed it to Defense Against the Dark Arts as an act of opposition to his predecessor. That aside, Harry's week was thankfully uneventful outside of Malfoy and Longbottom becoming eternal rivals or whatever because Malfoy insulted Weasley's mother by calling her a cow. The redhead was defended by Longbottom calling his father a filthy Death Eater, which ended up in a small brawl of first years that barely knew how to use the simple cast, thus cementing the Gryffindor Slytherin rivalry for their year. Honestly, Harry didn't care as long as they kept him out of it. Malfoy seemed to have rallied the entire Slytherin first years to his cause to humiliate Longbottom, except for Blaze, Daphne, Tracy, and himself. He seemed to think that this was some kind of political rivalry between him and Harry for some reason and that they were my allies. Harry didn't know what the hell that kid was learning when he was growing up, but Lucius Malfoy must be a horrible parent to teach his son that this was how the world worked. Honestly, it might not even be Malfoy Sr.'s fault. The Gryffindors seemed to have rallied behind Longbottom, who became their de facto leader. It was seriously messed up. It was a small mercy that the Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs just didn't end up making factions on their own. What the hell was wrong with these children? Harry tried to get away from all of this madness. Gryffindors attacked Slytherins who took it back on other Gryffindors, and the cycle continued. Harry, himself, ended up needing to learn the Contego Charm, a small shielding spell that stopped minor jinxes and spells. It was very easy to learn, but it became a necessity to have a tranquil life as a first year in the castle. The young Potter just wanted to learn magic, not whatever this was. Still, Harry ended up sitting by the Black Lake, in the shade of a large yew tree and continued reading his books. He had finished the potions one, which was far more interesting than whatever the hell Snape was doing. He didn't try brewing anything, he wasn't an idiot, but it was a lot easier to visualize how brewing a potion could work and possibly fix a few mistakes during brewing classes something that Snape utterly ignored. As for the Transfiguration book, it was utterly fascinating. The spell that Harry created was what was known as a general transfiguration spell, which happened to be very inefficient. 
This was why students were taught specialized spells that were far more efficient and learned in their fourth year to combine a few transfiguration spells to get the exact result they wished for. Transfiguring multiple materials was also possible, the general spell was very magically intensive and so it wasn't really taught to students before their third year. Harry was lost in his charms book when he felt the malicious song of a spell going his way. He instinctively grabbed his wand, turned towards the spell coming his way, and cast, Contego blocking it. The Slytherin had no idea who was attacking him or why. When he looked back, he groaned as he saw Longbottom and Weasley glaring at him. Harry just raised an unimpressed eyebrow, why have you attacked me? The two boys seemed surprised that Longbottom's spell didn't work, we don't have to explain anything to you, traitor. Harry shrugged, you don't have to. Your little pissing match with Draco's crew is the talk of the school. Did you really not even wait one week before starting this mess? The boys just kept glaring at Harry who just let out a resigned sigh, look, why don't you just go back to the castle, and we can all pretend that this never happened? I can't tell you how much I don't care about your spat with Malfoy, so go hex him or something, I have better things to do with my time. Harry's answer was, Longbottom sending a pimple hex his way, Fernunculus, which was blocked by another Contego shield. Stop doing that, the Longbottom scion complained. Harry just shrugged. I will not apologize for blocking an offensive spell. But what is the matter with you, anyway? What are you on about? Weasley exclaimed. Well, your friend here has been glaring at me in class ever since, well, ever. We never spoke to each other, and I certainly didn't insult him or anything. So, what's the real reason you are so angry at me? You know why I'm angry at you, traitor. The brown-haired boy exclaimed. No, I really don't and I don't particularly care as well. You're being troublesome with your angry looks and trying to curse me, and I don't really care for it. So, you either leave me alone, or I will start fighting back, and we all know that that's not something you really want. Harry was slightly bluffing with that. Well, he didn't really practice any spells besides a couple of useful hexes and jinxes, that were not that harmful. He mostly just focused on transfiguration and learning the variations of the light charms. They certainly helped him to write his assignments. However, the boy seemed intimidated enough and slowly stepped back. Although Longbottom seemed less apprehensive than Weasley and spoke up, how could you be sorted in Slytherin? By putting on the sorting hat like everyone else. Did you miss it or something? Harry snarked back. The boy blushed, you know what I mean. I don't see the problem, Longbottom, Harry said. The boy looked angry, the parents of your housemates killed my parents killed yours too. And you sitting next to them as if nothing happened. Harry simply shrugged, and why should I care, really? Why should you care, Neville responded as if he was trying to process Harry's response, these are the people that our parents fought against, together. They died to fight them, and you are mingling with them. You're spitting on our family's sacrifice. Our parents fought for their own reasons. They were ready to die for them, as a matter of fact, they did. They would not want their children to endanger themselves needlessly, and if my parents disagreed then they didn't love me. Stop living in the past that will never exist. Your parents are dead, as are mine, and curing anyone that is related to their deaths will not bring them back. The boy was red in anger and yelled out, How dare you! Harry simply shielded against the spell, see what I mean. You're so aggressive for no reason. Neville's eyes were glistening, you don't care about them, don't you? The dead have no preferences, Neville. I have lived my entire life without them. Why should I care about what they would have wanted if I never knew them? I mourn their loss just as you mourn your parents' deaths, but I am consumed by it. It's best to forget about unrealistic dreams and enjoy life. The world will not be always peaceful, after all. I can't believe you. You're supposed to be my godbrother. My mother was your godmother and yours was mine. Does that not mean anything? The Longbottom Scion yelled out. Harry was surprised by that revelation. He didn't think that it was really a thing, and yet, this was the first time we met each other. What did you expect? That I would be with you in Greyfinder, that we would have been as close as brothers the moment we meet one another. The boy looked down, embarrassed, we were supposed to be brothers. I didn't even know I had a god brother when I was younger. You can't call us brothers if we have never met each other before. If the Longbottoms had adopted me, things would be different, but unfortunately, they didn't. However, I'm more than willing to try being friends with you. Harry gave the boy a way out. 
he really didn't want to be friends with Longbottom considering his likely adventures with Voldemort. But if he really was family, Harry was willing to give it a shot. The boy seemed to be enraged even further, it's too late now, you're one of them. One of who, exactly? The Weasley boy seemed to have gathered his courage, slimy snakes. Harry raised an unimpressed eyebrow, so all this hostility isn't because I ignored you, but because I'm in Slytherin. Yes. Both boys yelled. Harry really had no response to that. The issue wasn't even about Harry but what he represented. He was technically a part of Longbottom's backstory, and the boy didn't want it to be tainted with the whole Slytherin thing. Harry just shrugged, I can't really do anything about that, and I'm done with the conversation. The young Potter turned put his book in his bag and was starting to leave. Both Gryffindor didn't seem to want to see him leave, so, they tried casting at him. Harry just dodged the two stinging hexes by crouching down, and cast, Flipendo. A blue arc of magic hit both students at once and knocked the two boys back into the grounds. The spell was slightly modified to act like an arc and not a beam. It was part of the second year curriculum about basic spell manipulation in defense of the dark arts. Harry heard the two boys groaning in pain to make sure they were all right. Well, apparently Longbottom was now an enemy. The last Potter simply shrugged and walked back to the castle. He was getting hungry anyway. Chapter 22, Legacy September 6, 1991, Hogwarts A blue arc of magic hit both students at once and knocked the two boys back into the grounds. The spell was slightly modified to act like an arc and not a beam. It was part of the second year curriculum about basic spell manipulation in defense of the dark arts. Harry heard the two boys groaning in pain to make sure they were all right. Well, apparently Longbottom was now an enemy. The last Potter simply shrugged and walked back to the castle. He was getting hungry anyway. Harry's return to the Slytherin common room was met with cheers from his classmates. Malfoy and Parkinson had come to congratulate him for his victory for some reason, and Draco even exclaimed that he had known that there was a Slytherin hidden underneath all along. Apparently, Longbottom had loudly complained about him in the Gryffindor common room, and now everyone knew, at least a version, about Harry's encounter with Longbottom and Weasley. These kids were weird and Harry just ignored them in favor of exploring his magic. He had found no mention of the melodic heartbeats he heard whenever he was near magic. It was extremely useful when perfecting a spell or even modifying it slightly. It had even helped him sense and dodge the spells from the two Gryffindor boys that attacked him. He did try to look at magical gifts that wizards often had, but magical families tended to be very secretive, unless it was an extremely noticeable one, like Parseltongue, for example. Still, Harry was surprised when he was cornered by Blaze, Tracy, and Daphne, in the common room. Daphne had given him a severe look, so, we are formally against Longbottom and his lackeys. The green-eyed boy tilted his head, what are you talking about? The duel with Longbottom and Weasley, Harry, Tracy explained. What about it? They attacked me when I was reading outside the castle. I tried to talk to them, but they wouldn't listen, so I retaliated. It barely qualified as a duel. Hell, I didn't swear vengeance or anything. I just knocked him around so that he would stop trying to attack me. Well, Longbottom does, and now Malfoy thinks you're supporting his group, Blaze replied. Harry was aghast by the implication, I'm not supporting anyone. I can barely stand being in the same room as Malfoy. And I sure as hell am not going to follow his lead and attack Gryffindors for no reason. As far as I'm concerned, the entire thing is entirely illogical and frankly moronic. Look, after an attack or two from Malfoy, Longbottom will forget all about me, and he'll focus on him. As far as I'm concerned as long as none of us gets attacked for no reason, then I'm not going to involve myself in any of this. The three of them visibly relaxed when he told them that. Had they really thought that Harry wanted to get into childish fights with Gryffindor all the time? This house rivalry was getting too far. Harry could understand that it might help motivate students to do better and to behave, but this was getting out of hand. He only hoped that they would calm down. A week had passed and it didn't look like they would. In fact, the conflict seemed to have escalated to include the second and third years as well. Harry didn't expect the Gryffindor Slytherin spat to turn into an all-out war and yet it did. It was becoming common to walk around the school and see a duel happening between two students. Malicious pranks from the Gryffindors were met by curses from the Slytherin. And the worst thing was that no one seemed to care. The professors broke fights and took off points when they ran across one, but for every fight they stopped, there were ten that they didn't. 
It was during his class with Professor Flitwick that Harry decided to ask a question. The professor was obviously impartial given that he was the head of Ravenclaw. Harry could see that McGonagall was slightly partial to the Gryffindors, and Harry was sure as hell that he wasn't going to ask Snape about it. The man's behavior was visibly colder compared to his classmates, something that everyone had noticed. It was after Charm's class about the color-changing charm that Harry stayed back and asked the half-goblin, Professor, may I have a moment of your time? The jovial professor immediately jumped down and looked Harry in the eye, of course, Mr. Potter, ask away. I'm a little concerned about the whole Grafender Slytherin rivalry that's going on. Does it always go this far? The professor's jovial expression fell slightly, I'm afraid so. It wasn't always like this. Before the war, Slytherin were just students like everyone else. During the war, everyone was afraid and kept their heads down. It was after the war that things started to get this far. We indulged them at first, to get it out of their systems. You see, in the war, everyone lost a family member or a close friend, either to death or to Azkaban. I'm not sure which is worse, to be entirely honest. However, when the war was over, when people stopped being afraid, they started to get angrier and angrier. Until every year, first years end up fighting. We let them get through with it because stopping them now will mean that they will get it out of their systems when they're older and have been taught dangerous spells. You see that older students just don't seem to care all that much, and that's what we want. Although, this year, Neville Longbottom and Draco Malfoy, who are considered the heirs to the light and dark factions, have caused tensions to rise up, which is why the second and third years started to get involved. Don't worry, there is a teacher's meeting at the end of the week where we'll discuss how to deal with this situation. Thank you, Professor, Harry said after releasing a sigh of release. At least the staff weren't insane enough to let their magic-wielding children run around sending nearly lethal spells at each other. You remind me of your mother, you know. The professor asked with a fond tone. You knew her. Harry questioned with a hopeful tint in his voice. The young Potter knew deep down that Lily Potter was dead, that he had never met her. But past life or not, he wished he had met her. Even if he had memories of his past life, Harry was still a child, and a mother's love is a very strong force. Oh, yeah. Lily Evans was one of my most brilliant students. A veritable charms prodigy that could have gone far. Horrible in transfiguration though. I even recommended her in the charms guild to pursue her mastery. She was a kind woman but her anger was something to be feared. I miss her dearly. No one said anything about her, to be honest. Thank you, Professor. Harry replied. The Professor huffed, you're very welcome, Mr. Potter. My door is open to you if you wish for any questions about your mother. And I hope to see you at the dueling club in your next semester. I think you'll do well, there. Harry nodded in understanding and left the room. He chose to trust the professors to do their jobs. Instead, he chose to focus on the scholarly side of things. He had finished the books he had taken from the library, and it was showing. Harry's practical magic was starting to get absurd by all standards. He had tried out a few transfiguration spells from his schoolbook and they all worked perfectly. Harry was honestly taking his time with them, trying to perfect them and their modifications. He wanted to figure out how they worked and map out the frequencies needed for the transfiguration in his mental symphonies, to be able to craft transfiguration spells of his own one day. For all his achievements in practical magics, Harry discovered that arithmancy was his favorite subject. Oh, not the crap that is taught in third and fourth years, but from owl level and above. The first two years of the elective are just a study about magical numbers and their properties, as well as their uses in primitive divination. Afterwards, it is practically a small introduction to calculus while taking into account the properties of the numbers. It was starting from the fifth year that things started to get interesting with the inclusion of arithmancy in magical theory. It was advanced arithmancy that Harry wanted to truly study. Honestly, it didn't take long for him to get used to the oddity of arithmancy which was basically maths with the inclusion of traits of certain numbers which were considered as an additional dimension of sorts. Adding in the fact that until the statute of secrecy, most mathematicians and philosophers were wizards, the arithmancy system is very close to the one from Harry's previous life. Harry quickly returned the books and chose one on advanced arithmancy, which was actually taught by a different professor. He thought about starting with runes as well but changed his mind. Advanced arithmancy looked to be quite complicated, and Harry didn't want to overwhelm himself with it. The truth was that the young Potter wanted to discover everything he could about magic. He wanted to study it as no one had ever before. 
he was going to try out every single magical field and see how it ticked, to create a unified theory of magic and arithmancy seemed to be the best way to get about it. It combined the theory of practically every wand-based subject, but Harry had no idea how. Magic is chaotic by nature. It was unpredictable. Harry had learned that when he tried to use wandless magic, it was trying to grip water without scooping anything, and complex effects just weren't replicable. And yet, with a wand, a few words in Latin and moving your wrist a certain way made it very possible to replicate a spell a thousand times. It all came back to wands, didn't it? Arithmancy couldn't be wrong, it was based entirely on fundamental magical laws. But it was also more than useless whenever rituals were involved. At least, according to the books about rituals that were allowed in the public side of the Hogwarts library. Rituals seemed more art than science and Harry wanted nothing to do with them until he was more experienced with magic at the very least. But the point stands. Someone, probably during the rise of Rome, invented the wand and created a giant system of magic based on Latin. With it, a soldier with magic would be able to tirelessly cast a replicated spell, which probably explained how quickly they were able to expand their empire. Curiously, the name of this inventor was nowhere to be found. He was most likely a genius with no parallel, probably surpassing even Merlin with his understanding of magic. And yet that man didn't have a legend as he should have but was lost to the sands of time. Wizards now take his gift, his magical system for granted. It was breathtaking how one man more than 2,000 years ago changed the course of magical history and yet was forgotten. That's what Harry wanted, really, to make his mark on the magical world in a very significant manner, but not be forgotten as well. He wanted to forge a legacy that would remember his existence. He wanted young wizards and witches to swear by his name long after his body withers and becomes nothing more than dust. This was Harry's deepest wish, the reason he was sorted to Slytherin. In his previous life, he had died forgotten alone. In this life, Harry grew up being told that he was no one, and that he would never amount to anything. He would prove them wrong. He would prove them all wrong, that he swore. Chapter 23, Clouds. September 17, 1991, Hogwarts. This was Harry's deepest wish, the reason he was sorted to Slytherin. In his previous life, he had died forgotten, alone. In this life, Harry grew up being told that he was no one and that he would never amount to anything. He would prove them wrong. He would prove them all wrong, that he swore. It was after the second week of school that something new finally happened. Flying lessons were available to first years, and the entire house war that was going on practically disappeared overnight just because of the excitement of it. Longbottom kept telling everyone about how good he was on a broom, so much so that a Quidditch team apparently wanted him to join. Malfoy wasn't that far behind him in terms of fake stories, saying that he almost escaped a muggle helicopter while flying on a broom. Discounting the fact that it was illegal for Quidditch teams to hire anyone under the age of 15, and the fact that helicopters were very loud that narrowly escaping them meant that Draco was either deaf or an idiot, the Malfoy Scion story was a clear breach of the statute of secrecy, which can be very heavily enforced, even to minors. Surprisingly enough, Tracy was also very invested in flying lessons. She was apparently very fond of Quidditch and hoped to be a chaser on the Slytherin team in her next year. Harry stayed quiet, of course, during the bragging sessions, rolling his eyes at his classmates' ludicrous stories. His precious peace and quiet were interrupted in the middle of the common room when Malfoy proudly proclaimed, Potter, you must be disappointed to be away from your books for so long during flying lessons. Didn't you say that you didn't like Quidditch? The entire common room froze when the smug-looking blonde said that. Tracy looked at Harry with betrayal in her eyes, is it true? Harry simply shrugged, unconcerned, I quite like flying, actually, but I just don't see the appeal in Quidditch. I suppose I could watch it, but I don't really fancy myself playing, to be honest. That was a lie, of course, Harry had no idea about flying a broom. He's just banking on his Potter flying jeans being a thing as they do in the stories. Still, the entire common room kept shouting obscenities at him until Harry raised his wand and flicked it. A loud cannon sound was emitted from the wand and silenced everyone, look, I don't care if you think that Quidditch is the best sport in the world. I am allowed to have my preferences, and if I don't like it, and I don't keep shoving this fact down your throats, then I expect you to extend the same courtesy to me. Or have all of you forgotten your manners? Everyone looked down sheepishly and Harry nodded to them and left, his friends following him. When they were outside the common room, Daphne glared at the hidden entrance, what did Malfoy want to achieve by saying something like that? Harry simply shrugged, 
I don't know, and I don't care. Although, I never expected the fact that I don't like Quidditch to cause this big of a scene. I swear there were seventh years yelling at me. It's the biggest sport in the world, of course, they're going to be mad at you. Hell, I'm mad at you. How could you not like Quidditch? Tracy answered while glaring. I just don't. I also don't like eating fish. Do I have to explain myself? But it's Quidditch. Tracy protested. Look, all I'm seeing is seven people on brooms trying to put a ball in hoops while the beaters try to push them off the brooms and the seekers keep trying to find a smaller golden ball with wings to stop the match. There's just too much chaos happening at the same time, that I find the game ridiculous. Honestly, I would rather be reading a book than watching a game. Unless of course Tracy is playing. That would change everything, of course. The girl looked down and blushed while the other two snickered. Harry just continued, Look, I just don't like the game. It's not a big deal, and even if you want me to go to watch them, I will. But I don't think I'll ever play it. But I love flying. I'm actually excited to get my flying license. Yeah, flying lessons were technically outside the Hogwarts curriculum. They weren't graded, and you can actually fail the class. The reason is to have enough proficiency in flying broom to be allowed to do it by the ministry. You could do it at any time, during any year, but the professors recommend doing it during first years to both act as a scout for the house Quidditch teams, and because the classwork is relatively light in the first year. In a way, a flying license was like an apparition license. Only people with them can buy a broom from anywhere. Technically, you were not even allowed to own a broom without having a license and anyone selling or giving a broom to someone who doesn't is illegal and punishable with a large fine. Oh, parents ignored it, of course, and bought their children brooms. But they were technically the parents' property, not their children's. It was also the reason why first years weren't allowed to have brooms, since it was technically illegal, but once they get their broom license, they would be allowed to use them to move around outside the castle, of course. Alas, the time came for the flying lessons to begin. Of course, it was with the Gryffindors which was a recipe for disaster. Still, during an afternoon at the weekend, Harry and the rest of the Slytherin first years left the common room to the grounds for their first flying lesson. It was a clear, sunny day and the grass rippled under their feet as they marched down the sloping lawns towards a smooth lawn on the opposite side of the grounds to the forbidden forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance. The Gryffindor hadn't arrived yet but there were around twenty broomsticks lying in neat lines on the grounds. Harry started spreading his senses, a new skill he was trying to master. It was an extension of his magical hearing. He still didn't know what to call it, sue him, he was horrible with names and magical hearing was explanatory enough. It seemed too disappointing to explain his skill really, but alas, he didn't confide with anyone enough to have better name suggestions. Harry chose to focus on each individual broom. They looked old and worn out. The songs were also slightly fading. One of them was particularly out of tune. But still, the broom songs were so wonderfully complex, with a light air of freedom and discipline. The enchantments whatever they may be were breathtaking, and Harry had lost himself slightly staring at one particular broom in the back whose song was still loud enough and speedy enough for it to captivate his interest. Malfoy seemed to take pleasure at Harry's distraction, you look scared, Potter. Afraid you are going to fall over and join your parents. The blonde must have had the memory of a goldfish if he already forgot how terrified he was when Harry was angry at him. After the thing with Weasley and Longbottom, he returned to trying to pester him, which annoyed Harry to no end. And so, Harry returned the favor with the best method to deal and annoy with an attention-seeking child. By ignoring them entirely, M.M., did you say something? The boy's face reddened in anger and embarrassment, are you deaf or something? Harry simply shrugged and answered with a disinterested voice, No, I just tune you out whenever you start talking. It's rarely more than idiocy for the most part, and it's too troublesome for me to pay attention to your yapping. The Malfoy scion's head was redder than the infamous Weasley hair, and he yelled out, How dare you? How dare I what? Then tell me, Draco dear, what did you say that you are so angry at me for not paying attention? I said that you were too afraid of brooms because you are scared of falling and joining your parents. Harry stifled a smirk. That boy was too easy to rile up and he didn't pay attention to his surroundings when he was angry. Of course, I teased him until the flying teacher, Madame Hooch, arrived and from the looks of it, she had heard Malfoy's little tantrum, How dare you Mr. Malfoy? This is unacceptable. Detention this weekend with Mr. Filch and believe me, young man, 
I will write to your parents about your behavior in public. Now, apologize to Mr. Potter. The boy paled in fear and then just glared at Harry who was smiling innocently at him, I apologize for my words, Potter. I accept your apology, Harry replied. Harry looked up at the flying instructor with a grateful smile which she returned. The woman seemed like a kind person, with grey hair and yellow eyes. As for Harry's friends, they were gaping at him. How did you do that? Harry exclaimed. I don't know what you're talking about. Harry simply answered. However, the commotion distracted Harry enough from noticing that the Gryffindors had arrived as well. Weasley, Longbottom and Granger sent hateful glares at him, which he returned with a smile. Before anyone could say anything, Hooch spoke up, Well, what are you all waiting for? The woman barked. Everyone stand by a broomstick. Come on, hurry up. Harry walked towards the one that fascinated him and stood next to it. Stick out your right hand over your broom, called Madame Hooch at the front, and say, Up. Up. Everyone shouted. Harry did his best not to summon the broom with his wandless magic, and simply activate the commands on the broom. Unsurprisingly, Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once. He was actually one of the few that did it. It was a verbal command that was powered by an artifact, not a spell, which meant that either the brooms were defective, or the others just couldn't activate the artifact properly. They were probably slightly afraid that their subconscious chose not to activate the artifacts. The moment his hand touched the broom, he felt its song intensify, and change to suit his own. It was a happy song, fast and exciting. Harry immediately grew to like it. By the time he looked around, he noticed that everyone had their brooms in their hands. Madame Hooch then showed them how to mount their brooms without sliding off the end, and walked up and down the rows correcting their grips. Although Harry snorted when the witch ended up correcting Malfoy as well. Now, when I blow my whistle, you kick off from the ground, hard, said the flying teacher, more irritated in her tone and manners. Keep your broom steady, rise a few feet and then come straight back down by leaning forward slightly. On my whistle 3 2 1 go. Harry kicked the ground as hard as possible and channeled some of his magic to the broom, it immediately responded and accelerated away. He had to adjust the output a bit, but the young potter would admit that he never felt at home as much as he did at this moment, flying through the air, free of all burden and worries. Madame Hooch made them do some basic drills, and Harry grew quickly used to controlling his broom with perfect precision. It seemed like the potter genes were a thing. Flying was in fact in his blood. Alas, all good things come to an end, and the relatively peaceful flying lesson ended when Malfoy purposefully pretended like he had lost control of his broom and slammed into Ron Weasley who lost control as well and was falling towards the ground. Chapter 24, The Brawl September 17, 1991, Hogwarts Alas, all good things come to an end, and the relatively peaceful flying lesson ended when Malfoy purposefully pretended like he had lost control of his broom and slammed into Ron Weasley, who lost control as well and was falling towards the ground. Harry was sure that the redhead was going to die. The boy was gripping the broom as if it was his lifeline and practically accelerating towards the ground. Longbottom seemed to fly behind him trying to stop him, to no avail. Everyone had thought that the boy was done for until the professor quickly shouted, Maliar. Instead of crashing, the redhead simply bounced on the ground and then a few times until he fell outside the spell. Harry had read about the incantation that the professor had used. It was for the cushioning charm, which is usually used on brooms to make them more comfortable but Professor Hooch had somehow manipulated the spell to make sure the Gryffindor wouldn't hurt himself while falling. Still, the redhead was whimpering and was holding his arm, which looked very bruised. The professor immediately ran at the injured student and spoke up, let me take a look at your arm. Hmm, it looks like a broken wrist. Why don't I take you to the infirmary? Don't worry, Madame Pomfrey will fix that right up. She then turned and looked at Malfoy, as for you, Mr. Malfoy. I'm taking 50 points from Slytherin and another week of detention. But... The boy protested. But nothing, the flying instructor interrupted while glaring back at him, you injured your classmate, and you could have gotten him killed. If I wasn't paying attention, your classmate could have severely gotten hurt. You need to think about the consequences of your actions, Mr. Malfoy. Hooch then turned to the rest of the class, none of you is to move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You leave those brooms where they are or you'll be out of Hogwarts before you can say quid ditch. Come on, dear. As expected, the moment the woman left with the whimpering student, Longbottom walked towards Malfoy with his wand pointed and snarled, 
you'll pay for that. The blonde immediately raised his own and smirked back, I don't think so. He was immediately backed up by Crab, Goyle, Parkinson, and not while the rest of the Greyfinder boys backed up the boy who lived. For some reason, Draco gave Harry an expecting look. Which Harry simply ignored and took out his fiction book. The entire little conflict just stood there, frozen, giving the last Potter incredulous looks. Daphne hit Harry on the side, and he looked up with a fakery annoyed voice, what is it? She just pointed at their frozen classmates that were giving him expectant looks, which Harry ignored, mm very interesting. Seamus Finnegan shrieked, what's so interesting? Oh, Dresden the curse breaker just entered the Temple of Doom after getting past a sphinx by solving its riddle. I just find it interesting how writers often reuse common riddles in their books for some reason. Like come on, it's not that hard to be creative for once. Like seriously, the Raven Claw Knocker would probably help them. It's kinda of put me off the whole series, to be honest. Harry shot back. Longbottom looked frustrated, what are you on about? Harry just pretended to be confused and tilted his head, well, I was reading the book, and Seamus here just asked me what was interesting, so I told him. You need to pay attention to conversations, Neville. It's very rude to just ignore your classmates' questions. Malfoy burst into laughter, see, even Potter thinks you're an idiot. The rest of his sycophants joined in. Shut up, Malfoy, snapped Parvati Paddle. Ooh, sticking up for long bottom. Said Pansy Parkinson. Do you have a crush on him or something? Or is he too scared to talk for himself? Longbottom was blushing from embarrassment and looked at Harry, are you seriously taking their side? Their side for what? Harry answered while doing his best to look oblivious. Did you seriously not see Malfoy push Ron off his broom? Neville questioned. Oh, yeah, I wasn't paying attention. I was too busy reading, you see. You were flying, the Longbottom scion protested. So, I was. Harry didn't elaborate on his words and Longbottom let out a frustrated groan, Don't be an idiot Potter, are you with me or against me? With you or against you for what? For the fight with Malfoy. Neville yelled back. Why are you fighting with Malfoy? Harry asked. Because he hurt Ron for no reason. Harry shrugged and looked pensive, What an unfortunate situation we find ourselves in. Honestly, Harry had no idea what he was saying. He was just buying some time by confusing his classmates until Hooch comes here. Because they start firing spells without any adult nearby to stop them, people could easily get hurt. Malfoy grinned at him, it's good that you know where you belong, Potter. I'm afraid I don't understand, Draco dear. The boy gritted his teeth at the familiarity Harry was addressing him with. The blonde though, controlled himself, I mean that you're a Slytherin. That you're with us. Well, of course. I'm in Slytherin. Draco, we've been having classes together for two weeks, hell, we're in the same dormitory. Were you not paying attention? The Gryffindors were now chuckling, and Malfoy turned in a nice shade of red, that reminded Harry of Ron Weasley's hair. Enough, Potter, Draco yelled at him, stop playing stupid, we're fighting Longbottom right now. So, you're either with us or against us. How is that hard to understand? Harry though had stopped listening to the blonde and continued reading his book. Daphne elbowed him to the side again. The young Slytherin noted that she had an amused gleam in her blue eyes. He pretended to be surprised and looked up at Draco, Oh, did you say something? This chapter is just very good and stopped listening to you. The blonde then walked towards Harry in a threatening manner. Harry just discreetly pulled up a weed with his wandless magic over the boy's shoes and watched as he fell over, planting his face on the mud. Harry's classmates just stood silent, not believing what had just happened, before bursting into laughter. Even the Slytherins were laughing. Falling over for no reason is just funny to preteens. Longbottom was loudly laughing at his rival's defeat or whatever. He arrogantly took a step towards Malfoy, and Harry did the same for Longbottom. The boy's foot was caught by another weed and he fell face first to the mud, right next to Malfoy. Harry telekinetically moved the two boys' wands away from them without anyone noticing. As expected, Malfoy and Longbottom just kept fighting each other in the mud. Their clothes would have probably been ruined if it wasn't for magic. The rest of the first years just kept laughing at the two rivals. Well, that's one crisis averted. Harry had no interest in being part of this over-the-top Greyfinder Slytherin rivalry. It just felt too petty and a waste of time. He simply took out his book once more and continued reading. At least, 
he tried before he noticed that someone was tapping him on the shoulder. Daphne was giving him a sly smile, I know what you did. What are you talking about? Harry responded. Stop pretending to be clueless. You know exactly what you did. You goaded Malfoy and Longbottom into falling in the mud while making fun of them to stop the duel situation. Tracy elaborated, it was wicked. You just pretended not to care, and you made them look like idiots. How did you do that? Harry signed in defeat, Longbottom and Malfoy are actually very similar. They're both extremely spoiled and like any spoiled boy, they crave attention. If you ignore them, they will get angry, very quickly. They also expect any kind of response for insulting you. If you put some boundaries, like I did when Draco insulted my mother and left a little bit for him to focus on, you would have given him an ultimatum. He could either go too far, or you just wouldn't care. Either way, he doesn't win anything. Neville is very similar. People either worship the ground he walks on, or they just hate him. Someone not caring is very new, and he's desperate to put me in one of these boxes to know how to deal with me. So, you ignored the both of them and let them want to buy your attention, to outbid each other, and just pretended not to understand. Blaze asked. Oh, no, this was entirely coincidental. I was just pretending to not pay attention while buying some time until Professor Hooch comes back with Weasley. The whole mud fight thing wasn't part of the plan, believe me, but it's better than the spell brawl that could have happened before. The moment Harry finished his sentence, the grey-haired woman ran towards the two fighting students and waved her wand, Immobilis. The two boys were immobilized by the freezing charm, and the professor waved her wand and sent a few nonverbal spells at the two boys. They floated in the air, and the mud disappeared, revealing two heavily bruised boys. The elder witch glared at the two of them, in all my years of Hogwarts, I have never seen such horrid behavior during any of my classes. Crashing into students, getting into fights, what a disgrace. I have only been away for five minutes. You couldn't behave for just five minutes? I am disappointed in both of you and I will speak to both your heads of house and believe me, you will be punished appropriately. As for the rest of you, you did not try to stop the fight, in fact, you were encouraging it. So, I will not continue this class. You will all return to your common rooms, and I will see you next week. After a few groans and grumblings, the students left the terrace and returned to the common room together, while Hooch took Malfoy and Longbottom to their respective heads of houses. Harry simply sat by the fireplace in the common room and continued his book, while enjoying the company of his friends. Because Harry realized that they were his friends. It was a strange notion, the fact that he had friends now. He was never the more sociable of creatures and preferred his own company. He rarely ever made an effort to be included in any kind of activity, and yet somehow, he now had three friends that he spent most of his time with. Harry looked at the two girls and boy that he called friends with a warm look in his eyes. Daphne and Tracy were arguing with each other, while Blaze watched and sometimes added an argument of his own. However, the young Potter's mind was preoccupied with Professor Hooch's reaction to the behavior of Ron, Draco, and Neville. At a muggle school, something like this would almost guarantee their expulsions, but as far as Harry understood, they were getting a few detentions and a stern talking to from their heads of houses, nothing more. Malfoy had almost killed Weasley, and yet no one seemed to make a big deal out of it. It probably had to do with the development of healing magic that seemed to be able to save practically anyone, as long as dark magic isn't involved. Harry fell asleep that day with questions on the nature of healing magic in his mind. The following day, Harry was woken up with the news that somehow, Neville Longbottom became the Greyfinder Seeker. It didn't make sense, since nothing impressive happened during flying lessons other than Weasley almost dying and Malfoy and Longbottom getting into a fist fight in the mud. Harry didn't particularly care about Quidditch, but it seemed like a lot of special dispenses were given to the boy. No wonder the boy was so spoiled and entitled. What the hell had McGonagall been thinking when she gave him that position? Chapter 25, Of Meetings and Plots 31 September 1991, Hogwarts it was a chilly October morning at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, and the senior staff had gathered for their monthly meeting. Minerva McGonagall felt exhausted. This has been her most difficult year so far. Neville Longbottom and Draco Malfoy coming to Hogwarts at the same time caused a resurgence in the Greyfinder and Slytherin rivalry that had been slowly becoming dormant after the end of the war. There was always some tension between the two houses, but never like this. The first years often took it out of their system by Yule. But this year was different. Somehow, Longbottom and Malfoy have stirred their seniors, 
renewing their interest in the rivalry. It didn't help that Albus was insistent on making sure that Slytherin and Greyfinder students share half their subjects together especially the practical sessions to mend the rivalry with proximity and friendships. No one would ever deny Albus genius, but sometimes, the man simply didn't make sense. She gave up trying to understand his motivations decades ago. The Transfiguration Mistress looked around and saw that the other professors looked as tired as she was. This rivalry thing was getting too far. The constant hexing and curing, the pranks and duels that the staff had to deal with, were taking a toll on all of them. And Albus was insistent on not forcing the issue. Professor McGonagall took her seat at the long table adjusting her spectacles as she surveyed her colleagues. As usual, the room was bustling with conversations, but today there was an undercurrent of tension that everyone carried. This year was simply too different. This was more of an informal meeting that they held every month or so to discuss their students and make certain decisions. It was for senior professors only since it was their responsibility to communicate any major decision to their juniors. Even the defense against the dark arts professor wasn't invited because they tended to last very little for them to be comfortable with them during informal meetings. Of course, they are invited to the formal meetings at the end of each term, but not for things like these, with colleagues Minerva had worked with for years and considered many of them to be friends. Finally, the headmaster arrived and took a seat at the head of the table, his twinkling blue eyes surveying the group of professors assembled before him. Good morning, everyone, he began. I trust you are all settling into the new school year well. The professors nodded and murmured their assent. McGonagall gave them a glare and decided to force the issue, are you all joking here? Albus, we need to do something about the Greyfinder Slytherin rivalry. It's getting too much. Pranks, curses, spells, duels, Hogwarts is turning into a battlefield and we need to rein our students in. They're just boys, Minerva, the headmaster admonished as if she was still a child, they'll learn to control themselves as they grow up. They won't because like it or not, it looks like you're encouraging them. Going over the rules and naming Longbottom as the Greyfinder Seeker was over the line, and you knew it and still made me do it. It looks like we're rewarding him for getting into a fight with the Malfoy boy. They need to be disciplined, Minerva protested. My dear, I simply thought that Quidditch practice would distract the boy enough to stop this rivalry. You must have seen a slight decrease in the number of pranks ever since you let Oliver Wood mentor him. Dumbledore explained, and Minerva had to admit that he was right. It was still very hectic, and the situation was still worse than the previous years, but Neville Longbottom stopped getting involved in these duels, being too busy to keep up with his studies and Oliver Wood's demanding training. This is only mitigating the problem. The boy needs to learn not to attack other people for a war that ended over a decade ago. And like it or not, the boy is setting an example for all the Gryffindors in the school. We need to be more severe with our punishments. Give them longer detentions or more strenuous ones when it's related to fighting. Dumbledore seemed to age and nod, all right, double your punishments when it comes to spell fights and pranks. Severus, how is your house dealing with the heightened hostility? Nothing, the man drawled the court of Slytherin does not involve themselves in matters of third years or younger. When someone older involved themselves in the rivalry issue, they were punished internally. You will have no complaints from any of my older Slytherins, believe me. I'm afraid I cannot say the same for the Gryffindors. Minerva winced. She knew very well that a few older students had been getting involved in the duels with the Slytherins, who seemed to be very coordinated. It had something to do with inner house politics, which Slytherin was famed for. Whenever Severus spoke of any political tensions, conflicts, or decisions inside the house, he always said the court as if that meant anything. Minerva had no idea which students were in this court, only that it only involved fourth years and older, and that they ruled the house of the snakes. Dumbledore brightened at Severus' response, Very well, since young Neville has started to calm down, I ask you to convince young Draco to do the same. As you wish, headmaster, Severus answered, the Weasley twins need to be handled as well. Their pranks are starting to become more violent and that needs to be nipped in the bud. We do not need another version of the Marauders at Hogwarts, especially at this time. The man had practically spat out that last sentence. After all this time, the Potion Master was still bitter about the Marauders' pranks on him. He had a point, of course, but he also tended to escalate things more by using dangerous curses to defend himself. Minerva ignored his last comment and simply nodded. I will ensure that punishments are more severe for upper years getting involved. That should calm things down, or at least de-escalate slightly. The twins will behave themselves if I threaten to take away their experiments. Dumbledore let out a bright smile, good, 
Now, with that done, does anyone has anything to add before we begin speaking about the students? He waited for a few seconds while everyone stayed silent and continued, Very well. As is tradition, let's start with the first years. I believe Miss Abbott is first. Pomona, you are her head of house, what do you think? What continued was a brief description of each student. It wasn't anything too interesting. Just saying if the first years are homesick, or if they have difficulties with any subject, or if they tended to be in any kind of trouble. Truth be told, the transfiguration professor noticed that Albus tended to pay attention when the student was the son or daughter of a Death Eater, of a member of the Order of the Phoenix, or of people with promising talent. For example, Albus perked up at the mention of Hermione Granger, whose professors sang praises at her other than Severus, of course, who called her an insufferable know-it-all. But the headmaster dismissed Anthony Goldstein entirely since he was an average student. He actually straightened up when Longbottom's name was announced and looked very thoughtful by the end. As expected, Severus ranted about the boy and his attitude which is ironic considering his own godson was as much of a brat as the boy who lived, if not more. But what was so surprising to everyone was how normal he was. Oh, he was a good student, talented in charms especially, and a herbology prodigy according to Pomona, but he was just above average in his schooling. He wasn't Merlin Reborn, or the second Albus Dumbledore, just a normal spoiled boy who had lost his parents and was hailed as a hero for it. Everything went well until Albus finished with the Paddle Twins and took a look at the student's sheet, now, Harry Potter. What do you think of him so far? Oh, Harry Potter, the son of two of her favorite Gryffindors. His parents were extremely loyal, very talented and even members of the Order of the Phoenix, having fought and survived the Dark Lord many times. His sorting was as much a surprise for Minerva as it was for Severus and Albus. They froze in shock when the hat yelled out Slytherin a month ago having expected him to end up in the same house as his parents. Still, the boy was the picture of the perfect student. He was respectful, diligent, and didn't break the rules, and now that she thought about it, he was never involved in any of the incidents between Greyfinder and Slytherin. Minerva was the first one to speak up, the boy is a prodigy, Albus. In all my years of teaching, I have never seen anyone grasp the intricacies of transfiguration quite like him. And he's had no other tutelage, I can tell but the way he experiments with magic, it's breathtaking. Phileas concurred, it's the same with me. He is blowing past his peers at a ridiculous rate. The others repeated the same in other words and for some reason, Albus looked slightly pale. He looked directly at Severus who spoke up, the boy is adequate in potions. It looked more like he was forcing the words out of his mouth, wanting to do nothing but praise the son of the man he considered to be his rival. Still, a stilted silence followed as everyone simply gaped at him. Even Albus had raised his eyebrows. Severus rarely ever praised any student, even his own. For all his favoritism, he was still one of the best potion masters in the nation and his standards were very high. The headmaster still looked very shocked, and what about his attitude? He likes being alone but is often seen in the company of Blaise Zabonai, Daphne Greengrass, and Tracy Davis. He rarely interacts with any other, except for Draco Malfoy when the latter tries to intimidate him or recruit him. Longbottom seems to try the same, but the boy seems uninterested in the rivalry altogether. His friends tend to be following his lead. Severus elaborated. This is very concerning. It's not good to have such a promising young man isolate himself and forget to live. For all that Hogwarts is a school of magic, it's also a place to nurture interactions between peers. Try to partner him with Hermione Granger during the practical sessions. If a friendship blossomed, it could be the first step of interhouse communication. Young Harry's friends will follow his lead, after all. Albus proposed. It wasn't really an opinion, more of an order. Severus sneered by nodding his acceptance. Minerva knew what Albus was doing, obviously trying to stop any pure blood propaganda from affecting the boy. He wasn't exactly wrong to do so. Slytherin students can be very persuasive, and pure blood supremacy still reigns supreme in this house. In the end, Minerva didn't protest. She owed it to James and Lily to make sure that their son would grow up to be a good man. And Miss Granger did seem very lonely in Greyfinder since she was the only one that refused to join in on the fighting, disapproving of such behavior. Well, that's enough about Mr. Potter. Do keep an eye on him though. A gifted student mustn't be left to his own devices if he gets too bored. A few professors chuckled and they continued to the next student. Still, Minerva was still unnerved by the odd gleam in Albus' eyes as he was thinking about young Harry. Still, a couple of students later, 
she forgot entirely about it, dismissing it to be a trick of the light. After all, Albus Dumbledore couldn't possibly be scheming about students as young as young Harry, could he? Chapter 26, Of Frustrating Beavers October 13, 1991, Hogwarts Harry didn't particularly care about Quidditch, but it seemed like a lot of special dispenses were given to the boy. No wonder the boy was so spoiled and entitled. What the hell had McGonagall been thinking when she gave him that position? It had been almost two weeks since all the professors, for some reason, had chosen to partner him up with Hermione Granger, and Harry was starting to lose it. Don't get him wrong, it had nothing to do with her being a muggle-born Gryffindor. Yes, he had to admit that the girl was smart. Oh, she wasn't some prodigy like he imagined, just a lonely girl that spends every second of her life reading. Honestly, Harry wouldn't care, really, if it wasn't for her attitude. She was just so inflexible with everything. She considered the textbooks to be gospel and did not even try to find an alternate way of solving a problem. It wasn't exactly a bad thing, since she was new to magic and experimenting with magic was dangerous, but the fact that she kept trying to boss Harry around was so frustrating. She kept watching him like a hawk and commented on every modification he tries to make to any spell. One time during charms class, Harry was trying to modify the color of the periculum charm which sends red sparks from the wand. The potter scion was able to turn the sparks into something resembling flares, and one where the sparks could be controlled by the wand, by combining certain elements of the Lumos Maxima spell. The girl kept lecturing him on the proper wand movements of the spell, that he was doing it wrong and why it was wrong with a smug tone of superiority. She also seemed to develop some kind of rivalry with him, she tried to answer every possible question by the professors, while Harry rarely ever raised his hand. She tried to master spells before him, while he was trying to experiment with his magic. She was like a badgering beaver that wouldn't leave him alone and Harry was very close to blowing up on her. He was definitely getting closer during the potions lesson. Snape had been grinning maliciously at him as he revealed his partnership with Granger. Potions were by far the worst place to stick him with Granger. The girl quickly took command and asked him to prepare the ingredients while she brewed the potions, and Harry was too tired of arguing with her, having spent the previous night trying to modify the Contego shield which was a lot harder than it seemed. He did manage to add an extra layer to the shield and create the Contego duo spell, but he was trying to turn the second layer into a repelling shield and be able to switch between them. It was the biggest project he had undertaken so far, and it was as hard as it sounded. In this class, they were brewing a bruise healing potion. It wasn't that hard, considering how complex the subject could be. So, Harry prepared the ingredients as written on the board in silence with the possible arithmancy permutations of his new spell on his mind. Half an hour in, he finally started to look at the potion Granger was looking at. It didn't look right. Oh, it had the right color, but the melody was too soft, and out of tune. Harry looked at the instruction and saw that she had overstabilized the potion by adding too much flour. It was a perfectly acceptable error for a first year, where the potion recipes are often too stabilized to prevent accidents from happening, even if the effects are very reduced in their effectivity. To rectify it, Harry added a mild catalyst in the form of crushed unicorn horns that was already used as a main ingredient but was dissolved in the acid from before. The moment Harry put the pinch of unicorn horn, the potion didn't change color, but Harry could feel the difference in its song. Happy with his work. Harry returned to dicing a few ingredients but was interrupted by a shrilly voice, What do you think you were doing? The young Slytherin answered her with a bored tone, I'm cutting the ingredients. What did you put in the potion? Choosing not to convince her that it was possible to modify a potion, I don't know what you are talking about. The girl started to get redder and redder, I saw you put something in the potion. Harry shrugged, doesn't ring a bell. You're trying to ruin my grades, aren't you? Just because I'm better and I answer more questions in class, and I have a better potions grade than you. You're trying to ruin my grade so that you be better overall. Seriously, what was that girl talking about? Harry didn't even know what her grades were, only that Snape seemed insistent on giving him no grade over exceeds expectations not that he cared. If the man wanted to be petty, then let him. As far as he was concerned, only the owl and newt grades mattered, and they wouldn't be given by a childish teacher with a grudge. Of course, the Batman wannabe had to sneak on them, what is this ruckus, Miss Granger? Harry wanted to groan, he wanted nothing more than go back to the common room and just take a nap, Potter sabotaged my potion, Professor. The greasy-haired Professor turned to Harry, and what do you have to say about that? Well, considering it's both our potion, 
I'm not stupid enough to ruin my own work purposefully. And does it even look ruined? The man looked at the potion and then turned back to give Harry an unreadable look, you added powdered unicorn horn as a catalyst. Harry shrugged, the potion was overstabilized. A pinch of unicorn horn would have solved that, and the potion would still be safe enough to handle. I would have added mint leaves to restabilize it after the next reaction. The potion master's eyebrow raised, were my instructions unclear enough for you to follow, Potter? They are perfectly fine, but I'm not the one who added too much flour in the first place, Harry responded while looking at Granger. The man seemed to glare at the girl before speaking up, five points from Greyfinder for causing a scene for no reason. He then turned and left to berate Seamus Finnegan for almost making his potion explode. Harry turned to continue his work and saw his partner almost in tears, what is it? How do you know all that? Did you have magic lessons before attending like Neville? She demanded. Hey, interesting. The boy who lived ended up having magic lessons before Hogwarts. He couldn't have been training with a wand since his magic would have been too chaotic before his eleventh birthday to be handled by a wand. He definitely wasn't taking potion lessons, considering how abysmal he was in it. It must have been theory lessons or toy wands that don't really cast magic but help train wand movements and incantations. It would explain how the long bottom scion was learning hexes and pranking spells so quickly. I like to read, Harry said. Yes, I see you in the library. But I'm also reading, why don't I know the things you do? You read a lot more than I do, at least in terms of library books. But the books I choose are simply better. I read when something interests me, or there's something I want to try out. Reading too much is as likely to distract you from the useful parts. Quantity has a quality of its own but it's not enough to bridge the gap if you physically can't read enough books. The girl stopped crying and Harry simply took over the potion and put the hellebore acid in, then a minute later the mint leaves he had saved up. The leaves dissolved and he started stirring the ingredients. The bushy-haired Greyfinder was still confused, I don't understand. Look, you're reading around twice the amount I do. But one in every five books you read is actually useful for your education. You either choose books that are beyond your comprehension, or you just choose books that don't contain any useful information. That difference makes my time reading much more valuable than yours. It's not an insult, it's fact. Don't make it a competition, look at what makes you better and focus on it. It's how you learn. What books don't tell you is that magic is an adventure that you undertake. Restricting yourself is a very bad habit to have. Harry explained. The girl gave him a slight smile, thank you. You're not so bad, Potter. You do realize this is the longest conversation we ever had. What impression did you have of me, before? I don't know. Cold, I guess. You should hear what Neville and Ron keep saying about you. Harry groaned, we only talked to each other twice in my life, and they attacked me every time. Just because I'm not willing to bow down and kiss the feet of the boy who lived, doesn't mean I'm some monster. It just means that I have some dignity. The rest of the class was relatively peaceful. At least Granger had stopped glaring at me all the time for no reason. When it was over, Harry submitted a vial of his potion and left the room. He was joined by his friends, but unfortunately, also by Malfoy, so, you're getting along with the mood blood, Potter. Harry simply stopped and looked Draco in the eye while releasing his presence a bit, what did I say about that word, Draco? The blonde paled, I'm sorry, Muggleborn. Harry stopped scaring the boy and answered, I needed to or we would have ended up killing each other in the middle of our classes. She's a bit of a stickler for the rules. I could see myself getting along with her if she relaxed for a bit. Daphne snorted, like that's going to happen. Never say never, Daff. Never say never. Harry said with an amused glint in his eyes. Stop calling me that, Harry, she yelled back while chasing him. The Potter Scion had tried to make a nickname for her. He expected the girl to disapprove. Daphne was raised like an aristocrat, with a rather large focus on nobility and elegance. She didn't really approve of nicknames. Just calling her by her first name was already proof that she liked him. But the moment he tried out her nickname, she practically ran at him snarling and oddly blushing. She chased him around the castle until they were both tired. Honestly, Harry liked having friends. It was odd, not having to work by himself all the time. He had obligations like making sure that they ate their meals together, or him helping the others with their spell work, or them helping him by taking extra books from the library for him to read. There was also the protection of numbers. 
People didn't try to target him or any of his friends because they rarely instigated anything. On that side, things were even starting to settle down. The professors were starting to severely punish the older students that get involved in the rivalry. The Weasley twins had apparently been in tears as McGonagall confiscated all their ingredients and prank items after they dismissed her warnings. They honestly looked pitiful for the days afterwards. As for the Gryffindor first years, with Longbottom being too busy with his quid-ditch position, they stopped instigating things, which made Malfoy feel like he had won. It was sad that he didn't know that it was all probably designed by the teachers to stop Hogwarts from turning into a battleground. Still, things were starting to calm down, and Hogwarts was beginning to turn into a normal school. Chapter 27, Family Magic October 13, 1991, Hogwarts As for the Gryffindor first years, with Longbottom being too busy with his quid-ditch position, they stopped instigating things, which made Malfoy feel like he had won. It was sad that he didn't know that it was all probably designed by the teachers to stop Hogwarts from turning into a battleground. Still, things were starting to calm down, and Hogwarts was beginning to turn into a normal school. Harry returned to the common room with his Slytherin classmates. He had come to a certain understanding with Granger but dealing with her was exhausting. It wasn't anything bad, but Harry felt more like he was indulging her than hanging out with her. She wasn't really a bad person. She just didn't know how to talk with people. To be fair, Harry didn't know how to talk with people either, but he knew how to fake it. He still didn't understand how he ended up having friends, but he was grateful for them. When he arrived in the common room, Harry removed another book and started reading it. Tracy rolled her eyes, how you weren't sorted in Ravenclaw, I have no idea. Well, it's not like I convinced the hat to put me here or something. I just let it do its thing, Harry said while looking up from his book. Blaze responded, thank Merlin. It put you here. Could you imagine any other house suffering you? You would have driven them mad in a month. The Malfoy scion seemed to have been listening to their conversation, and interjected, would have been a good riddance if you asked me. Harry raised an eyebrow, it's rude to interrupt other people's conversation, Draco. I would have hoped that your parents would have taught you some manners. At least I have parents. I bet you don't even know your family's rituals for the Samhain ceremony. I bet you're afraid. I heard that it hurts the more you have muggle blood running through your veins. Draco replied smugly. Harry honestly had no idea what the hell he was talking about, but Daphne and Blaze looked furious. Tracy, on the other hand, looked as confused as he was. Choosing not to the asshole have the last word, honestly Draco, you were in tears when you were hit with a stinging hex by Longbottom. I doubt our definition of pain is close to one another. The boy huffed, you won't be as smart when you're deemed unworthy in front of everyone. The blonde then turned and left without saying a word. Harry still had no clue what he was alluding to. He did keep his questions to himself, he didn't want any of the Slytherin to realize that he was raised by muggles. It would be the closest thing to being a muggle born in Slytherin, and Harry didn't want to risk it. So, he stayed silent, and thankfully, Daphne spoke up, are any of you scared about Sam Hain? Blaze nodded, a bit, but I heard that while it hurts, it's worth it. Tracy was the one that exploded, what the hell are you on about? What's happening on Sam Hain? Daphne and Blaze's eyes widened, sorry, sometimes we forget that you are not from an old lineage. The Sam Hain after the start of a child's Hogwarts education is where the crest ceremony is held. They're sort of the unlocking of the family magic. Although don't really ask anyone about it, it's sort of taboo. Blaze continued, every family sort of has a crest that is passed to their descendants. It's proof that you're a member of the family. Getting accepted to magic school is the first step to being declared a wizard member of the family. I heard that the crest hurts when it's unlocked but those were some rumors. Otherwise, crests can contain a lot of stuff inside, which depends entirely on what your ancestors put inside. Either way, you never ask anyone about their crests. You'll probably never have one since your family is so young and none of your ancestors built a crest for their descendants. Harry nodded as if he already knew all of this. Tracy, though, looked thoughtful, so, when Malfoy was insulting Harry about his family crest. He was telling him that he was unworthy of his legacy because his mother was a muggle-born. There are a few crests like that, that won't be unlocked if they're not pure blood enough, or sometimes there are a few worthiness enchantments that let someone only unlock only a part of the crest. It really depends on the maker. Daphne explained. But Harry has to be worthy. Tracy protested. As flattered as I am by your faith in me, I won't know until Sam Hain. 
Do either of you know where we're doing the ceremony? Harry responded for the first time. Blaze responded, I asked one of the prefects, and he said they had a special ceremonial ritual room where they hold it every year. Harry simply nodded and started to think. He had never in his life heard anything about magic crests. It wasn't in any of the books he had read. It made sense that they weren't in the Muggleborn introduction books, since they wouldn't really need to know it. These books were mostly centered on how the government worked and the currencies, and so on. Old family magic was not something that they needed to know. But still, there had been no mentions of magical crests in any of the books he had read from the library, and in over six weeks, he had read enough to get a general idea about what it meant to be living in the magical world. He needed to research this quickly, understand how they worked, and before Halloween, that's for sure. He couldn't waste any time. He sure as hell wasn't going to participate in a ceremony that he didn't understand. He needed to get to the library, and he needed to do it quickly. The following day, which happened to be a Saturday, Harry went up to the Great Hall, ate his breakfast, and went to the library. He didn't even wait for his friends to get up, consumed with his search. He couldn't say to anyone what he was looking for, considering the issue was as sensitive as Blaze and Daphne made it out to be. He walked into the library, ignoring any of the casting magic sections and towards the history section. Four hours later, he had found exactly nothing. No one had written anything about magical crests. They were probably in the restricted section, away from any curious student that might end up getting killed. Truthfully, Harry looked at books about lineages, about entire magical dynasties and bloodlines, but while there were mentions of magical crests, they always assumed that the reader knew what they were. The book The Second Goblin Rebellion of the Middle Ages said something about a Leo Black, that was able to massacre thousands of enemies thanks to the power of the crest of the Black family. This wasn't normal. Magical crests were a sensitive topic, but not enough to barely mention in the history books. Someone had to be removing every book with any information about magical crests, either putting them in the restricted section or removing them outright from the library. Harry needed to know, he needed to understand. It ate at him that someone was actively preventing him from understanding his legacy, of what it meant to be a potter. By the end of the day, Harry had decided that the library didn't have any information about magical crests and their unlocking. Hell, Harry didn't even know if the potter family had a magical crest in the first place. And so, he went to the only place he knew could help him, the place that helps all Hogwarts students when they need it. The Room of Requirements The young potter was honestly wary of getting there, or perhaps, he just didn't need it. There was no one stopping him from learning magic as he saw fit, not experimenting on it. He was too much of a beginner to need to practice in a specialized room to train and experiment. Harry was holding off the room to explore properly when he would have needed it. And while the room of hidden things was a very attractive place to search for old books and artifacts, it was an endless room with things thrown away by students for centuries. He needed to have a grounding in curse breaking to avoid getting cursed by the random crap that was in the room. Harry had no wish to endanger his life for no reason, not when he could put it off when the room wouldn't be a danger anymore. Still, Harry had no choice, and thus walked to the seventh floor right after dinner and towards the moving tapestry of a man trying to teach trolls how to dance ballet. If that was a thing then the man was either crazy or an idiot. He turned to the wall in front of the tapestry with his heart beating loudly. He sincerely hoped that the room would be there. He walked past the room three times while thinking. I need a place that would teach me about magical crests and family magic. I need a place that would teach me about magical crests and family magic. I need a place that would teach me about magical crests and family magic. By his third time passing the wall, a door started to materialize from the previously empty wall. It didn't look particularly grand, just like the door of any of the classrooms. Slowly, Harry opened it and got inside. Harry was surprised when he saw the interior of the room. It wasn't some grand magical room as he expected, just a cozy room with a comfortable sofa, a chair, and a small desk. There was a single book on the desk titled, S. E. Sweota Lungrad W. I. R. T. Rum Leibkrieft. Fuck, the book was written in Old English. The damn book looked older than the castle. Harry mentally asked the room to translate it, but it didn't work. He tried to summon another book, to no avail. Just to make sure that the room still worked he summoned an extra chair that materialized in seconds. He really needed to understand the capabilities of the room. Instead, Harry asked for a book that would help him translate Old English. Luckily, there seemed to be a book on translation spells, and a few common spells that seemed easy enough to cast. And yet, 
after dozens of tries for many spells, even one specializing in Old English, nothing happened. Harry felt the spells wash over the book, and yet they didn't seem to hold. Curiously enough, Harry didn't feel any magic in the book, which should have been his first instinct that there was something wrong with it. Considering that Old English stopped being used centuries ago, the book should have looked far more told if it didn't have any preservation spells. Harry would need a dictionary to work in his free time to translate this, at least to get an idea of what the book is talking about. It would take days, if not weeks, but if he worked hard on it, Harry was optimistic that he would at least get enough information to deal with the Samhain ceremony. Knowing that he couldn't take the book outside the room, Harry brought out one of his never-ending empty notebooks that he Al ordered a couple of weeks before. He had an empty one and used a spell on his quill to copy the book's content. He was half expecting it to fail, considering how his previous spells failed as well. But it worked. The quill copy spell was a spell of Harry's own creation, devised from the charms on a note-taking quill he had bought. However, instead of copying the book, the quill detected the parts of the book that were not blank and rewrote them in the target parchment. Harry had used this trick to bypass the ant copying wards on the books in the library. The only issue was that the method was slow. By the time the book had finished being written, it was almost curfew. Still, Harry had a complete physical copy of the book the room had picked for him and had tinkered with his modified Contego spell a little more. Before leaving the room, Harry pointed his wand at his book and cast the translation spell. Suddenly, the words of the parchment shuffled around and turned into an explanation of family magics. Harry grinned to himself as he went back to his common room before Filch would find him. It had taken him the entire day, but he had found what he was looking for. Chapter 28, Magic Crests October 15, 1991, Hogwarts Before leaving the room, Harry pointed his wand at his book and cast the translation spell. Suddenly, the words of the parchment shuffled around and turned into an explanation of family magics. Harry grinned to himself as he went back to his common room before Filch would find him. It had taken him the entire day, but he had found what he was looking for. Although Harry wanted nothing more than to devour the book in his hands, he needed to get back to the common room as soon as possible. He was already very close to missing curfew, and he definitely didn't need the fourth years and sixth years on his case for losing points because he was too impatient to read the book in the common room. Still, he was glad to have found the book, or at least beat the challenge needed to do it. Harry was very glad to have modified the charms on the self-writing quill to copy books. Honestly, it was a challenge to see if he could find a way to bypass the wards on the book without actually breaking them. Oh, it was very slow, but it was better than having to explain to Madame Pants why he needed advanced books from the library. It was an extremely good achievement, especially after only a month and a half of magical learning. If it wasn't for him cheating with his magical hearing, he would have never even come close to modifying a spell to that extent. Honestly, it was unfair how good Harry was at magic compared to his classmates. But if there's something Harry knew for a fact was that people were not born equal. Harry slowly snuck down in the night to the dungeons and barely missed curfew. Thankfully, he was able to make it in time, but he had practically run the entire way to the common room. As soon as Harry arrived, he was accosted by his friends. Blaze practically ran towards him, where the hell have you been? Choosing not to answer any uncomfortable question, Harry simply put his hands in his pocket and shrugged, I got lost on the path of life. That seemed to make him and the girls speechless. They just gaped at the young Potter unable to muster a response for a good minute until Tracy blew up, what the hell do you mean you got lost on the road of life? Harry again shrugged, my a, a Tracy, don't get so worked up. I just decided to explore the castle a bit, walking around aimlessly, getting lost in the beautiful path that is life, letting the currents take me away and lead me. So, you explored the castle for the whole day. Daphne responded with a deadpan tone. Well, I did at first, then I went to the library for a bit, and then I was just going to find you guys but then a black cat crossed my path, so I had to take the long way round. I somehow ended up in the astronomy tower since the cat just wouldn't leave me alone. Then an insane knight called Sir Cadogan said that this was the same cat that led him to his death, which is why I just kept trying to escape its grasp. Harry elaborated. You could have used a spell to make it go away, Blaze remarked. And risk hurting such a cute little kitten just because of its color. That's very racist of you, Blaze. The green-eyed boy remarked with a sly grin on his face. Racist, the boy thundered, Harry, I swear to Merlin. Daphne just hit the boy in the shoulder, he's messing with you, you idiot. Well, 
it's still not a nice thing to do. We still don't know what he was doing. Blaze answered with a pout. Harry gave his friend a grin, I wasn't really lying. I explored the castle for a bit, went to the library to research a spell I was trying out, then finished my assignments for the weekend, and practiced a bit of charms. I kinda lost myself in a book before I realized what time it was, and ran back here. Blaze gave him a glare, you could have just said that. What's with the whole black cat story and the road of life stuff? Oh, I just wanted to see your reactions. I have to say that I wasn't disappointed, Harry replied with a smug grin. You're a jerk, Harry, Tracy grumbled at him. Harry just laughed and they all continued the night with their usual nightly conversations. The young Potter almost forgot about the book. Almost, being the key word. He had tried to read the book before going to bed but he realized why translation spells weren't commonly used. Yeah, the spell worked but that didn't mean that it worked well. The spell seemed to have categorized the words in each language and just mapped them together, grammar be damned. Oh, there was a semblance of sense there somewhere, but not enough to be read casually. Honestly, it reminded him of when he had tried to translate entire articles using online translators. It made the text understandable, but only after some effort trying to decode it. Reading the translated book will require patience and hard work and Harry was too tired after an entire day of researching for such an undertaking, which is why he just went to bed. The very next day, Harry exited the room before his classmates and took an early breakfast, choosing to read the book in the library and take some notes as well. He was done by the end of the day and the content was really dry. Honestly, Harry didn't understand a lot of the technical magical theory inside, but he at least understood the premise of magical crests and a basic understanding of how the Samhain ritual worked. Well. Magical crests were amazing inventions that became popular after the burning of the Library of Alexandria and became commonplace for practically all influential magical families in Europe after the fall of Rome. Crests existed far before, but during these events, many magical families were either massacred, and their libraries were also pilfered by the invaders. So, measures were taken so that magic wouldn't be lost once more. To be perfectly honest, magical crests were repositories of magical knowledge that is passed down in the bloodline. With every birth, a smaller crest is born, but the archive of magic can only be used by the head of the family, whose crest tended to act as a control one. Usually, the head of house only allows his heir access to the knowledge within, in case a member of the family chooses to marry into another one or is just punished. Every member of the family that could add something to the magic by creating a new spell, brewing a new potion, and so on would record it into the crests for no reason. However, the way they are designed almost guarantees that any possible blood relation would be able to inherit the crests in case a family is massacred and thus, the knowledge wouldn't be lost. However, these crests need to be activated first to formally be part of the family. They are activated when a member gets his own wand and waits until the age of 13 for it to integrate into the child's magic. Afterwards, the magic will slowly trickle in, allowing the heirs to access to gradually learn their personal magic until the age of 17 when the magical archive is entirely made available to the heirs. It was the way old families safeguarded their personal spells and magical discoveries while making them available for their descendants. Books could be stolen, and the spells inside could be replicated, but with a crest, no one would be able to access them. Although, magical crests don't need to only have information inside. There were theories in the book about people putting artifacts and family heirlooms inside the crests to make sure that they are not stolen. However, Harry had no idea how that worked, and he wasn't eager to find out. Yeah, the young Slytherin was advanced for his age, but not enough to mess with things like that. Some of the conceptual crap that came with making a magical crest, was very hard to understand especially when he had a hard time understanding the introductory chapters because of how the translation spell worked. If he needed to mess with magical crests in general, he would need to learn Old English, and that was an undertaking on its own. Harry decided to put it into the back of his mind, and only do it if he finds out more knowledge of magic written only in this language. He was already learning Latin on his own, adding in another dead language just wouldn't be fun. Especially with how much he's probably going to memorize during his runes electives, he wouldn't want to burn out, would he? Still, the upcoming Samhain ritual wasn't really a ritual, not in the classical term. Technically speaking, a ritual is the predecessor to wand spells that are more art than science. They heavily involved runes and sacrifices to shape and channel the magic, which didn't make it any better or worse than using a wand. It was just so much harder than wands simply became commonly used. No, the Samhain ritual was just an unlocking. It didn't really have to happen in Samhain, 
only for the subject to drink a potion that relaxes the magical flow and for an outsider of casting the standardized spell to unlock the crest, which already existed connected to their magic in a dormant state. The crests didn't need to be unlocked on Samhain, only for the subject to be between the ages of 11 and 13. The experience is widely considered to be unpleasant, from irritating to agonizing. It depended on both the wizard and the crest, and it was impossible to know how it would work. There were also a few peculiarities that came with every crest. Sometimes the creator of the crests adds in a little extra condition to inheriting parts of the family archives. Sometimes a crest would be barely more than a small peculiarity for generations only for a descendant to fully unlock it later. However, that wasn't the same as family magic. The spells inside a crest could be replicated if one knew the theory. Family magic was unique for everyone who had it and was built on the dedication of an entire magical line to a certain field of magic until it became a part of their own blood. After centuries, the families start to develop certain traits that naturally came to be. Things like mage sight, metamorphmagus, and parcel tongue, occurred either naturally or with some large-scale ritual to be passed down from parent to child, and no one would be able to speak it. There is a reason why parcel tongue was so revered in pure blood circles. These abilities are the epitome of what made a magical family prestigious. Honestly, Harry didn't know if the Potter family had a magical crest, but it's most likely true. There was no risk to trying it if he didn't have one, but in the house of the snake, it would be akin to being a second-class citizen. The young Potter sincerely hoped that he would end up having a crest, if only for the potential spell available inside. At least, now, Harry understood what Blaze and Daphne were talking about when they referred to the Samhain ritual. He probably even knew more than them thanks to the book. In the end, Harry would need to wait until the end of the month to figure out more. However, he put the issue to the back of his mind. His curiosity was now abetted, and he had more assignments to finish to compensate for the research time he used up the previous day. Afterwards, well, he did promise that he would spend the day with his friends, after all. Chapter 29, A Friend in Me October 25, 1991 Hogwarts. In the end, Harry would need to wait until the end of the month to figure out more. However, he put the issue to the back of his mind. His curiosity was now abetted, and he had more assignments to finish to compensate for the research time he used up the previous day. Afterwards, well, he did promise that he would spend the day with his friends, after all. The week following Harry's discovery of family crests passed in a strange monotony that was very contradictory to Hogwarts' very nature. It was the calm before the storm, Harry could feel it in his bones. Everything was too quiet, too normal. The whole grafender slytherin rivalry turned into a strained peace practically overnight. The Weasley twins stopped pranking anyone, there were few duels and hexes thrown around. Honestly, the young Potter thought that it was too good to be true. He was waiting for the shoe to drop. As for Harry, he just spent his time either experimenting with his magic or hanging out with his friends. Nothing particularly interesting happened, except for him finding an obscure book on illusions in the library, which he quickly copied using his spell. The book copying spell that Harry invented must have been one of the most useful things he ever created. Oh, it wasn't anything impressive, and any student with talent in spell creation and the dedication to study it thoroughly would have been able to make it. Although Harry did cheat using his magical hearing to bridge the knowledge gap to craft the spell. It wasn't even a complete spell. It needed to be cast on a self-writing quill, anyway, just turning the dictation aspect to a visual one to be able to scan the pages for it to copy. How people didn't try it out before, Harry didn't know. Perhaps, people did invent it, but the industry made sure that no one knew of the spell. It couldn't exactly be warded against since the doesn't technically even affect the book in any way. Oh, it could probably do nothing about illustrations since they're animated, and Harry didn't know how to enchant a quill to draw animated images. He didn't even try to look it up, he knew that it was out of his league. Still, since most books do not actually have important illustrations, it wasn't that big of a deal. In a way, it was the way Harry was able to have a copy of each book he had read in the library in his everlasting notebook he bought. He had no idea if there was a limit on the pages it could have, and he was probably going to figure it out eventually. In the end, the book would also make sure that he wouldn't need to bother with library deadlines since he stopped actually taking out the books. Madam Pants had thankfully allowed the use of enchanted quills and inks in the library, as long as they don't endanger the books which happen to be warded with countless preservation spells. However, while Harry was proud of his first true original spell, it didn't come close to his fascination with the subject he had just uncovered. The art of illusions was just that, an art. 
There weren't any spells like most of the magic, only a single one. Lux Dolem was a generalized small-scale illusion spell that can be used depending on the user's imagination. Oh, it was only light illusions, that could be broken by touch or magic. There were similar spells to fool each sense as well any combination of them. It was a book on generalized spells that resembled the minor inanimate transfiguration generalized spell he blundered into creating on his first day. This was the first time during any of Harry's daily trips to the library that he had seen anything resembling the generalized spells that McGonagall referred to in his first transfiguration class. Honestly, he loved that spell. He could practice it any time without anyone saying anything since there isn't an actual spell burst when he used it, so no one noticed. He started with small things and continued enough to get the illusions to be as big as him. That seemed to be the limit of both his abilities and the spell itself. There was also a law of magical intent to be considered where the larger a scale of a spell is, the more difficult it is to control. For illusions, control was a must, and so the biggest illusions tend to be very easily recognizable where small ones were almost indistinguishable. Still, this was an art that Harry wanted to master completely. He planned to cast all kinds of illusions visual, auditory, olfactory, etc. Even the mental ones, although the skill in occlumency needed to do so would be problematic. Oh. Harry of course wanted to learn how to protect his mind, and maybe even how to read others but he wasn't able to find a single book on the mind arts, apart from a few books on compulsion charms. Considering that this was supposed to be the biggest magical library in the nation, either that title was simply a misdirection or someone had removed all the books or put them in the restriction section which was very understandable considering their potential for abuse. Nevertheless, Harry was happy for now. He needed to master the basics before worrying about secret knowledge in the restricted section. The room of requirements would probably help him with that, but Harry was wary of it. The temptation of secret knowledge, of discovering the capabilities of the room, was simply too attractive, but for all its wonder, the room of hidden things contained countless objects whose owner wanted to get rid of, meaning that the number of cursed items was probably abnormally high. Harry had no wish to die to his own hubris. Alas, Samhain was approaching, and Harry and the rest of the Slytherin first years were obviously nervous, and truthfully, so was Harry. The ritual weighed a great deal on his mind, especially in regard to the unpredictability of Crest's activations in general. No two people ever said the same thing about how it felt. Currently, Harry was trying to analyze a generalized auditory illusion spell, which was a fancy word for a noise spell. Although he liked auditory illusion spells better even if musicians often used it to compose songs. Still, it was far more complicated than the light illusion spell since it was very difficult to master. It couldn't even muffle noise in any way only create noise, not manipulate it. Perhaps analyzing a silencing charm and integrating it into the spell could help create a new spell? It was way out of his league for now, but Harry could see the potential of such a combination. Harry started writing small arithmetic calculations to see the viability of this theory. He was so focused on his calculations that he hadn't noticed a bushy-haired Greyfinder sneak a peek at his work. What are you doing? The girl asked. The last potter stiffened and shot up, Granger it's nice to see you. The girl gave him an intense look, what are you doing? Harry pretended to be unconcerned, learning magic, of course. The glare that the girl had given him was as threatening as a small kitten, still, Harry started to fear that the girl would have a stroke or something and so he snorted, I'm trying to learn a sound-making spell that I found. The Greyfinder tilted her head, but what were you scribbling about? Just the arithmetic formula of the spell. I found it in the book and wanted to study it. You know arithmancy. The girl shrieked. Harry shushed her, we're in the library, Granger, keep your voice down. Do you want Madame Pans to ban us for life? The Slytherin had to stifle a chuckle when he saw the horrified look on her face. The girl hit him on the shoulder and whispered, you know arithmancy. I was bored before Hogwarts, so I taught myself advanced mathematics just to pass the time. With that as a base, it didn't take me long to get a feel for the basics of arithmancy and how it worked. I'm still a beginner but it's very interesting. Whenever I learn a new spell, I write down its formula and try to understand it. It doesn't work most of the time, but after a while, you start to notice patterns which helps during casting. The girl gave Harry an odd look, do you think you could teach me? Hey, teaching was always a passion of Harry's in his past life. He enjoyed his job immensely, and there was this sense of satisfaction at the thought of helping someone build a passion for his subject. Hermione Granger was an ideal student, she was hungry for knowledge and wouldn't mind working hard for it. If she was taught how to be more selective with her learning, 
she could grow into a formidable witch. Honestly, if Harry was older, he wouldn't mind tutoring her, but he wasn't and he barely scratched the surface of the potential of magic, and he knew it. I don't think I know enough to teach you, to be honest. We've only been there for less than two months, I don't have a good enough grounding in magic to teach anyone anything, Harry replied, but there's no reason for me to not answer any question you might have, or help you with a topic you're researching. The girl looked downcast but brightened at his offer. She leapt and enveloped him into a hug, thank you, thank you. The girl then quickly released Harry and blushed in embarrassment as if realizing what she had just done. Harry couldn't stifle his amusement anymore and snickered at her behavior. The girl sent a glare without any heat in it, git. Harry continued snickering and was joined later by Hermione as well. After a minute, they both calmed down, but Harry noticed that Hermione was still melancholic, how do you do it? Do what? Be as smart as you are, and still have friends. The girl elaborated. Harry hummed in thought, I don't know. I never had a friend before here. They just felt boring, if you know what I mean. It was like their priorities didn't make sense. I've never been the best with people, and I expected nothing better when I came here. Then Blaze sat in my compartment, and we were sorted in the same house. We just stuck together, and then Tracy and Daphne joined us. I didn't plan it. And I still don't really understand how we became friends, but I'm not complaining about it. Do you think I'll ever have a friend? The girl asked with a vulnerable tone. I don't see why not. You're smart, funny, and a little bit of a stickler for the rules, but it's nothing horrifying. Although, you might scare people by how much you keep correcting them. It makes you look a bit condescending, but I honestly don't care. Harry replied. The Greyfinder seemed to get herself ready for something before she steeled herself and spoke up, would you be my friend? Harry really should refuse. If any Slytherin ever realized about him being friends with a muggle-born Greyfinder, then he would be in big trouble. For all the surprising lack of bigotry in the common room, Muggleborns weren't looked at favorably by Slytherins in general. It would practically destroy any standing he might have with his peers or even when he starts playing house politics when he's older. Still, Harry couldn't bear to destroy the sheer hope shining brightly in the girl's eyes, all right, Granger. I guess we're friends now. The girl had small tears in her eyes and a small yet blinding smile on her face, thank you so much. After she enveloped him with another hug, they looked at each other for a few minutes awkwardly. Harry just sighed, I wasn't lying when I said I was horrible at this. The girl snorted, yeah, we both are. Have you started to transfiguration assignment yet? There's something that's still troubling me. The conversation flowed from there. And hours later, when Harry went to bed, he thought of the bushy-haired girl with fondness and realized that he had fun just talking with her about magic and their classes. What an odd turn of events. Chapter 30 Samhain Excitement October 31, 1991, Hogwarts The conversation flowed from there. And hours later, when Harry went to bed, he thought of the bushy-haired girl with fondness and realized that he had fun just talking with her about magic and their classes. What an odd turn of events. After that fateful day, Harry and Hermione started a tentative friendship. They met practically every day in the library and spent a couple of hours discussing books and classes. Sometimes, they just stayed quiet, reading, and just enjoying their company in general. Harry found that the girl was strangely mature in some areas, yet absolutely childish in others. She was as hopeless as he was when it came to social situations, but unlike him, she was also almost desperate to please people. The trick was to use logic against her when she's being stubborn. Hermione respected logic more than anything, which would have been a great thing in Muggle school. He could easily see the girl becoming a famous surgeon or a researcher, but magic spat in the face of logic. Oh, she could memorize spells and magical laws, and she could probably succeed in her life, but as long as she keeps theorizing magic in a logical manner, she will never step out of the cage she built herself. She will only experience a fraction of what magic was, and that was a tragedy. Harry has tried many times to explain the symbolisms and chaos that magic represented, but she didn't even try to understand. Still, Harry enjoyed her company and was starting to see her as much of a friend as Blaze, Tracy, and Daphne. He didn't even hang out less with his housemates because he only hung out with Hermione during his usual library time. And normal 11-year-olds would do their best to avoid reading dusty old tomes for hours. Although Harry did put his foot down with a few ground rules, such as no one knowing about their friendship, because of what might happen if the other Slytherins knew of them. 
but the girl didn't care as long as he didn't use her to get out of doing homework. Harry woke up this morning feeling apprehensive. It was Samhain, or Halloween as it was being celebrated currently. The entire castle smelled of baked pumpkin and spices. Honestly, he wouldn't have minded if it wasn't for the fact that this was an insult to the original ceremonies. Magic goes into certain cycles depending on the seasons, and certain dates. Samhain is the Day of the Dead, where the veil between the living and their lost ones is at its thinnest. It's known as one of the most intimate ceremonies in the magical world, and Dumbledore's reforms had turned it into the muggle holiday about pumpkins and candy. The sad thing was that most of the school didn't even realize it. Their parents were pushed towards celebrating Halloween, that they didn't even think of teaching the traditional holidays to their children. It was disgusting and the atmosphere in Slytherin reflected this as they sneered in disgust at the orange decorations and carved pumpkins. It was a direct insult to their heritage, and one of the biggest reasons Muggleborns are discriminated against by the old families. Thankfully, the first year Slytherins brightened up when Flitwick revealed that they would be learning the levitation charm. Making things float was one of the most basic skills any wizard needed, and it was a very common spell that everyone was excited about. As expected, Flitwick demonstrated the spell by levitating Perk's toad and the pile of books on his desk. Now, don't forget that nice wrist movement we've been practicing. Squeaked Professor Flitwick, perched on top of his pile of books as usual. Swish and flick, remember, swish and flick. And saying the magic words properly is very important, to never forget Wizard Barufio, who said S instead of F and found himself on the floor with a buffalo on his chest. Harry's partner was Blaze which was a nice break from being forced to partner with Hermione. The girl was nice and everything, but she always tried to admonish him whenever he tried to experiment. Harry pointed his wand at the feather in front of him, Wingardium Leviosa. As he expected, the feather started to float up and down following the movement of his wand. It wasn't actually that difficult, and Harry had learnt this spell in his first week in Hogwarts. It was actually part of a family of spells, that dealt with the telekinetic movement of objects. Of course, the spell only worked by levitating the object up and down depending on where the wand pointed. It's not permanent and it can't go left or right. It was just that, a levitation spell. Its sister charm, the Levioso charm was a spell that levitated an object for a selective amount of time which depended on the power of the spell making it easy to cast other spells at the object since it doesn't need to be constantly reapplied. Harry did learn a lot of telekinetic spells from that family because of their usefulness, and had tried to craft a general telekinetic spell but failed miserably at it. It was a long-term project anyway, but such a spell could be very powerful in both daily use and combat. Blaze looked exasperated at him when he got it on his first try and tried to cast the spell again, which failed, to the frustration of the young boy. No one seemed to have done the same, and Harry let his feather float down and looked at Blaze, make sure that you coordinate the spells and wand movements. And don't forget to picture the feather floating in your mind. After a few tries, the boy's feather twitched and with the blinding smile he returned Harry had made it all worth it. Harry returned it, keep practicing, it's how you'll get better. The young potter turned to see what was happening. All the students were glaring at their feathers while yelling the incantation. Seamus Finnegan, which had partnered with Longbottom, ended up somehow burning his feather, and the professor had run to stop the fire from spreading. Next to them, was Ron Weasley that was partnering with Hermione. Both of them looked miserable. Weasley kept foundering about making nonsensical wand movements and mispronouncing the incantation. Honestly, that boy had a mismatched wand that was so worn down that the unicorn hair was slightly visible on the top. The boy had very little hope to succeed as a wizard by using a wand like that. And it was proof of the Weasley family's favoritism of his older siblings that they gave Percy a new owl and robes for being a prefect and didn't even give Ron a proper wand to learn magic. The boy was practically shouting in Hermione's ear, Wingardium Leviosa. The girl seemed to snap at his spitting, you're saying it wrong. It's Wingardium Leviosa, make the gar nice and long. You do it, then, if you're so clever, Ron snarled. Hermione rolled up the sleeves of her gown, flicked her wand, and said, Wingardium Leviosa. Her feather rose off the desk and hovered about four feet above their heads. Oh, well done. Cried Professor Flitwick, clapping. Everyone see here, Miss Granger's done it. She turned and gave Ron a smug smile and he glowered at her. Longbottom sent a stinging jinx at her back when the professor turned when Malfoy called for him. By the end of the classroom, Neville and Weasley were still very angry. The redhead loudly complained, it's no wonder no one can stand her, she's a nightmare, honestly. Longbottom burst into laughter at that remark, 
which made the rest of the first year Greyfinder follow his lead. Of course, Hermione had heard him, and she ran away with tears visible in her eyes. Harry looked at his friends, I'm going to the bathroom. Save me a seat in McGonagall's class. They nodded and walked to the Transfiguration classroom, while Harry followed his crying friends to the girls' bathroom. She was sitting on the floor sobbing her eyes out. He cleared his throat making the girl stiffen, then relax when she saw him, What are you doing here, Harry? This is the girls' bathroom. I'm checking in on you, silly. I have to say that you don't look good. The girl snorted, yet. Yeah. I guess I don't. Come on. You can't say that Weasley of all people made you cry. The only people I know that are dumber than him are Crab and Goyle. But he's right, Hermione protested, no one likes me. I don't have any friends, and everyone laughed at the joke. I thought that it would be different here, that I wouldn't be as lonely as I was in the muggle world. Magic or not, humans are humans. Magical children are just as dumb as muggle ones. And come on, I like you well enough, and we already said that we're friends. Harry said, trying to console her. Look Harry, it's not the same and you know it. Sure, we talk a bit every day, but we don't hang out. I'm a Greyfinder and you're a Slytherin. For Merlin's sake, Harry, you don't even want people to know that we're friends. You're my friend, and I'm happy about it, but I'm still lonely. Harry struggled to answer that. He couldn't really say that he was enough since he really only talks to her a few hours a day about schoolwork. Oh, they liked each other well enough but the house rivalry was a big wall stopping their relationship from progressing any further than study buddies. The young Potter deflated, I see your point, and it's not impossible for you to not have any friends, they don't have to be from your house. Try befriending the Raven Claws, they're nice enough, and I know that Padma Paddle is a lot more interesting than her sister. Yet, yeah, Harry did talk to the girl a few times. He was curious about how magic in India worked and was disappointed to see that it was somewhat similar. Apparently, the colonization of the country happened in the magical world and Muggle one as well, and the Indians adopted the British magical ways. She did mention that there were a few tribes and monasteries that still practiced the old ways, whatever that meant. Hermione seemed to brighten up slightly, I guess I could. I never really talked to them before. Now, come on, we're going to miss Transfiguration if we stay here. I don't feel like going, to be honest, the Greyfinder protested. Harry didn't know what to say to tell her to come to the feast. According to the stories, she would be attacked by a troll during the feast, but he couldn't guarantee that Longbottom and Weasley would be able to save her, or if they would even try to go after her in the first place. You sure you don't want to come? Harry asked. The girl nodded, yeah, there's some thinking I want to do. The Slytherin nodded solemnly and went to Transfiguration class. He didn't even pay attention during the class, distracted by what might happen to his friend. Hermione didn't turn up, and Harry didn't see her all afternoon. When evening came, Harry went to the Great Hall with his friends. Of course, Dumbledore seemed to want to go all out when insulting every traditionalist in the school with countless decorations and animated monsters. Yet, Harry was still worried for his friend and the danger she might be in. Fortunately, Harry relaxed when he saw that Professor Quirrell was sitting on the high table talking enthusiastically with Professor Sprout. Perhaps, the man wouldn't be releasing a troll in the castle, and Hermione would be safe. The stories were somewhat unreliable after all. Of course, that hope was dashed when Harry saw Filch, the caretaker, slam open the hall doors and sprint into the hall with an expression of terror on his face, troll in the school grounds thought you ought to know. The man then sank to the floor in a dead faint and with him any hope he had that Hermione would be safe. Chapter 31, Troll October 31, 1991, Hogwarts of course, that hope was dashed when Harry saw Filch, the caretaker, slam open the hall doors and sprint into the hall with an expression of terror on his face, troll in the school grounds thought you ought to know. The man then sank to the floor in a dead faint and with him any hope he had that Hermione would be safe. There was an uproar. It took several purple firecrackers exploding from the end of Professor Dumbledore's wand to bring silence. Prefects, he rumbled, lead your houses back to the dormitories immediately. Well that was a stupid idea. The Great Hall was a fortified position, and any competent adult professor should be able to defeat a troll easily, in case it attacked. That would leave the other staff members to hunt down the trolls and look for any missing students, like Hermione. Of course, the prefects started yelling about trying to get a semblance of order. Each prefect seemed to be responsible for a year. 
the sixth year prefect boy was shouting, follow me. Stick together, first years. Make way, first years coming through. Prefect coming through. Excuse me. First years. Prefect. The sad thing was it didn't work, which wasn't really unexpected considering that this was a single teenager that's responsible for a dozen of scared students that he doesn't know in the middle of a chaotic great hall where everyone is running around like headless chickens. Honestly, the moment they left the great hall, everyone was practically lost in the endless crowd of students. However, Harry was mostly worried about his crying friend that was fated to be attacked by the troll in another life. Harry ducked down, becoming invisible in the crowd, slipped down a deserted side corridor, and hurried off to the bathroom he knew Hermione was crying in earlier. He ran towards it and that was when the smell hit him. It smelled more like old unwashed socks mixed with a dirty toilet smell. It was a foul stench and Harry resisted the urge to gag and throw up. The troll was near, and he needed to get Hermione out of there. He ran inside the classroom to see a hysterical Hermione that seemed to have been catatonic while the troll loomed in front of her. The troll was a horrible sight. Twelve feet tall, its skin was a dull, granite grey, its great lumpy body like a boulder with its small bald head perched on top like a coconut. It had short legs thick as tree trunks with flat, horny feet. The smell coming from it was incredible. It was holding a huge wooden club, which dragged along the floor because its arms were so long. But what was breathtaking was the troll's song. Harry had never listened to the song of a magical creature, at least not closely. The song was dull, repetitive, and slow, but also strong. It felt like a slow set of drums, with a distinct feeling of rocks and mountains. Oh, it was savage, but it felt more like a brute than anything else. But this was not the time for contemplation, and with a flick of his wrist, Hermione was pushed away from the creature and into one of the stalls. He really needed to find a way to get Hermione out of there. From what he had read about them, trolls didn't have the greatest sense of smell hence why they were almost extremely smelly. They didn't revel in being dirty or smelly, just didn't particularly care about it. That meant that the creature mostly relied on sight and hearing. A semblance of a plan started to form in his mind, but it was all ruined when Hermione finally regained her courage and cast, flipendo. At the troll. Of course, the creature barely blinked at the spell hit its head and splashed back as if nothing happened. What the hell was that girl thinking? Trolls are notoriously known to have magic-resistant skin which was why it was recommended to use indirect attacks and not directly cast at them. The girl froze, as if not believing that her spell didn't work, and Harry did his best to stop the situation but casting, Lumos Maxima. The spell actually a variation of the Lumos charm without any limitation on the output and where the ball of light can leave the wand and be controlled at the caster's will. Harry moved the ball towards the face of the troll and overpowered the spell massively, blinding the troll and Hermione as well probably, Harry was closing his eyes in preparation. The troll screamed in pain, and from the sound of it, Hermione yelped. Again, Harry pushed her into the stall and weaved the biggest illusion he could manage around himself in Hermione's stall. The troll blinked as he regained his eyesight and looked around probably still looking for Hermione. Honestly, the young potter was struggling while maintaining the spell. It wasn't designed to be used on something of this scale, and Harry, while very strong for his age, is still not strong enough for many feats of magic. The troll sniffed, growled, and prepared to leave. Of course, that was when Longbottom and Weasley barged in with their wands in hand and cast a spell at the troll. Honestly, Harry didn't even see them cast, which was useless since the spells splashed on the creature's magic-resistant skin. However, they seemed to have angered the troll who lashed around with his club and smashed the stall Hermione was under. The girl's scream reassured Harry, and from the look of it, she was able to duck underneath the monster's swing. Longbottom yelled out to Weasley, confuse it. Harry didn't know what he expected to happen, but it wasn't for Weasley to grab and dung bomb and send it at the troll's head. The damn creature barely had a sense of smell, but the smoke seemed to hurt the troll's eyes. The bomb seemed to have driven the troll berserk, as it started to stamp around blindingly as if trying to hit an invisible opponent. Longbottom seemed to realize something, the eyes, try to send spells at his eyes. The two boys started to send stinging spells at it, most of the missing, but a few hitting enough for the troll to keep yelling in pain. Honestly, Harry didn't know what he could do. The more the two Gryffindors aggravated the troll, the more violent it became. Hermione looked almost catatonic, so she wouldn't be of any help. Hitting it with its own club was possible but unless it's a straight hit to the head at a certain angle, it was very unlikely for the troll to be knocked out from it. Although, 
a hit to the back of the head could be possible. The troll still hadn't realized that he was there, and Harry was hoping for things to stay that way. The young potter chose to close his eyes and listen to the troll's song. He tried to isolate the song of its skin and found it to be akin to a wall where spells are splashed onto. It was very strong, but songs do have an inverse. Sound can be cancelled. It wasn't anything Harry had done before but he had to try. Harry listened to the song, understood it, felt all its nuances, its rhythms and emotions, and channeled its complete inverse. Harry was lucky that it was basic in its complexity, yet slightly surprisingly strong. All that meant was that Harry's inverse melody wouldn't be extremely complicated. Slowly, as he pictured the two melodies together, they started to cancel each other out, Harry combined his new song into a spell and murmured, Petrificus Totalis. The troll who was looking at Longbottom, and hence, had his back at Harry, was hit with the spell which didn't splash on his skin like Longbottom and Weasley's spells did. It did seem to hit the troll, who stiffened and seemed to struggle to move. The troll was still able to push Longbottom away, who fell on the ground while wincing. The spell obviously wasn't perfect, the creature must have some more protection outside his skin, but it was enough, to make it safe to get Hermione and run away, or at least, hit him with his bat in the head. Funnily enough, Weasley seemed to take that opportunity to finally become useful and cast, Wingardium Leviosa, causing the club to fly out of the troll's hand and rose high up into the air, and dropped, with a sickening crack, onto its owner's head. The troll swayed on the spot and then fell flat on its face, with a thud that made the whole room tremble. Harry used this chance to get away, not wanting to deal with Longbottom or Weasley. He especially didn't want them to know that he had saved Hermione's life. They would blab out in seconds to their friends, and Harry would need to deal with the aftermath in his own house. Hermione didn't seem to have noticed him in the start, which was good because she was a terrible liar. Harry ran away from the scene, knowing that the professors weren't that far behind. He snuck into one of the secret passages towards the dungeon and went to the common room. The moment he arrived he was accosted by his hysterical friends. Daphne was practically hugging him while shaking like a leaf, where in Merlin's name were you? Harry schooled his features and gave them a lazy grin, sorry, you wouldn't believe the traffic. There was this old woman who needed help carrying her groceries, so I couldn't just leave her alone, the poor woman, so, I helped her. She even gave me a piece of pie as a thank you. We're in Hogwarts. There are no old ladies carrying groceries here, Tracy answered him with a deadpan look. Now, that you mention it, she might have been a painting. Oh, yeah, she was definitely a painting. Her granddaughter was very rather pretty and asked me to dance for her. A lovely young woman. Harry answered wistfully. Blaze's eye twitch, so, you're telling me that you were busy helping an old woman in a painting carry her groceries and danced for her granddaughter, and that's why you are late. Harry didn't give him an answer and slowly the four friends burst into laughter. These excuses were really good at defusing tense situations. The sheer ridiculousness of them was enough to relax them. After giggling for a bit, Daphne asked, what were you actually doing? Harry shrugged, I left halfway through the feast to go to the bathroom and then when I went back to the great hall, no one was there. So, I just went to the kitchens asked the elves to make me some hot chocolate and walked back here. Why was the great hall empty anyway? Thankfully, they didn't notice that Harry was there during the feast until Filch came in running. The excitement and panic must have suppressed what happened before. Tracy seemed very glad to start some gossip, you don't know? A troll broke into the school grounds and Filch ran in yelling about it before he passed out. Dumbledore told us to come back to our common rooms while the professors deal with the situation. Harry gave her a weird look, why didn't he just make you stay in the Great Hall? Students could have been attacked on the way to the common room. The Slytherin stiffened, I hadn't thought of that. Harry shrugged, anyway, we're all safe and sound, so let's not think about what could have happened. But now that I think of it, saying that a troll attacked me while I was in the bathroom would be a very good excuse if I'm late. I will hurt you, Potter, Daphne answered while growling. Before he could tease her further, Gemma Farley, the Slytherin fifth-year prefect girl spoke up, first years, I know that things are tense, but this is still Samhain and the ritual is ready. For those that wish to undergo the crest unlocking ceremony, please follow me. Oh, yeah, he had forgotten about this because of the troll mess. Chapter 32 Samhain Rituals October 31, 1991, Hogwarts Before he could tease her further, Gemma Farley, the Slytherin fifth-year prefect girl spoke up, First years, I know that things are tense, 
but this is still Samhain and the ritual is ready. For those that wish to undergo the crest unlocking ceremony, please follow me. Oh, yeah, he had forgotten about this because of the troll mess. Harry was too distracted by the possibility of his friend dying to remember that the crest activation ceremony was today. He had reread the family magics book about half a dozen times to make sure that he didn't miss anything. Oh, Harry was sure that his classmates had no idea how it worked, certainly less than him at least, but Harry didn't like that the knowledge he found was imprecise, having been translated using a charm and thus had a lot of grammar mistakes and nonsensical sentences. Even with all his preparations, Harry was still nervous about the ritual. The results were varied, even with people in the same family, but what everyone said was that it was a life-changing experience and that they were fundamentally different because of it. It was that unpredictability that caused Harry to be wary. He would wake up the following day as a different person altogether. Harry didn't seem to be the only first year who seemed to be nervous. Everyone seemed to be shaken in some way. Harry's friends looked very pale walking behind Gemma Farley. Even Malfoy, who had proudly announced his superiority because of his family, was practically shaking in fear. It was probably because he never attended a ritual before. For the crest activation to work, a high amount of ambient foreign magic must be in the body, and an easy way to do that was to participate in one of the rites rituals, and then unlock the crest afterwards. However, before the age of eleven, children were not allowed to attend these rituals because of the chaotic nature of their magic. This was everyone's first ritual and so, even before activating the crest, they had to go through the Samhain rites. The prefect seemed to have noticed their unease and gave them a soft smile, don't worry. Everything is going to be fine. A few people relaxed but Harry was still apprehensive about the task ahead. He followed Gemma down the stairs. However, the prefect stopped halfway there and pressed a particular brick, no one is allowed to enter these rooms without the court's express permission. These rooms are the secondary ritual rooms that are available to the public, but still with the court's permission of course and can only be used for the standard rites, like Samhain, Beltane, and so on. Should you be lucky enough to join the court when you're older, you will be allowed to enter the private ritual rooms to do what you wish. The Samhain ritual has been prepared for you, but you will need to learn and perform them yourselves if you wish to participate in another one. Oh, and one final thing, do not tell anyone about these rooms. Dumbledore practically made the old rites illegal, and we don't need some fanatic muggle-born to try to get them banned because it's barbaric. This is a Slytherin house secret. If you break it, you will be punished severely. Do you understand? The speech was enrapturing, and Gemma was far different from the way she presented herself on the first day. She was very severe and was practically threatening them into secrecy, although Harry could understand why. Children were children, and he could see Draco prancing about bragging about the fact that Slytherin had ritual rooms to Longbottom in an attempt to make the boy who lived, jealous. The prefect's face softened at the collective affirmation, Good. Now, go get ready for the ritual. We have taken the luxury of giving you ritual robes to wear, as well as the customary masks to do so. They will be in your changing rooms. You will find your name written on them. These are provided to you by the seventh year students, the same way you will be required to provide a robe to the first years when you are their age. You have ten minutes to change and come here after which I will escort you to the ritual. You will not wear anything but your robes. So. Leave your wands, jewelry, or even underwear in the changing room. Oh, ritual robes. Harry sort of forgot about them. They were clothes that were designed to be magically inert, so as to not interfere with the ritual. It was a nifty anecdote that people who couldn't afford them had to be naked when participating in a ritual, which thankfully wasn't the case then. Harry and his classmates went into the changing rooms where he found a piece of parchment with his name on it on top of some black robes. From the look of them, they looked more like what he expected traditional wizarding robes to be. They were barely more than sheets of fabric with sleeves, but Harry knew differently. There was something fundamentally magical about them. Honestly, to his magical hearing, the robes sounded like a tuning fork. They were inert without any drums or melody, but the biggest issue was how they interacted with the environment. Ambient magic seemed to glide off it. Nothing was truly inert in the world. There were reactions between magic, between songs, and Harry could hear them. But for some reason, the ambient magic seemed to glide off it. Oh, there was probably a limit, and too much direct magic could overwhelm the properties on the robes, but it was a very curious artifact, nonetheless. The young potter changed and put his wand with his clothes. He left the changing room with nothing on him but the ritual robes. He was met by the others on the way out. 
Everyone seemed to have a different ritual robe or at least a style of robes. Harry did look like he had the most basic ones because blazes were blue with a few ornaments there. But Malfoy's robe was green with snakes all over it that looked like they were alive. The blonde gave Harry a smug look. The last Potter rolled his eyes, that boy really was extremely spoilt. When they rejoined Gemma, and he raised an eyebrow at the girls' robes. They looked more like dresses than ritual robes. Gemma, herself, was there, wearing a robe, but also with masks in her hands. They looked green and neutral, and she handed them up in silence. Harry nodded at her and brought the mask on his head, only to feel it shape itself around his face. He looked around and saw that it was very hard to distinguish his classmates from one another outside their gender that it. Gemma then spoke up, Good. Now, from now on we will not speak until the sun rises. A word of advice, do not resist the magic. It will hurt if you do. Come on let's go. The first years then followed the prefect to what must have been the ritual room. The marble ground was cold to their naked feet. They walked up a flight of stairs and finally arrived at their destination. It was obviously an old room illuminated only by candles that surrounded a large stone. That stone was covered in runes that Harry had never seen before. The first years followed the participants by surrounding the stone in question. When all of the first years entered the room, the door closed and merged into the wall. The entire room was silent, both magically and in real life. Slowly, a strange woman wearing a red robe walked towards the altar at the bottom of the stone and brought a pure white rabbit in front of it. She looked around raised her hand grabbed the ritual knife that was next to the altar and stabbed the small animal in the heart. The woman quickly returned to her place in the circle. Honestly, Harry would have been horrified by the sheer cruelty of killing such an innocent animal, but suddenly the runes started to glow and the candle's fire dimmed. Harry could feel it, the magic. He could hear it. It was one of the most beautiful and terrible things he had ever heard in his life. It wasn't just magic. It was something different, something more. What Harry heard couldn't be called a song. It had an extra dimension or perhaps even several extra dimensions to it. Harry did his best to try to understand it but to no avail. It was mournful yet happy, angry yet sad, it was familiar in a way that he couldn't explain. It was the veil of death that was becoming nothing more than a curtain. He tried to look past it, feel past it, but felt a sense of alarm. If he tried to understand what should not be understood, to see past the veil, past what mortals ever see, then he would be forever changed, and not in a good way. He stopped trying to figure the melody out but was worried by it trying to affect his own. No, that's not it. Harry's magic was completely fine, his very cells were somehow being filled by the magic of the ritual and he had to stifle a gasp as he realized what he was feeling. It felt like intense love and protection, a mother's love, a father's pride. Was this what was on the other side? Harry didn't remember his past life beyond its pitiful end. He didn't remember what happened after and that scared him. Because Harry had defied death, he knew it, and it likely knew it as well. Samhain was the day of the dead and Harry, even if his mind didn't remember, his soul has experienced death. Harry could feel it being watched being judged. There was no one in front of him, but Harry could feel it. Someone was there looking into his very soul. Something old, something new, something familiar, death was judging him the man who defied it and the boy who remembered what he should not. Harry knew that at any second the being could snuff out his life, and take what is owed to it because he was alive, thus belonging to death. And yet nothing came. The energy didn't hurt him, and the feeling of oppression vanished into welcome. Harry sagged in relief and relished the feeling of the magic in his body. And just like that, the candles brightened again, and the runes on the stone vanished. The ritual was over, but his night still wasn't over. Harry stayed put not knowing what to do. The older students started to leave, Gemma included, and the young potter didn't know whether to follow her or not. Suddenly a bright light occurred from the stone blinding the young Slytherin. But Harry didn't scream for the brightness of the light instead, he heard a burst of magic hit every single first year at once. And that was when the pain started. The spell, whatever that was, brought the magic from the ritual and pushed it towards his magical circuits. It felt like his blood had turned to fire going through his veins. Harry could feel the light spread throughout his body, looking for something until he found it. It was very well hidden near his heart. The magic attempted to sign Ridge's with whatever it was it had found as if asking for permission. The thing returned some energy of its own, as if judging it, before letting the magic through. That was when the pain was magnified in its intensity and Harry was gritting his teeth to suppress the scream. But also, 
Harry noticed that the songs around him started to shift like something was also added. The feeling continued for a few seconds, but it felt like hours. When the pain subsidized into soreness, Harry tried to walk only for the world to slowly darken. Mere seconds later, he fell down unconscious from the strain of what happened to him. Chapter 33, Samhain Recovery November 1, 1991, Hogwarts The feeling continued for a few seconds, but it felt like hours. When the pain subsidized into soreness, Harry tried to walk only for the world to slowly darken. Mere seconds later, he fell down unconscious from the strain of what happened to him. Harry blinked his eyes open and tried to remember why his body felt so sore. It was as if he had run a marathon the day before. Thinking back on the events of the previous day, he sat up abruptly and gasped. The ritual. What happened after the ritual? The initial part was intoxicating, but the rest, what he assumed to be the crest activation ritual was practically torture. He had never felt such pain in his life, and hopefully, he will never do so again. The young Slytherin looked around and noticed that he was in his dormitory. Everyone was still asleep. Crab and Goyle were heavily snoring, and Blaze, Draco, and Theo looked passed out wearing their normal pajamas. If it wasn't for the ache he felt whenever he moved his body and his memories, he would have thought that it was a normal morning. Wait a minute, they were wearing their pajamas? Harry looked down and froze as he saw that he was in fact wearing his own sleepwear. The Potter Scion distinctly remembered passing out in the ceremonial robe provided to him for the ritual. Did someone dress him to sleep? Harry blushed in embarrassment at the thought but shook his head and decided to figure out what happened. He palmed his wand which happened to be on his nightstand and muttered, Tempest. Pain. That was what he felt. Absolute pain. It was like pulling a muscle. Oh, the spell worked as the date and time had appeared out of thin air. But the very act of casting magic was agonizing. What was going on with him? Harry grimaced until the spell fizzled out, sighing in relief afterwards. Did the ritual somehow screw with his magic? He needed to see someone like it. From the previous spell, he knew that it was the morning after the ritual, which happened to be a Friday. Luckily, he only had a history of magic double class, a theoretical charms double class, and practical herbology. It was usually a pretty dull day, all things considered, without any magic casting, but Harry was glad for it, because it gave him time to figure out whatever happened to his magic. Seeing that it wasn't even six in the morning yet, Harry decided to go into the common room and leave his classmates to their blissful sleep. He needed some time to himself, and he could still interrogate them about what happened to him the day before. The young Slytherin sneakily went to the bathroom to change his uniform, and when he removed his shirt, he froze at the sight of a tattoo on his chest. It was far bigger than anything he could have reasonably put on his body. Here on his chest, a jet black raven looked as if it was taking flight. It was so detailed. It looked like it was about to leave his body at any moment. No artist, no matter how talented, could have done something like this. It was beautiful, Harry would admit it, but he never felt the need to do something like this on his body before. Numbly, Harry just put on his uniform and walked down to the common room. He was met with silence, which was somehow deafening. Harry sat down on his usual couch and started to think. Casting spells becoming painful was a big issue for a wizard to have. The ritual was far more painful than it should have been. There were a few reports of slight pain and discomfort, but not something like what happened to him. The raven was a clue about what happened. Harry's book did say that crests could manifest physically in certain ways, it was mostly just small marks or tattoos. In fact, they were rather common as a declaration of who is the head of the family which would have a special mark in some way. The raven was the manifestation of Harry's crest, but he had never read anywhere about any connection between the Potter family and the bird. These tattoos were often designed by the first holder of the crest and were often similar to certain family symbols or signets, which for some reason, wasn't the case for Harry. The young Slytherin decided to just take a walk to the castle. He needed answers, and he needed to stop the pain whenever he used magic. Harry walked out of the common room and instinctively started to walk up the stairs. He passed by a few paintings, and it was then that he noticed that something was different. It was subtle, but Harry could tell. The songs were different. Oh, their properties were the same, but Harry could hear more. It was like before, it was muffled, but now he could hear it clearly. Oh, it wasn't even the melodies themselves that were clear, but also the addition of something more. When Harry decided to focus on the painting of a beautiful landscape and listen to its song. There was this feeling of wonder and pride emanating from it. 
he decided to look at the painting of a beautiful young woman and felt love and warmth woven into the painting's song. It was like he could feel the emotions tied to every enchantment. He needed to experiment on this further, with artifacts other than paintings as well. Harry kept walking up the stairs while marveling at the extra sense of magic that he had gained. He would need to understand how it worked and how he could use it properly, but it was an unexpected boon from the ritual. Additionally, the fact that he could use his magical hearing without pain boded well for the health of his magic. Without even thinking about it, Harry found himself on the seventh floor, specifically, in front of a certain tapestry of an idiot attempting to teach trolls how to dance ballet. Harry barely even thought about the room of requirements to solve his issue. Did he subconsciously think that it might be helpful in his plight? Harry was practically walking on autopilot, lost in his head trying to figure out what happened. Well, what could he lose? It's not like he could ask anyone about it. Family crests are very private matters. Big families often have members that are healers especially to deal with such matters. There was no mention anywhere about a Potter magical crest, and Harry didn't really expect much from his crest outside of a few family potion recipes, which was the area of magic that his ancestors often focused on. Still, Harry decided to go for it and walked towards the wall while thinking, I want a place that can help my condition. I want a place that can help my condition. I want a place that can help my condition. On the third turn, a door surprisingly materialized. Harry honestly, didn't expect anything but slowly walked inside. It looked like a mix of a magical workshop and a bath. There was no explanation about what happened other than a book that was opened on the conjured desk. Harry slowly walked there and saw the title of the opened page, Forceful Expansion of Magical Circuits and Its Consequences. The young Slytherin immediately started to carefully read the document. Oh, it was very complicated probably a thesis for a healer of some sort but the premise was slightly understandable. It described the event of someone having atrophied his magical circuits, either by not casting magic at all or by having been under a curse that muddled the flow of their magic, who later became free of their plight. Magic remembers, and thus, he remembers how much intake the body used to handle and will try to constantly channel the previous capacity of magic. The forceful magic tended to oversaturate the magical circuits, causing them to overheat with every spell, which caused a lot of pain in the process. Yes. This was a very good estimation of what happened to him. For some reason, the magical crest decided that his body should output more magic and so overwhelmed his circuits with more magic. The good news was that it was a temporary issue that would continue until the circuits compensate for the increased input. The bad news was that it would hurt like hell every time he cast a spell until that time. Thankfully, the thesis described a method of using a pre-ritual bath to moderate the output, making the expansion slower, but also less painful. Pre-ritual baths were artifacts whose purpose is to absorb the excess magic of a wizard or witch, to stop it from affecting especially delicate rituals. The room seemed to have provided Harry with one, and slowly, the young potter took off his clothes and sank into the bath. The feeling of relief was immediate. Harry hadn't noticed how much his body ached from the magic when he woke up and just sighed in pleasure when it did its work. With a small dip in this bath every day, he would be able to cast magic, while the magical circuit expansion happened during the night while he was asleep. Harry was so relaxed that he almost fell asleep while in the tub. It was when he looked at the clock in the room and realized that he almost missed breakfast, that he quickly got up to go to the great hall. Once he was dry and clothed once more, he palmed his wand and decided to see if the bath worked. He waved his wand while murmuring, Lumos Maxima, and a ball of light appeared out of his wand and floated in front of him. Oh, his body ached slightly more with the magic, but it didn't even come close to the agony he felt earlier. But this was a temporary solution at best, a band-aid on top of a wound. Harry will still have to deal with the magical circuit expansion for weeks if not months, and the ritual bath will only help so far. The more magic he casts every day, the more painful it will become until his next bath. That meant that Harry would need to spend less time experimenting with magic, which was a huge downside in his opinion. There was still the issue of why Harry's crest decided that he didn't have enough magic. He was already on the upper tier of the magical power scale. He was powerful for his age. In his mind, Harry imagined Albus Dumbledore and Tom Riddle to be around as powerful as he was at his age. There were no psychological blocks on his magic to cause any atrophy, so why did the crest decide that Harry's usual magic generation was more than what his circuits could handle? Well, it was something Harry needed to research further, but there was practically no source material other than the badly translated book he found in the Room of Requirements. Still, Harry tried to hypothesize on the reason, on his way to the Great Hall, 
where he sat down to have his usual breakfast and a good dose of coffee. The young potter noticed that Hermione wasn't sitting alone but seemed to be arguing with Longbottom and Weasley. The fact that they had come to rescue her seemed to destroy any aversion they had towards each other. Harry didn't really know how to feel about that and just chose to continue eating. Immediately, he was accosted by Blaze, Daphne, and Tracy. They immediately sat next to him. Daphne was the first to break her silence, Are you all right, Harry? The boy nodded, Yeah, why is that? You're kidding right, mate. Blaze interjected, You sort of screamed in pain during the ritual yesterday and just passed out. What happened, Harry? Chapter 34, Samhain Aftermath November 1, 1991, Hogwarts Immediately, he was accosted by Blaze, Daphne, and Tracy. They immediately sat next to him. Daphne was the first to break her silence, Are you all right, Harry? The boy nodded, Yeah, why is that? You're kidding right, mate. Blaze interjected, You sort of screamed in pain during the ritual yesterday and just passed out. What happened, Harry? Harry simply shrugged, I'm not really sure. I remember the ritual, then feeling like I was burning from the inside, and finally waking up in my bed. I was sore and really didn't know what happened, so I decided to take a walk. Was the ritual supposed to be that painful? Blaze gave him a pondering condition, I guess there was some stinging and itching, but I wouldn't say it felt like I was burning from the inside. Daphne interjected, really? It didn't hurt at all for me. It actually felt good, a little warm even. They all turned to Tracy who rolled her eyes, don't look at me, I didn't activate any crest of anything, at their apological looks she continued, come on, we all know that I wasn't getting a crest. My family isn't old enough to have one. I'm not disappointed and considering how painful Harry's activation was, I'm grateful that I didn't have to go through that. Anyone with a functioning brain wouldn't want to go through what Harry did, Blaze responded with a snort. He then turned to Harry, Seriously, did you at least get your crest? The young potter nodded, and Blaze grinned enthusiastically, Well, go on, show us. I don't think that it's a good idea, Blaze. Maybe in the dormitory, Harry protested. Come on I'll even show you mine, his friend insisted. Blaze then pulled up his right sleeve and Harry saw his magical crest. It was a lot smaller than Harry's but looked just as lifelike. Honestly, it was a work of art. I was an eagle's head, that looked fierce and proud, with piercing eyes that seemed to look right through him. The beak was sharp and curved, with tiny ridges along the edges. The feathers were detailed and intricate, with shades of black and white that blended together perfectly. Honestly, it looked kingly. The smug young wizard relished in their look of awe, yeah, I know it's cool. Mother told me that my family is as old as Rome itself and that our crest symbolizes that connection. Daphne though didn't want to be outclassed and pulled up her own sleeve, revealing her own crest, which happened to be a flower, I still think mine is better. It looked beautiful, and surprisingly had faint colors unlike Harry's and Blaze's. The flower was small with white delicate petals, with a hint of green at its base. Harry didn't recognize what type of flower it was, but Daphne who was grinning smugly at them continued, it's called a lily of the valley. It's a flower that can even survive in winter that symbolizes purity and luck. I sent a letter to my father about it. Apparently, every green grass gets a unique flower when activating them. It's part of our druid ancestry, I think. Ah, druids, the original magic users in the British Isles before the Romans invaded. Their practices tended to be more in line with connecting with nature and manipulating it. Of course, they could be extremely dangerous, especially with the rumors of sacrificial rituals going around but what made them unique was the fact that they were the only people to ever be able to channel the direct power of a ley line directly, creating massive acts of magic, and stopping most invaders. Unfortunately, the art of druidism was somewhat passive until they master the basics which took decades. Compare it to the endless Roman legions that use wands and standardized spells, they were quickly defeated. However, even now, there were a few houses with druid ancestry, like the green grasses and the long bottoms. They tended to have a green touch in herbology, and they were celebrated by the community because they were often charged with the maintenance and sale of magical plants, especially the ones with ingredients. They had special rituals and practices that guaranteed the health of their plants and their quality when brewing potions. That, of course, made House Green Grass one of the wealthiest houses in the British Isles, and virtually untouchable. Potions were critical in a magical society. 
jeopardizing their main providers of quality ingredients would either make them leave for another country or just only sell to their enemies. Yet, politically and magically, House Greengrass wasn't that big of a deal, but it was the sleeping lion that no one had any intention of poking. While he was lost in his own head, Harry's friends looked at him expectantly until Tracy spoke up, Well go on, then, show us. The young Slytherin held his head in embarrassment, it's a bit more complicated. My crest is a bit bigger than yours. Is that normal? Daphne looked pensive, I honestly don't know. I think it depends on the crest's creator. People often decide for it to be small and on their arms because it's easy to show and would provide proof of their ritual. Oh, for Merlin's sake, Tracy exclaimed, fine, I'll do it myself. Before he could react, Tracy pulled up his sleeve and saw the tattoo that seemed to go up his arm. What is that? Blaze asked. Harry sighed in exasperation, I told you I would show you in the common room. To answer your question, that's the wing of my crest. It's sort of centered on my chest not my arm like yours, and it's honestly massive. What is it? Daphne questioned. A raven, he replied. The rest of the day, Harry's friend pestered him about what his crests looked like. During this time, everyone was bragging about their crests. It was mostly harmless fun, it didn't really reveal anything about the magic or any family secrets. Malfoy kept bragging about the peacock on his arm, and Pansy Parkinson about the tulip. Theodore not happened to have a crest that took the shape of a moon of all things, but the boy stayed quiet as he usually was, and didn't show even an ounce of enthusiasm. Surprisingly, Crab and Goyle ended up with one, with a hammer and an axe respectively, living up to their Viking ancestors. Harry, though, stayed silent, trying to understand what his crest even meant. There was no relationship between House Potter and Ravens. In fact, the Potter name started less than a thousand years ago by an eccentric potty winner that invented many pertinent potions. He was called the Potterer because of the plants he had to take care of to pursue his experiments. That name was later corrupted into Potter which was used by his children and all of his descendants. Their symbol was that of a lion, which some descendant who was sorted in Greyfinder chose. After that, it became traditional for potters to be sorted in the House of Lions, although there were a few exceptions over the centuries. Long story short, there were no connections between Ravens and the Potter family at all. However, there was one thing. One tiny little connection, because Ravens are symbols of the dead, and there was a very old and very powerful family connected to the Potters that had a close relationship with the concept. However, the Peveril family was a kin of worms that Harry really didn't want to open so he'll leave it be until he can call himself even competent enough to handle the mystery. As for the other students, outside of that, no one really got a crest, or at least, no one revealed that they had one. Millicent Bolstrode looked practically in tears when Parkinson insulted her lineage and blood, but thankfully Professor Sprout was able to calm the situation somewhat. By the time they had arrived in the common room, Draco kept giving Harry smug looks, What about you, Potter? Did you end up with a crest? or did it find you as unworthy as your blood? After all, you were screaming like a little girl last night. Harry gave the blonde an unimpressed look, yes, my crest was unlocked last night. I think you are lying, Draco responded with a mocking tone. Well think away. It wouldn't be the first time that you were wrong, Draco. The boy seemed to grit his teeth in anger, I think that your own ancestors found you unworthy and punished you for your traitor blood. Maybe the crest even saw how much your mood blood mother tainted your line and is writing you off as a lost cause. I wonder if it felt the same when you were screaming in pain yesterday. It certainly sounded like you were burned alive as your parents did. Tell me, did the crest want to finish the job for the sake of its line? The entire conversation froze instantly with that statement. Harry hadn't really needed to deal with Draco for weeks, where the young boy kept his distance in fear of Harry's retaliation. But that was far more than just insulting his mother as he had previously. The idea that Harry didn't have a crest seemed to give the boy more courage. The blonde has been trying to remove Harry as a threat for the long run, for when the house politics began. He was probably doing it at his father's insistence, or maybe, he was misinterpreting what the man meant. Lucius Malfoy was a cunning man, and he wouldn't risk his son getting hurt for no reason. Harry didn't know, nor did he care. It happened and he was going to deal with the consequences, Draco, you have ten seconds to apologize for what you have just said and take back your words. The blonde was then accompanied by his two bodyguards who tried to look threatening, I don't think so. Harry just gave him a steely look and counted inwardly until ten. After which the entire common room held its breath. 
By the time he finished counting, the young potter walked forwards and projected his magic once more. He really didn't want to exert himself again, especially with his condition, but a show of power to silence Malfoy was necessary. The three boys were trembling in fear, but he didn't care. Harry took out his wand, while the two bodyguards tried to hex him. With a twitch of his fingers, he moved the two boys' arms causing their spells to miss massively. Harry raised an eyebrow at the spells, a balding hex and a pimple-bursting jinx. What were you hoping to achieve with that? Harry didn't even let them answer as he moved his wand and cast, Detrudo. It was the ancestor of the repelling charm, that worked with small forces. It was in the book about telekinetic magic that he had borrowed from the library, and it was a very useful spell. It lacked the raw power of the other spell, but it could target up to five small objects at once. Harry targeted the two boys' wrists, giving them a light sprain, and making them drop their wands. He then cast, Flipendo. Sending the two boys flying back. Meanwhile, the young Malfoy was trembling in fear, with his wand raised. Harry again raised an eyebrow, what were you realistically hoping to achieve, Draco? I just don't understand you, really. You have so much potential, and yet, you squander it on nonsense like this. The boy woke up from his stupor and kept casting spells at Harry. They were barely more than pranking jinxes, and Harry instead of sending a spell back, decided to cast an illusion talking his form and going forwards while making himself invisible. Harry prepared himself for the strain that the spell usually causes him, but for some reason, it felt almost natural. The illusion was almost perfect, and the invisibility illusion felt almost real. It was a far cry from the illusion he used the previous day against the troll. The boy kept casting spells at the illusion, who kept dodging every spell in a superhuman manner while walking forward. Harry would have never been able to do such a thing, the boy was practically shaking and fell down while he was walking back in fear. Having enough of terrifying the boy, Harry cancelled the illusion which was looming threateningly over the downed Malfoy and simply cast a disarming charm, Expelliarmus. From his original position. The boy was sent back with his arm far away from him. I expect a written letter of apology tomorrow or I will send one to your parents, Harry spoke up before turning and leaving for his dormitory. Chapter 35, The Snowy Day November 2, 1991, Hogwarts Having enough of terrifying the boy, Harry cancelled the illusion which was looming threateningly over the downed Malfoy and simply cast a disarming charm, Expelliarmus. From his original position, the boy was sent back with his arm far away from him. I expect a written letter of apology tomorrow or I will send one to your parents, Harry spoke up before turning and leaving for his dormitory. The following morning, Harry woke up to something pecking his head. He tried to shoo it with his hands but hit nothing. He let out a tired groan, and muttered, Stop it. And yet the pecking didn't stop. Having lost his sleep entirely decided to see who was bothering him. Slowly sitting up, he was accosted by a white figure that seemed to be glaring at him. Harry frowned at the figure and put on his glasses to see more clearly, Hedwig. The owl's glare seemed to have intensified. It was far too intense for a bird to have. Harry immediately realized what was wrong. He really hasn't visited Hedwig for weeks and he was feeling a bit guilty at the thought of his negligence towards his friend. He gave the owl an apologetic look, I'm sorry Hedwig. I haven't hung out with you for a while. The snowy owl let out a reproachful screech in response and Harry grimaced, tell you what, I don't have classes with you today, so why don't you hang out with me all day? Spend some quality time together. We can even pass by the kitchens to get some breakfast before anyone else. We might even get some yummy bacon. You'd like that, wouldn't you, girl? The owl hooted softly, which the young potter interpreted as an agreement. Harry gave his companion a warm smile and continued, tell you what. I'll take a quick shower, get dressed and we'll leave. The snowy owl bobbed her head in agreement and Harry decided to get ready. While taking a shower, a thought entertained his mind. His fight with Draco was somewhat expected, but Harry would have thought that the blonde would have tried to ambush him or at least do it privately in case something goes wrong, and not in the common room. It was a risky maneuver, and the boy had embarrassed himself immensely. Oh, Harry knew that Draco was stewing at Harry's superiority in practically their classes. Even in potions, which he had heard from Crab that the blonde was tutored by his godfather during his childhood, where Snape visibly hated Harry, the Malfoy scion was overshadowed by Harry's talent. Draco's father was probably the one pushing him to excel so far. Maybe the boy thought that Harry's painful unlocking of his family crest was a sign of weakness, or that maybe Harry hadn't unlocked his at all. 
but family crests do not make wizards better at magic, especially when Draco's father still held the primary crest. Honestly, Harry didn't know what was going on in Draco's head. He seemed insistent on aggravating everyone. From Longbottom to Harry himself, the Malfoy scion seemed determined on making enemies. The worst thing is that Harry had tried being cordial, and even befriending the boy, but he was insistent on continuing this petty one-sided rivalry. Deciding not to ruin his morning with thoughts of Draco Malfoy of all people, he finished showering and put on some clothes. The moment he exited the bathroom, his own immediately flew to his shoulder and gave him an expectant look. Harry chuckled at his owl's antics, you really are a diva, Hedwig. The owl preened proudly and pecked him on the head once more. He was going to have some breakfast first, and then go to the room of requirements for his daily bath. Harry had gotten rough directions to the kitchens from one of the upper years around a week back, and he was going to abuse the hell out of it. Harry walked to the great hall and went to the passage under the entrance. Technically, the kitchens were in the dungeons, but for some reason, they were no direct way from the common room without going to the above floor. It was probably because it was close to the Hufflepuff dormitory. Still, Harry had gotten a bit lost after he went down the stairs, and instead of asking the paintings, decided to take out his wand and murmured, Point me, kitchen entrance. The wand immediately levitated itself and spun around pointing towards Harry's right. But the Potter Scion didn't care, he was too preoccupied with the telltale burning of his condition but suppressed the urge to scream. His flinch however was noticed by his companion who gave him a penetrating look. For some reason, Harry felt as if he had to explain himself, don't worry, Hedwig. It's a temporary condition of mine. A side effect of unlocking my family crest. After breakfast, I'll take care of it for the day. The owl nodded and pointed towards the floating wand. With a chuckle, the potter scion followed the wand's direction, and a few minutes later, the wand pointed to the painting of a giant painting of various fruits. Harry tentatively put his hand up against the painting and tickled the painted pear. The damn thing actually giggled and turned into a giant door handle. Harry grabbed the pair and opened the door revealing a giant high ceiling room as large as the Great Hall, on the other side. There were four long wooden tables that were positioned exactly beneath the four house tables above, in the Great Hall. They already seemed to be full of food, ready to be sent up through the ceiling to their counterparts above. At least a hundred little elves were standing around the kitchen, beaming, bowing, to Harry. They were all wearing the same uniform a tea towel stamped with the Hogwarts crest and tied like a toga. One of the elves finally decided to speak with him, I best tweak, young student. Why use be in our kitchens? Harry frowned at the broken English but smiled immediately after, well I heard that you were all the most hard-working elves in the country, and I wanted to see for myself. The elves preened proudly at that, of course, Wes being the most hard-working. Wes Hogwarts elves. Harry chuckled, of that, I have no doubt. Tell you what, Tweak, do you mind getting some bacon for my friend Hedwig here? She's very hungry. As am I for that matter. Before he even finished his sentence, Harry was immediately pushed towards one of the tables and a plate of food was summoned in front of him. Hedwig, on the other hand, had a plate full of bacon just for her. Harry gave the elves a gracious smile, thank you for the meal. I am sure it will be delicious. Oh, can you get me some coffee too? It's a bit of a morning ritual for me. A cup of coffee practically materialized next to his plate, thank you. You really are amazing. The elves seemed to be slightly teary but still had blinding smiles on their faces. Perhaps, they just weren't used to people giving them compliments, or thanking them for that matter. But at least they didn't jump at him and burst into tears like Dobby did to his counterpart in the stories. And the meal really was delicious. Hedwig practically devoured her small pile of bacon, and both Harry and his companion left the kitchen with full bellies, ready to continue their day. Harry then proceeded to walk towards the seventh floor to take his daily ritual bath. The room of requirements really was God sent, the Potter Scion really didn't know what he would have done if it didn't help him with his condition. Harry didn't want anyone, especially not Dumbledore or Quirrell to find out about his abilities. He was staying out of their little pissing match as much as possible. Harry walked by the door three times, while wishing for his ritual bath and as expected the door appeared. Hedwig's questioning hoot was very amusing, and Harry started to explain, it's called the room of requirements, it's supposed to turn into anything a person needs. Here, let me show you. As Harry disrobed and took a dip into the bath, he groaned in relief as the excess magic was siphoned off his body. He then gave Hedwig a wink and suddenly the room started to shift into a giant forest. Harry gave Hedwig a small smile, 
go on, girl, have fun. The snowy owl hooted and flew away. Harry, though, decided to use this time to take out a book he was slightly putting off reading. Its title was An Introduction in Alchemy. It was one of the required books for sixth years taking the alchemy elective. With all this talk of philosopher's stones and immortal alchemists, Harry had wanted to get a preliminary understanding of the field, even if it was probably far above his competence. Harry had copied the book, in the library, not wanting to let anyone know how advanced his studies truly were. And he started devouring the theory. Funnily enough, the concept is very simple and could be summarized into two words, equivalent exchange. Well, magic was technically based on the concept, but the exchanges made using alchemy were permanent ones. It was an entire overhaul of the wand magic system because it wasn't based on wands at all but on ritualism. With alchemy, transfiguration became transmutation. Charms became permanent enchantments, potions became permanent elixirs, and curses became unanchored and permanent. It was a very delicate concept of magic, that could easily backfire with permanent consequences. The fact that this was taught to 16-year-olds was disturbing. Then again, a first year could accidentally burn someone alive with a spell, so that wasn't out of the ordinary. And yet, alchemy was by far, the single most dangerous type of magic that Harry had read about so far. No wonder alchemists were so much in demand all over the world, they were the only ones capable of making permanent serums that can stop certain diseases. It was very hard though, and most people quit after a couple of lectures. Yet, Harry couldn't see a teenager with a subpar magical theory education understanding a word of this. That made Dumbledore practically the only competent alchemist in the country and that gave him a monopoly over all alchemical regents in the nation. That man made himself quite literally indispensable to magical Britain, and it was disgusting. His political positions in the Wizengamot, in the ICW, and as headmaster of Hogwarts, let alone the only source of alchemical elixirs in the country, quite literally made him untouchable. Should he lose all these positions, the political and economical ramifications would be massive. Alas, Harry had no wish to confront Dumbledore. He didn't even want to be on the man's radar. Let him distract himself with useless concepts of fate and destiny, while Harry grows as a wizard. The potter Sion put the book down with a huff. The contents were heavy, even for a scholar like him, and Harry realized that he would need to have a competent understanding of runes to start making sense of the specifics of the field. And it's not like Harry had any plans on using any sort of alchemy without a teacher. Yet, permanent magic was scary. Harry took out his wand and murmured, Tempus. And realized that it was almost noon. He had spent over five hours in the room and he needed to hurry up to get back to their daily meeting in the library. After all, he had a few things to say to her about Halloween. Harry called Hedwig back and got dressed. A few minutes later, he and his owl left the room and headed towards the library. Chapter 36, Lionheart November 9, 1991, Hogwarts Harry took out his wand and murmured, Tempus, and realized that it was almost noon. He had spent over five hours in the room and he needed to hurry up to get back to their daily meeting in the library. After all, he had a few things to say to her about Halloween. Harry called Hedwig back and got dressed. A few minutes later, he and his owl left the room and headed towards the library. Well, long story short, Hermione never showed up at the library that day. Or any of the days for the following week. It was odd for her. She would never stay away from there for too long. Harry had first thought that she was traumatized from the fight with the troll, but she seemed oddly chipper for someone who had almost died a few days prior. Hermione was going to the library, but only to take out books, and didn't actually study there. She probably stayed in the common room with her new friends. Oh, yeah, that was a thing. For some reason, she decided that Longbottom and Weasley of all people were good enough to be her friends. He did find that out the hard way, when he saw her toddling after them, trying to get them to stop leaving their assignments to the last minute. It was disgusting, and Harry had seen the two boys practically insult her for months and for some reason, she just forgave them, and practically started tutoring them. It put him in a foul mood, to everyone's confusion. After all, their friendship was supposed to be secret. And so, with new friends from her house, Hermione practically forgot about Harry, or maybe even actively avoided him. It hurt, even if he didn't want to admit it. It really hurt when someone just spits on your friendship like that. Harry had taken a leap of faith with Hermione. He didn't see the member of the Golden Trio, he didn't see the brave bookworm from the stories, 
he only saw a lonely girl that was as socially awkward as he was and offered her a hand in friendship. He knew how terrible being alone was, and he was willing to spare the girl. And in return, she spat on his goodwill and abandoned him for the first people that offered her a hand in friendship. Still, being alone was something Harry was used to. He was alone with the Disleys, and he was alone in his previous life. And so, the young Slytherin persevered. He stopped sitting by Hermione during classes, even if it was assigned to him previously. The professors seemed to see that whatever cordiality there was before was gone after Halloween and just pretended that nothing happened. Well, every professor except Snape, of course, was delighted at the sight of Harry being uncomfortable. Harry had decided to sit next to Daphne during class. The potion master had noticed the switch and wasn't having any of it, Potter, why are you sitting here? Because we have potion class, Professor. Harry responded in mock confusion. No, I have assigned you to partner up with Granger, and you will continue to do so until I say otherwise. Do you understand that, Potter? Harry grimaced and moved to sit next to Hermione, who looked just as awkward as he felt. The man proceeded to continue the lessons, and Harry promptly ignored his partner as the professor continued to explain the properties of the potion they were brewing, as well as the different techniques of doing so. When the man finally told them to read the instructions and start brewing, Harry silently went to pick up the potion ingredients and started preparing them. He didn't even look at Hermione when he told her, I'll prepare the ingredients. You, get the potion started. The girl stammered in response, but Harry ignored her and focused on dicing the hellebore roots and crushing the unicorn horn that was needed by the potion. They worked in silence, with Hermione working on the potion, and Harry fixing the small mistakes that she unknowingly does. Snape was very harsh with his grading when it came to Harry's potions, and he didn't want to get lower grades because of his unspoken spat with Hermione. As usual, Snape just sniffed at their potion and didn't say anything. That meant that it was practically flawless. By the time class was over, Harry just walked in the other way without saying a word to his former friend. Harry let out a grimace when Hermione ran after him, Harry. Harry. The last potter stopped and turned, yes. Can we talk for a minute? The Greyfinder asked. Seeing no harm in it, he nodded in acceptance, and the two of them entered an empty classroom. Harry took a look at Hermione, who was awkwardly fidgeting, what is it? The girl flinched slightly and responded, are we okay? I'm afraid I don't understand what you're talking about, Harry responded. Oh, come on Harry. You barely said anything to me during our potion class, the bushy-haired girl protested. Harry though snorted, you're seriously asking this? You practically ignore me ever since Halloween, and just because I don't talk to you during class, you think that something is wrong. The girl's face paled, oh Harry, I'm so sorry. I was just caught up with Neville and Ron that I didn't really make time for you. Hermione, let's be frank. You didn't just forget to make time for me, you forgot entirely about me, Harry said. I didn't forget about you. It's just. It was nice to be appreciated in my house is all. I never felt at home in the Greyfinder common room, but now people are nice to me. They talk to me, they ask for my help, the Greyfinder tried to explain. And that made it all right to completely forget about your actual first friend. Harry replied with some bite in his voice. You're the one who insisted that our friendship be secret, Hermione bit back, you can't just expect me to disappear every day from everyone just to hang out with you. That's a fair point. But it's not enough to just outright ignore me. And with Longbottom and Weasley of all people. What's wrong with Neville and Ron? Hermione answered while gritting her teeth. Ron Weasley is a lazy boy that is jealous of everyone around him and channeled this jealousy into putting people down. Neville Longbottom is an arrogant brat who thinks the entire world revolves around him because of some fluke that happened to him when he was still in diapers. I wouldn't call them to be good friend material. Harry said. It wasn't some fluke, he killed you know who, for Merlin's sake. And you don't get to judge who my friends are, the girl answered back. However, Harry wasn't done there, weren't they the people who you complained about because they kept pranking and bullying you? calling you names because they were jealous of how much you are better than them in your classes. They saved my life, Harry. And you wouldn't have needed saving from the troll if they hadn't insulted you, to begin with. Hermione stubbornly didn't back down, and Harry decided to just press on. He sighed in exasperation, look, Hermione. I know that Longbottom and Weasley don't like me, and I don't care. I never did anything to them, while they tried to attack me multiple times. 
Being friend with me and them is not going to work out, and you know it. I personally don't care about you being friends with them, but they won't feel the same. You can't live a double life like that Hermione. One day they will find out about it, and you can guess how they will react. You will have to choose between us. No, you have already chosen. You just didn't want to make it final. You're smart enough to understand what's going on, you're just afraid that your new friends would drop you, and you're keeping me as a safety net. Harry looked Hermione directly into her eyes and continued, Well, I'm not anyone's safety net. I was able to maintain friendships with my housemates and you, without anyone taking priority over me. You could have done the same if you had chosen anyone but Longbottom and Weasley, but you did, and from the look of it, you will not budge. So, what's the answer, Hermione? Who are you picking? Me or them? Hermione looked down and didn't answer, and Harry understood exactly what her answer was. After all, it was what he expected, the fact that you are looking like that means that you are choosing them. And that means that we're done, you and I. I don't have the energy to hate people too much, so from now on, we're strangers. Granger and Potter. Harry. Hermione, no, Granger, opened her mouth to argue back but closed her eyes. The Potter scion just shook his head, you know. It's good that we stopped being friends this early. Someone who would have dropped me at a moment's notice for something they think is better is not someone I want as a friend in the first place. You could have tried, Hermione, but you took the coward's way out. Harry just turned to leave. He almost wanted to reveal to the girl that he was the one who had saved her from the troll. But he knew that this would shatter her entirely. She was a conflicted girl, but she was already practically crying, and he didn't need to be cruel just to hurt her more. In a way, Harry still cared for her to not hurt her unnecessarily. So, he just left, ignoring the sobs of the girl in the room. He forced himself to not come back and comfort her. It would be the complete opposite of what he wanted. Although Harry thought back at the fight with the troll and noticed how similar the aftermath was to the books. Hermione had become friends with the boy who lived in Ron Weasley, and the Golden Trio was born. They would start going through one daring adventure after another, each leading to Voldemort somehow. Was it fate? Was Hermione Granger always meant to help the boy who lived survive his trials? Or was there someone else arranging for it? Harry could see Dumbledore pulling a few strings to give the child of the prophecy a loyal witch with a lot of potential that would push him to not stagnate in his magical education. But this was too late to ponder on some primordial force pushing the world towards a certain direction. Or even a headmaster with the mental capabilities and deviousness of James Moriarty. With magic very little was impossible, but Harry was still a beginner in understanding it. As for Hermione, he didn't really hate her. Or even dislike her. She had made her choice, and Harry had other friends. He could respect that. But why were his eyes teary as he stood in front of the Slytherin common room entrance? Why did it hurt so much to see her practically admit that she liked Longbottom and Weasley more than she does him? He kept pondering that until he came to a realization. For all his maturity and intelligence, Harry still wasn't that experienced when it came to emotions. He was practically emotionally stunted in his past life, and in this one, he still had the emotional maturity of a child, even if he did his best to keep them controlled. Harry was a child, even with all the memories of his past life. He was still growing, learning his place in the world, and having lost a friend, when he had so few for years, did hurt. Harry felt as if some weight had come off his shoulder somewhat. He felt lighter when he finally accepted a part of himself. He always thought of himself as Harry the man, but never as Harry, the child. He was so consumed with learning magic that he had forgotten a part of himself. He was allowed to be hurt by what happened. He had given his trust to someone, something that he rarely did, and it was neglected. Damn right, he was right to be upset. With that realization out of the way, Harry simply wiped his tears, put on a fake smile and walked into the common room. He was immediately accosted by Blaze who wanted to challenge him in a game of chess. The Potter Scion rarely ever returned to the common room just after lessons, preferring to try out new spells or just stay in the library. The two boys were later joined by Daphne and Tracy and just hung out. Telling each other stories, or just playing games. They spent hours just enjoying each other's company, and the pain that Harry was feeling was numb by the end of the night. It was nice, remembering that even with Hermione gone, he wasn't alone. It was one of the happiest evenings he had ever experienced. And by the end of it, Harry realized that he had almost forgotten about his former friendship with Hermione. Chapter 37, 
Beaver's Contemplations. November 10, 1991, Hogwarts. Hermione Granger knew that she was smart. In primary school, she always had full marks. Except for physical education, of course, but that class didn't really count. The teachers loved her, appreciated her dedication to her studies, and showered her with praise. But there was always something missing. There was a hole in her heart, a desperation to connect with someone remotely close to her age, anyone would do, really. When she had gotten her Hogwarts letter, Hermione was excited with the prospect of learning actual magic, but also the possibility of making a friend. After all, that must have been the problem. She was a witch and so, she should have friends who are also wizards and witches. However, it wasn't to be. Hermione was just as isolated as she used to be in the muggle world. Her classmates made fun of her for being a bookworm and called her names like teacher's pet, and she hated it. Hogwarts was supposed to be a new start, not be more of the same but with magic being involved. She was barely resigned to a life of loneliness once more until that fateful day she met Harry Potter. He was a Slytherin boy from her year. Hermione didn't like him at first. And it wasn't because she was jealous, because she wasn't jealous, not at all. Okay, she might have been a little jealous. He was just too good at everything. He got every spell from the first time, he answered any question the professors asked him, and most of all, he had friends. The professors loved Harry Potter except for Snape that is, for some reason. It was odd that his head of house disliked him so much for no reason, but Professor Snape was rude to everyone. But what irked Hermione the most about him was the fact that he had friends. No one ever called him names or made fun of him. For Merlin's sake, he probably spent more time studying than Hermione and she was the one called a bookworm. The Muggleborn started to observe him, hoping to find out how he was able to persuade everyone to treat him better, and she got absolutely nothing. After a while, she just tried to speak to him, and that was when it clicked. Harry was a genuinely nice guy who did a lot of self-studies. He just randomly picked a subject and when he didn't understand anything, he just looked at a book on the subject. That made him far more knowledgeable than any first-year student had a right to be, but Hermione couldn't help but be impressed. It was surprising that she found herself to be friends with him. He was easy to talk to, about academics and everything, and he was also very knowledgeable of the Muggle world, which was weird for a scion of an old family like the Potters, but the Muggleborn didn't really care about it, because it made their conversation flow easier. He was her first friend and a real genius. Hermione was smart, she knew that. They both started learning magic at the same time, but Harry could learn something in a fraction of the time she needed to. It was humbling to see it happen in action. When Hermione wanted to learn a new charm, she thought that she would invite Harry as a bonding exercise. He learned the spell in two minutes when it took her hours to do it. He just looked at the book, read the instruction and tried the wand movements a couple of times, and just cast the spell. Harry Potter was the exact friend she needed. He was brilliant, understanding, kind, and had a strange sense of wisdom to him. He was strangely aloof and disinterested in many things one of which happened to be Quidditch but Hermione could excuse a few quirks in comparison to how wonderful he was. Harry always tried to help her even when she was being difficult which wasn't often, of course. He would have been her friend for life if it wasn't for a single thing. He was a Slytherin. Hermione knew that it was a bad thing to say, but Harry's house changed things. He didn't want anyone to know that they were friends, while she wanted to shout it to the world. Apparently, the upper years wouldn't like it if one of theirs was friends with a Muggleborn, which was very bigoted and opened Hermione's eyes to an ugly truth of the magical world. It wasn't perfect and injustices happened all the time, and she was in the repressed minority. Still, it was hard being alone for most of the day and only spending time with your only friend in a library or an empty classroom to avoid being seen, but it was better than having no friend at all. That was until Halloween happened. Hermione's memories of the event were all over the place considering how terrified she was. Neville and Ron insulted her, and she went to the bathroom and was attacked by a troll of all things. Neville and Ron did end up rescuing her, but Hermione could swear that she saw Harry in the middle of things, but it must have been a trick of her eyes. It was probably just wishful thinking that her friend would come to save her. Ron and Neville had come to her help so why didn't her friend? Did he forget about her? Did he abandon her because of the other Slytherin? She didn't know and it hurt. Lucky for her, Neville and Ron apologized for what they had said, and a friendship was formed. After all, there are experiences like surviving a deadly mountain troll which, when experienced with other people, will undoubtedly lead to close bonds. 
Hermione was so elated to finally have people to spend time with from her house and who she could hang out with all the time, that she kinda forgot about Harry. Oh, she's ashamed of it, but it was just unreal. Hermione never anticipated what Neville's friendship could bring. Her classmates paid attention to her when she spoke, they included her in their activities, and just spent time together. She didn't just have Neville's friendship but practically the respect of all her house. How could Harry compare to all of that? And so, she helped Ron and Neville in return. She focused every free moment she had to help them. They had given her so much, and she could pay them back by helping them in their studies. She wasn't as smart as Harry, nor did she have his prodigal talent in all things magic, but she was enough to get their grades to go up. And didn't Neville and Ron need her help more than Harry? Hermione always felt like a spectator whenever she hung around with him. She felt inadequate as if she didn't bring anything to their friendship, and it scared her that her only friend would one day see how useless she was to him and stop being friends. If she proved to Neville and Ron that she was useful, that she was necessary for them to pass, then they would never let her go. But her confrontation with Harry changed things too much. He wasn't supposed to be angry. He said some hurtful things and officially stopped being friends with her. It was then that she realized that their friendship meant something to Harry and that she hurt him, and replaced him for no reason. When he asked her to choose between him and her housemates, she wanted to choose him, she really did, but Neville needed her more. Her house needed her more. After all, she was a Greyfinder, and he was a Slytherin. It was never going to work out anyway. At least, that's what she kept telling herself all night. It was the morning after her fight with Harry. Or could it be called a breakup? Hermione had lost her first friend to her negligence, and she didn't know what to do about it. As she sat on the Quidditch pitch with the rest of her house, Hermione was subdued and not cheering on her friend who was making history. Neville was the youngest seeker in Hogwarts for at least a century, and she was proud of this achievement, but her conversation with Harry just occupied her mind. Was Hermione really that shallow? Replacing your friend with a more popular and richer boy seemed like a shallow thing to do. The Muggleborn had always prided herself on being a good person, but what she had done was anything but good. How is she supposed to fix this? Hermione winced as one of the Greyfinder chasers, Katie Bell, get trampled on by Marcus Flint again. It was a foul, but the girl was holding her ribs while wincing in pain. Quidditch really was a surprisingly violent sport. Foul! Screamed the Gryffindors like a single wizard, with a few others insulting Marcus Flint, his parentage, and whether his house was sleeping with trolls. Professor Hooch spoke angrily to Flint and then ordered a free shot at the goalposts for Gryffindor. Next to her, Dean Thomas was yelling, Send him off, ref. Red card. What are you talking about, Dean? Said Ron. Red card. Said Dean furiously. In football, you get shown the red card and you're out of the game. But this isn't football, Dean, Ron reminded him. The young Muggleborn grumbled about changing the rules and Hermione rolled her eyes. She decided to just pay attention to the game, hoping that it would distract her from the guilt she was feeling. As she barely finished this thought, Neville's broom started moving as if it had a mind of its own. The boy who lived looked like he was hanging on for dear life, as the broom violently tried to get him to fall off. Ron seemed to notice as well, what in Merlin's name is Neville doing? Is he trying out a new stunt or something? Suddenly Neville's broom was given a sharp jerk and the Greyfinder was swinging off it. He was now dangling from it holding on with only one hand. Was his broom damaged or something? This was definitely not a stunt. But it was unlikely that a few fowls could damage a Nimbus 2000 this quickly. They were known to be fairly durable brooms. Hermione had researched it when Neville's grandmother had sent him one as a present for becoming the Greyfinder Seeker. Maybe it was a curse? She had read that dark magic is very effective at overwhelming protective enchantments. Hermione took her binoculars and pointed it at the teacher's stand. Her gaze immediately went to Snape who was gazing at her classmate while murmuring an incantation without blinking. So, Snape was cursing Neville? She knew that the potions professor was no good but trying to kill a student in broad daylight? That was just insane. She murmured to herself, Snape is cursing Neville's broom. Ron shouted back, Snape is what? The redhead then calmed down but was still panicking, what should we do? Leave it to me. The Muggleborn responded. Before Ron could say another word, Hermione had disappeared. She fought her way across to the stand where Snape stood and raced along the row behind him. She didn't even stop to say sorry as she knocked Professor Quirrell headfirst into the row in front. Reaching Snape, 
she crouched down, pulled out her wand, and whispered a few, well-chosen words. Bright blue flames shot from her wand onto the hem of Snape's robes. It took perhaps thirty seconds for Snape to realize that he was on fire. A sudden yelp told her she had done her job. Her plan seemed to have succeeded, up in the air, Neville was suddenly able to clamber back onto his broom. Hermione slowly snuck back to her seat and gave Ron a cheeky grin. It didn't take long for Neville to almost swallow the golden snitch of all things, giving Greyfinder the victory. Hermione was happy with herself when the boy who lived landed on the ground, looking proud and relieved. She had saved her friends. Even if she lost Harry, she would make it up by making sure that Neville and Ron would be safe. Today was just a good first step in that direction. Un. I know some of you are frustrated with why I haven't really begun to change canon all that much. Well, I kinda wanted to keep things relatively stable for the most part. It was so that I could craft a good base to really start my story. Honestly, I needed the whole Golden Trio thing to happen. I'm kinda ahead in terms of chapters so I can say that I started to change things and that the path will start to diverge with that of canon in the next few chapters. The changes will start to pile up slowly with how this year will proceed until the ending. Second year, though, will be very different, and I'm kinda happy with what I planned so far. As for those who are frustrated about Neville catching the snitch since he's not a flying prodigy like Harry, well, you're right he's not a prodigy. He is not as talented as Harry. He was just an average child who practiced a lot of flying. He's at best as good as Malfoy is. Swallowing the snitch was a coincidence, and not done out of skill here, not that it was on purpose in canon, there's a part in a future chapter where that issue will be explored a bit. Chapter 38, Of Habits and Mischief November 10, 1991, Hogwarts The two boys were later joined by Daphne and Tracy and just hung out. Telling each other stories, or just playing games. They spent hours just enjoying each other's company, and the pain that Harry was feeling was numb by the end of the night. It was nice, remembering that even with Hermione gone, he wasn't alone. It was one of the happiest evenings he had ever experienced. And by the end of it, Harry realized that he had almost forgotten about his former friendship with Hermione. The following day, Harry was convinced to attend the Slytherin game with his friends. Well, it was more like he was dragged to the Quidditch Stadium by his friends. The match started off simply enough, if a little brutally. Harry still didn't see why half the population was obsessed with the sport, but he would admit that there was a little enjoyment in watching the chaos that was Quidditch. Oh, Harry still didn't find it to be half as interesting as a good book. He was half tempted to just whip one out and start reading, but Daphne seemed to have seen through him and one glare from her stopped him from trying anything. Still, all things considered, the game ended up turning into a mini-battle, with the Slytherin chasers being particularly brutal, but from what Harry could infer, it was normal enough for a quid-ditch match. Longbottom proved himself to be an adequate seeker, and a rough match to Higgs, the Slytherin seeker. He wasn't anything spectacular, but Wood's training seemed to be paying off. It was for the better, in Harry's opinion, the more time Longbottom spends training, the more tired he is during the rest of the day, and the less bothersome he becomes. Oh, he was definitely getting more arrogant by getting the position, but he had to prove to the whole school that he didn't get it solely due to Dumbledore's blatant favoritism. Still, like the stories, Longbottom's broom got cursed, by either Snape or Quirrell. Harry was pretty sure it was Quirrell since that was what happened in the stories, but this life wasn't a story, and he wasn't going to exclude someone just because he remembers a story from his past life that said so. Although Harry did stifle a chuckle when he saw Hermione actually set Snape's robes on fire. To think that the shy authority abiding bookworm could actually do something that could have gotten her expelled. She was a far cry from the shy girl that was his friend and that was a bitter pill to swallow. Hermione would have never broken the rules for him, not even once. Harry squashed the envy that spread through his heart. It would serve nothing. Hermione had chosen Neville. It was a shame, and Harry wasn't enthused about it, but it was better now that he wasn't extremely invested in their friendship. It hurt but it was manageable. It could have been worse, all things considered. Still, Neville ended up being catching the snitch by swallowing it, a veritable first in the history of Hogwarts, probably considering how unlikely it was. Still, the boy who lived survived an attempted murder, and he deserved some time off. It was odd how it happened in both the story and in this real life. Things should have gone differently, especially considering how impossible to accidentally swallow the snitch once was, let alone happen with two entirely different people, with different skills on a broom. Perhaps it was just fate. 
perhaps the ball was enchanted to grant Longbottom an edge. Harry could see Dumbledore doing something like that to make sure that Longbottom endeared himself to his housemates, and still have a spot on his team, no matter how mediocre his talent was on a broom. Perhaps it was also done to Canon Harry to get more confidence. Honestly, the Potter Scion didn't know, nor did he really care for that matter. That night, Harry chose not to return to the common room since everyone was practically in a bad mood and itching for a fight. Harry couldn't handle another time of Malfoy exclaiming to everyone about how much better he would have done if he was the Seeker instead of Higgs, and about the unfairness of Longbottom being in the Quidditch team when he's worse than him. Harry just couldn't do it. He was one comment away from just cursing the boy, or just strangling him physically. By all that is good and holy, whoever raised Draco Malfoy was an idiot. Thankfully, the blonde was utterly terrified of Harry after their last encounter. He could barely make eye contact with him without flinching. At least he stopped bothering Harry, that was what mattered in the end. And so, the Potter Scion, distanced himself from his housemates to do something he has been itching to do for months, going to the Forbidden Corridor on the third floor. Dumbledore had explicitly warned everyone from visiting. Of course, practically everyone ended up trying to find out why it was forbidden, and there were a few stories going around about a Cerberus being there. Yeah, things really didn't go according to Dumbledore's plan, or perhaps it went perfectly. He had to know that making something forbidden was a good way to get everyone curious enough to try to figure out why. There had to be more to it than that. The headmaster isn't an idiot and that meant that there was another dimension to the forbidden corridor. He could have just warded the corridor and not said anything. Only students that were fifth years or higher would have even detected a ward made by any competent wizard let alone Dumbledore. Or he could have provided a false reason like it being cursed or something and make people scared of it. No. He purposefully wanted everyone to be curious about it and be vague about the danger. Harry slowly walked towards the corridor. The castle was quiet and only his footsteps were the only sound reverberating throughout the corridor. When he finally reached the corridor, he sensed something odd, hey. The song is odd. There is a ward but it's not stopping me from entering. It's not really repulsive, just there, I guess. Probably detects something, but I can't hear a warning trigger. There was no harm in getting through all things considered. Dozens of students had done so, and they were fine. Harry steeled himself and took a step inside. Immediately, the ward flared, and its song intensified. It was looking for something in Harry, and afterwards, it just let him go through. The torches around the corridor started to light up and there was nothing there but another wooden locked door by the end of it. Harry slowly walked, trying to hear any other song. There was only one by the end of the door but it was far more complex than the previous one. Harry didn't really get to study wards all that much, the same reason he didn't really get to study alchemy. They needed a foundation in runes that he lacked, and for all his cleverness and insight in magic, runes was a very time-intensive field to learn. It would take months to become adequate in a single runic language, let alone the countless ones that are required to specialize in these fields. He was going to do it eventually, but Harry had too much fun discovering wand magic to just focus on learning what was basically a new language from scratch. Oh, Harry knew enough to understand the basics of warding, but he didn't really have enough time to manipulate them using his magical hearing. Still, Harry was adamant about seeing the infamous Cerberus at the very least. He pointed his wand at the door and muttered, Alohomora. The door clicked and opened up, and the ward's song flared in intensity. Harry slowly walked forwards, and he finally understood what the ward was doing. It had two distinct songs, one that felt protective, and another that was slowly changing. It was becoming more familiar, Harry could tell it was at the back of his mind. Oh, it was his song. The ward was analyzing his magic. What a wonderful and curious piece of magic. Harry, of course, chose to trick it, and slightly change his song to resemble Blaze's. It was probably a bad thing to do, but he was most familiar with it, having hung out with him the most out of his friends. His technique was more of an illusion than actually changing his magic. Because it was an illusion of a magical song superposing his own. It wasn't really something he had tried before, but it should have been theoretically possible. When it was done, the ward fully assimilated the false magical signature and settled down. It sent a copy of the fake signature to the first ward, which also flared. Harry then slowly walked past the door and was face to face with the giant three-headed dog. It was far more intimidating than he imagined. It was bigger than the troll and was scowling at him. Cerberus were magical dogs that have the best magical resistance in a magical creature. It was literally impervious to magic. You couldn't put a spell on it, 
be it protective or attacking. They were also one of the few creatures that are immune to the killing curse, but that protection didn't hold into their fur. To defeat a Cerberus, you had to do it physically, which wasn't really most wizards' strong point. It was a fantastic beast to use to protect an object. Practically no one would have been able to get past it, all things considered, and it did make sense why Dumbledore would let it attack it. Harry slowly walked towards the rising dog and spoke up, Don't worry, I'm not trying to get past you. I just wanted to see you. Immediately the three heads stopped and focused on Harry. So, they understood human speech, I have heard a lot about your kind and when I knew that you were in the castle, I was just curious. Harry wasn't even lying, he could hear the wards on the trap door, and they were extremely complex and very loud, which meant that it was very powerful, and far above anything he could deal with. He only came here because a Cerberus was a rare creature, and it was intelligent enough that Harry wanted to hear its magic. I have to say, you are magnificent, Harry muttered. That was true. Harry stopped and ignored all of the ward's noise and just listened to the Cerberus. It was, by far, the most complex symphony he had ever heard. It had so many layers and deepness. It was the most magical thing he had heard so far. There was loyalty, playfulness, and nobility involved. And then that changed with a feeling of familiarity and for the lack of a better term, souls. It was then that he realized what was happening, you're not a being of flesh and blood, are you? The giant hound's three heads sniffed in amusement and Harry knew that he was right. The Cerberus wasn't some average magical creature. It was deeper than that. It was made of magic, mixed in with a few other things, but fundamentally it was a being of energy. No wonder magic couldn't hurt it. Harry still didn't really understand the killing curse, but if it was made of magic, it technically couldn't kill a Cerberus. Yet, the beast was just so oddly familiar, and Harry knew that he had just scratched the surface. However, the more he listened, the more his magical crest started to burn in his chest. It was a slow prickle that slowly turned into what felt like someone putting a torch to his chest. Harry yelped and stopped actively listening to the Cerberus. He gasped as he let go, and one of the heads pushed him playfully out of the door. Oh, so it was playfully asking him to leave. Isn't that kind? Harry just grinned in response, I'll be back. The dog growled and the door closed by itself, and Harry heard the distinct click signifying that the door was locked. He tried to open it but felt the ward getting stronger and stopping him from doing it. Shaking his head, he turned with a small smile on his face and left the corridor. He noticed that the ward on the door was now pushing him to not notice it. Harry removed the illusion of his magical song, and the ward stopped working. Oh, so it saved the magical signature of whoever enters and only works after the student sees the Cerberus once, denying them access. If that wasn't a red flag that Dumbledore was planning something, Harry didn't know what would be. Still, Harry slowly walked to his common room, with his head filled with questions. What was the Cerberus, really, how was it born, and if it was made of magic? And why did his magical crest burn when he looked deeply into it? Harry went to bed and dreamed of giant three-headed dogs. Chapter 39, A Snowy First Year December 20, 1991, Hogwarts Still, Harry slowly walked to his common room, with his head filled with questions. What was the Cerberus, really, how was it born, and if it was made of magic? And why did his magical crest burn when he looked deeply into it? Harry went to bed and dreamed of giant three-headed dogs. The term passed quickly after the infamous Quidditch game. It was odd. Harry's first two months at Hogwarts were exciting, with one crisis after another. From the excitement of attending magic school to making new friends, losing a friend, experimenting with magic in general and fighting a fucking toll, Harry's initial impression of Hogwarts was that it was a place of excitement and adventure. Alas, this wasn't to be. After the Quidditch game between Greyfinder and Slytherin, things started to stabilize, and Harry found himself having a daily routine that barely deviated. He woke up early, every morning, to take his ritual bath. The treatment was working. His magic had adapted to the change, and after two months, Harry barely needed a bath every couple of weeks. Harry's capacity to channel magic was increased, and the Potter Scion found himself relearning his old spells to adjust the power output. After almost blasting a wall with a basic cast, Harry did learn that he had to hone his control over his magic, which took a lot of time. Every morning, if he didn't need a ritual bath, he would simply train his control even further. Afterwards, he would go to class, study to maintain his grades, and then go to lunch with his friends. After classes, he would go to the library to self-study. 
he had bit the bullet and chose to start learning runes. It was a tiresome and boring endeavor, but it was the bottleneck in his magical education. Apparently, it was required for most students to learn two runic languages to start working on alchemy, warding, and enchanting. Harry had chosen Elder Futhark and Norse runes, which had the most potential to be used immediately. He was tempted to learn hieroglyphics because of its involvement in impressive wards on their tombs, but there wasn't really any other use for them, and considering how complicated they were, it just wasn't worth the effort as his introductory runic language. Aztec runes were still being experimented on, which made them unpredictable, so Harry chose to stay with the basics for now. Runes, by definition, were languages that were used to cast magic. Harry couldn't really find out why those symbols had power and there was practically no book about their creation. It was probably something to do with the fact that magic remembers. So, thousands of years back, someone used these symbols in some kind of magical act that made magic itself remember them, which was why they had power. It was the most common hypothesis, but there was no sign of proof of it so far. Currently, Harry was still learning Elder Futhark. It turned out that just learning the symbols wasn't enough. Oh, don't get him wrong, it was quick to get started as a beginner, but the moment you try to put a sentence together, it quickly becomes very difficult to manage. Honestly, you could get a rough idea when reading a runic text if you understood the concepts behind every letter, but writing something new was very complicated. Harry could see why mastering these languages could take years, but he was determined to continue. He had even practiced every day about writing them, even if it was mind-numbingly boring, but he was progressing along very quickly. Soon, he would be able to at least understand the alchemy texts, even if wouldn't really try to use any of the information. Still, Harry relished the challenge and did his best to learn what he could without a professor. In the evening, Harry would just hang out with his friends. It was nice to just distress every day with the common banalities of games and drama. As for his classes, McGonagall was as severe as ever, Flitwick was as whimsical as he used to be, and Snape was as much of an ass as he was during the beginning of the term. Quirrell kept jumping at every sudden movement, Sprout kept trying to mother them all, and the assistant professors kept being useless. Days turned into weeks, which turned into months, until suddenly, Christmas was coming. Harry barely noticed it until one morning in mid-December, he woke up to find Hogwarts covered in several feet of snow and the lake was frozen solid. Of course, everyone was excited to go home for the holidays, and Harry was probably going to be the only Slytherin staying at Hogwarts. Still, it wasn't that big of a deal, all things considered, Harry was comfortable with his own company, but he was going to miss his friends after a while. The day started with the Weasley twins deciding to hex snowballs to hit the back of Quirrell's turban. If he really had Voldemort's face on the back of his head, then this had to be the single most amusing prank those two had ever done. At the image of the mighty Dark Lord being accosted with snowballs, Harry burst into hysterical laughter, to the confusion of his friends. As expected, his good mood worsened soon after because of the blonde ponce. The Malfoy scion seemed to revel at holding something on Harry. The boy was very subdued for a few weeks following their confrontation after the crest unlocking, but he returned to send spiteful comments trying to badmouth Harry to everyone around him. He was probably trying to be discreet but it was just ridiculous. The funny thing was that the blonde quickly folded the moment Harry so much as looked at him. Honestly, if someone else was in Harry's place and lacked his patience with the blonde, the boy would have ended up hexed into oblivion months ago. Still, it was a large upgrade since he had stopped trying to have a direct confrontation with Harry. He was cowed, even if he was still an ass. He was annoying but at least Harry could ignore him now. However, it wasn't just him that was quickly getting annoyed by the arrogant boy. After the quid-ditch match, the Malfoy scion reached new levels of insufferable and unpleasantness, where he kept provoking every Greyfinder in his sight. Even the other Slytherins kept getting annoyed at the loss of points and it was probably his father's influence that stopped any fourth or sixth year from hexing him for the risk of losing the house cup. As expected, as Harry was saying goodbye to his friends, Draco had to ruin it by loudly proclaiming, I do feel sorry for all those people who have to stay at Hogwarts for Christmas because they're not wanted at home. Harry didn't show it, but that comment did sting a bit. Harry disliked the idea of being alone, not in the literal sense, but having no one that would comfort him when things get hard, or that would help him when he needed to. It was something he ached for in both of his lives and he was left wanting in both of them. He really wanted to punch the boy in the face for his comment. Instead, he just smiled, raised an eyebrow, and continued his conversation with Daphne about her plans for the holidays. Apparently, 
the green grasses were going to France for Christmas and had invited Tracy's family as well. Blaze was going back to Italy to spend time with his deceased father's family. It was some kind of tradition all things considered. Harry did envy them a bit, but Hogwarts was more than magical enough to compensate for some trip abroad, and so, he smiled as Daphne was grinning in excitement about her future trip, I'm so looking forward to visiting La Place Cachy, it's the French alternative to Diagon Alley. Harry snorted, yeah, the hidden place. It's not exactly an original name, is it? You speak French. Daphne and Tracy exclaimed at once. The Potter Scion simply shrugged, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. I speak English, French, Spanish, German, and Latin. They were all gaping at him, and he rolled his eyes, I got bored when I was younger, all right. They all kept grumbling about unfair geniuses, but Blaze interjected, what about Italian? I guess I could learn it in the summer. I'm focused on runes right now, and it's a bad idea to try learning two languages at once. I'm almost done with the basics of Elder Futhark, and I'm planning on learning Norse in the second semester. That didn't stop them from grumbling for some reason. Still, for all the chilly weather, a few warming charms did the trick to be comfortable. By the time they arrived towards the corridor, they witnessed Weasley punch Malfoy in the face. The pawns probably deserved it, but as usual, Snape came prowling and punished the Golden Trio. Speaking of them, they started showing up at the library a lot, curiously in the recent history section. If things went the same as the stories, they were trying to figure out who Nicholas Flamel was. Harry snorted. Considering his copied book in Alchemy held a pretty thorough biography about the man, Harry knew that they were really looking in the wrong section. Flamel hasn't done anything history-worthy at least as far as the rest of the world knows for at least 200 years. When Harry entered the Great Hall, he almost gasped in amazement. The hall looked spectacular. Festoons of holly and mistletoe hung all around the walls, and no less than twelve towering Christmas trees stood around the room, some sparkling with tiny icicles, some glittering with hundreds of candles. Harry and his friends took a seat on the Slytherin table, and Daphne asked, So, what are you going to do while you're staying here? The Potter Scion shrugged, I guess I'll explore the castle, and practice some magic. So, nothing out of the ordinary then, Tracy interjected. Very funny, Tracy. But without classes, I should have more free time to finish up with my runic studies, and finally go back to focusing on wand magic. The conversation flowed from there until it was time for them to leave. Harry accompanied them to the Hogwarts Express, and returned to the empty common room, feeling oddly empty. Here was this magnificent castle that he could explore to his heart's content, and yet, he was oddly lonely. Practically all of the Slytherins, apart for a dozen upper years, returned home for the holidays. In his year, oddly the Weasleys were the only ones remaining because apparently, their parents decided to visit their son in Romania for Christmas. Harry had to say that for a family that couldn't afford to give their son a wand of his own for his magical education, they were really wasting more gold than needed for an entire trip instead of inviting their son home. Harry shook his head at the thought of the Weasleys and simply chose to wander randomly in the castle. Things would have been a lot simpler if he had the Marauder's Map. He didn't even know if such an artifact existed in the first place. The Potter Scion realized that he knew practically nothing about his parents. Were the Marauders even a thing? The only person who would speak about his parents objectively would probably be McGonagall. But Harry had little to no contact with the Transfiguration Mistress outside of class, and he didn't know how to broach the topic. It was probably easier to just sneak into Filch's office and see their records. Kind woman or not, that which was very intimidating. All things considered, Harry just let himself wander off into the castle, something that he never really did before. He was always running from one place to another, trying to maintain his friendships and try to learn a certain spell. It was nice to just let go. Oddly enough, Harry found himself in front of an open room near the library. He felt oddly compelled to just walk there and look at it properly. The Potter Scion's eyes widened when he entered it. Inside was a very large mirror, probably very old, with some kind of golden frame. It had an inscription carved around the top, Ariststra Eruoid Ube Kafruoid on Wosi. Well, that was an unexpected surprise. Chapter 40, Mirror of Desire December 20, 1991, Hogwarts Oddly enough, Harry found himself in front of an open room near the library. He felt oddly compelled to just walk there and look at it properly. The Potter Scion's eyes widened when he entered it. Inside was a very large mirror, probably very old, with some kind of golden frame. 
It had an inscription carved around the top, Ariststra Eroid Ube Kafruoid on Wosi. Well, that was an unexpected surprise. Harry glanced at the infamous mirror of Arist with trepidation. He had tried researching the mirror in the library and found absolutely nothing. To be fair, the Potter Scion didn't exactly know when the mirror was created or how it was created, only that it was a mirror that showed people what they truly desired. That description was too vague, and Harry had researched the most well-known magical mirrors but found no mention of the mirror of Arist. Now that it was in front of him, he started using his arcane hearing yet, he was going to call it that now, it's a lot cooler than magical hearing. Harry did his best to deactivate this skill ever since he was in the castle unless he actively needed it. The castle was just too magical, and he kept getting headaches after a while. Especially when it somewhat evolved after the crest activation ritual. There was always an extra dimension to every melody, Harry theorized that it was the emotions of the caster, but he wasn't sure, only that really overwhelming in high doses. Anyway, the moment Harry activated his arcane hearing, the mirror started to sing. It was by far the weirdest artifact he had ever analyzed, definitely the most complex. Oh, Harry could tell the remnants of some kind of space manipulation which he became familiar with by analyzing his expanded backpack. Oh, it was far more impressive than the backpack, but the rhythm, the melody for the lack of a better term was similar. There were the standard curse-repelling enchantments, and protection charms, that's not to mention the weird runes that Harry didn't understand. There was a sense of judgment, of possible punishment depending on that judgment. It was the closest thing he could compare to a magical art piece. Harry oddly wondered if he could somehow transcribe the melody into actual music. He was already pretty good with the piano and violin and putting magic in music form could help him make a killing. Back to the mirror, there was a single piece of magic that just felt alien yet familiar. Harry supposes that it had something to do with the heart's desire part of the inscription. Harry could feel his raven crest heating up slightly. He really needed to figure out how his crest worked. Not a single one of his classmates mentioned their crests doing anything. It was apparently supposed to show itself after their 13 birthdays, and yet Harry's crest kept burning in certain situations. So far, Harry did his best to not look directly into the mirror. Oh, for all its beauty, the artifact was very dangerous, at least it would be if someone was found wanting while looking at it. Still, Harry decided that he wouldn't return to see the mirror again no matter what he saw. In many ways, he was still confused about his ambition, about his future. Harry wanted to make his mark on the world, but other than just learning magic, he didn't know what his heart's desire was. Perhaps it would let him know to learn more about himself than any other. He decided to finally take a glimpse at the mirror, unable to restrain his curiosity and stood in front of the mirror while murmuring, My heart's desire, hey? I wonder. Harry opened his eyes and gasped at the sight that awaited him. It was an older version of himself that was giving Harry a confident smirk. His green eyes were glowing, thrumming with power, but that only seemed to be a minor aspect of the desire. No, the reason Harry gasped in shock was the two people that were standing next to him. There was a woman with constantly changing features, who was looking at his mirror self with love and warmth in her eyes. There was also the young girl who was looking at him with admiration. She had messy black hair and green eyes that reminded him eerily of his own. He knew deep in his heart that this girl was his daughter, which made the older woman his wife. Harry looked at her finger and saw a beautiful wedding ring. His mirror self was wearing a ring of his own as well. Behind them was a large house with a garden. It wasn't quite large enough to be called a mansion, but it was larger than any villa he had ever seen. It looked luxurious yet cozy, a true home. Behind it was a beautiful beach with sand as white as snow, and the water was as beautiful as sapphires. So for all his ambition and fascination with his magic, all he wanted deep down was to have a family, a home, and live comfortably while relishing in their love. In his previous life, he never experienced such love. Oh, he loved his parents even through all their distance, and he loved his brother deeply, but it was a love based on responsibility and familial relations. He never had someone to support him, someone he could complain to when he was frustrated, someone that would love him in return. A true partner. Harold had died without anyone to mourn him. He died forgotten. He was nothing. Oh, he wanted to make his mark in the world, to be remembered by the history books, to have something to give his life meaning. He was an empty man, before, devoid of love, devoid of life. A family, a legacy was a way to achieve his dream in a way. True happiness, that's what he could see on his mirror version's face. He was fulfilled, he was happy, he was content. 
It was so alien on his face, but it looked so right. Harry didn't care about the power that the man was showing off. The man was thrumming with magic, with power, but it was his smile, and the way he looked at his daughter, at his family, that really took his breath away. The potter Sion noticed that his eyes were tearing up, and let out a bitter chuckle, love. My heart's desire is love. Having a loving wife and child. To find true happiness in an imperfect world. What a mockery of a Slytherin I turned out to be. Slytherin was the house of the cunning and ambitious and Harry just found out that it was his ambition was to settle down with a loving wife and have a child to raise and spoil. What a joke. Oh, but I find that love is by far grander of a goal and one with far more rewards, than any other pursuit, an aged voice responded behind him. Harry stiffened and turned with his wand raised. He was so distracted by the loud symphony of the mirror that he didn't notice the one hiding behind him. He relaxed slightly and lowered his wand when he saw the headmaster. Harry was talented, yes, but he didn't even come close to Dumbledore's level. If the man wanted to do something to him, he would have done it already. I didn't see you, sir, Harry remarked. Because I did not want you to see me, young Harry. Now, tell me, you, like hundreds before you, have discovered the delights of the Mirror of Air East. What do you think of it? Harry shrugged, I think it's a very dangerous artifact. And you would be right. Countless men have wasted away before this mirror, entranced by what they have seen, or been driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. Do you know of its origin? The headmaster asked. I can't say that I do, Harry responded. Long ago, before the statute of secrecy was put in place, a muggle lord had become quite wealthy after a few trade deals. And yet, his staff and subjects were living in very poor conditions, for the lord did not wish to part with any of his wealth. Seeing enemies everywhere, he foolishly commissioned a fae to create the ultimate vault, one that cannot be accessed by anyone. He planned on tricking the fairy after the vault was built by locking his gold inside and refusing to pay her. Seeing the man's greed and his mistreatment of those he deemed to be below him, they decided to add some creating punishment. They created this mirror to act as a gateway for all who wish to put their riches, and yet they could only take it out if they do not truly desire it. When the fae gave the lord the mirror, he put all of his wealth inside and refused to pay. The fairy then left with an odd smile on its face and relished while watching the man see his wealth and yet not be able to take a single coin. The man died on hunger and thirst, unwilling to let go of the mirror that held what he desired the most. Harry raised an eyebrow at the story. He didn't expect that. He didn't even know that the fae were real. He just commented, a fascinating story. How ironic for a man to be killed by what he desired the most. Quite. Very few people could stand in front of this mirror and see love instead of power and wealth. It is usually those who have lost love that treasure it the most, Dumbledore remarked. You can never lose what you never had. You can never take it for granted when you see people have it and yet dismiss it so casually. I hope I don't fall into the same trap they do. To be perfectly honest, I half expected you to see your parents in the mirror, the headmaster remarked. Nothing can bring back the dead. It would be foolish for my whole being to be centered around people I will never meet. It's better to let the dead have their rest and focus on the living. You really are wiser beyond your years, Harry Potter, the headmaster remarked, I only wish to offer you the piece of advice to not seek the mirror once more, but I think you can understand its dangers more than anyone your age should. They stayed in each other's presence for a good minute before Harry spoke up, Professor may I ask a question? You just did, young Harry but I suppose one more question wouldn't be too much of a bother, answered the old man with mirth in his eyes. Harry shrugged, do you know what happened to my father's cloak, sir? The man stiffened at the action and asked, what makes you think that I have any idea about what happened? Well, I was looking for anything that might have survived the fire and this cloak stood out, since from what I understand it survived far worse attacks before. It's a family heirloom, you see. I old the ministry and they said that anything regarding my inheritance was handled by you, headmaster, at least according to my father's will that is. It had to do with you being the witness to the will or something. I'm not really sure, most of it went a little over my head. Which is why I am asking if you ever found out what happened to it. The headmaster relaxed, I'm afraid not, young Harry. It's truly possible that it was destroyed by the fire. After all, it had devastated an entire village of wizards and muggles. It's very probable that an artifact, no matter how ancient or well protected, could be destroyed. Harry slumped, well, that's a shame, really. Suddenly, Harry's family crest burned slightly, 
and the potter Sion obtained the first bit of information from it. He suppressed a grin and continued, and yet, it still could be stolen. Perhaps it would be better to just activate the curse, just in case. Again, the headmaster stumbled, is the cloak cursed, young Harry? The potter Sion shrugged, well, it's sort of a safeguard. I found out about it from a small journal from my grandfather in Gringotts. The artifact is bound to the Potter family and it's very well protected, especially since it's nothing more than a long-lived invisibility cloak. But I guess it's a family heirloom of some sort. So, yeah, while the cloak would barely work for anyone without Potter blood, there's a small activation curse that can be used in case it's stolen. It emits some kind of locator signal, but even if it's returned the curse persists if the holder is not of Potter blood. I'm not sure of the specifics, but I do know that the cloak was stolen a few centuries back by the Codrington family, and well, the entire family, branches and all, were gone in a single generation, and the cloak was back in the possession of the Potter family. Harry wasn't even lying. The crest really had shown him the fate of the Codrington family, as well as the ritual to activate the curse on the cloak. The man looked slightly worried, my boy, there's no reason to take such drastic measures. I know, the cloak is probably just destroyed but this is just me making sure that no one stole it. If someone had it, they would have arranged for a meeting when I came to Hogwarts. Honestly, I'm probably just going to activate it on New Year's Eve. I still need a few materials to activate the curse but I already owl ordered them. Harry pretended to look at his watch, oh, look at the time. It's almost curfew and I don't want to get detention. It was nice speaking with you, Headmaster, and thank you for the story. Don't worry, I won't look for the mirror again but you really should hide it better. The potter Sion turned and left the room doing his best to not burst into laughter. When he was finally in the comfort of his common room, Harry broke down and laughed harder than he ever had before at Dumbledore's panicked expression when he talked about the cloak's curse. Chapter 41, A Magical Christmas December 25, 1991, Hogwarts The potter Sion turned and left the room doing his best to not burst into laughter. When he was finally in the comfort of his common room, Harry broke down and laughed harder than he ever had before at Dumbledore's panicked expression when he talked about the cloak's curse. On Christmas Day, Harry woke up smiling at the silence that met him. For all he had missed his friends, sleeping in an empty dormitory, especially without Crab and Goyle's constant snoring, was a very good feeling. Like he did every morning, Harry took a warm shower, changed his clothes and prepared to leave the dormitories, ready to get some breakfast. It wasn't until he reached the common room that he realized that it was Christmas, or Yule as the traditionalists like to call it. Harry noticed that the Christmas tree that was installed by the beginning of December, had a small pile of presents underneath it. Hey, so it was Christmas already? Time really does go fast when you're having fun. Harry looked around to see if any of the piles belonged to him, and yes, there was a small pile on the left with his name on it. Harry smiled before making his way to unwrap them. The pile was by far the smallest in the bunch, but this was his first time getting a Christmas present in this life, and he was excited to see what his friends got him. The idea was so foreign that he had forgotten that Christmas was even a thing. Harry had to say that he was surprised with the concept of exchanging gifts was still done in Yule. It was a muggle tradition, not a wizarding one. There were rituals involved in Yule, of course, but they weren't as important as Samhain. Harry wasn't invited to any of them which wasn't really a surprise since there were barely any students in the house. Still, receiving gifts was more than enough for him to be happy. He had almost forgotten about the holiday until he heard Weasley say some comment about Slytherins not deserving Christmas gifts or something. Harry didn't even care about the offensive comment but widened his eyes when he realized that he almost forgot to shop for his friends. Lucky for him, owl orders were a thing, and Hedwig ended up having quite the workout for a weekend, going from one shop to another hoping to find any suitable presents for his friends. Shops advertised their products in magazines, with the prices. Which Weekly had an entire section just for beauty products, but there were a few magazines for Quidditch and other interests. Marketing in the wizarding world really was lacking all things considered. You needed to constantly market your products to get any owl orders, and you needed to be selective with what you wanted to buy. Often, the shop will end up sending a letter back to you to deal with it. It was quite time-consuming but aside from opening a very eye-catching shop in Diagon Alley, it was the only way to get new customers. Harry didn't want to go too far with the presents. Harry decided to just be basic and send a new pair of Quidditch Chaser gloves to Tracy since she expressed her enthusiasm in joining the team the following year. For Blaze, 
Harry had found a small shop that made animated engravings of any designs. Harry simply asked for a silver cloak pin shaped like an eagle's head. It cost a pretty penny, but Harry was rich now, and he was allowed to splurge a little. As for Daphne, Harry contacted a herbologist that specialized in breeding miniature magical plants. The potter Sion was able to purchase an enchanted bonsai tree that also functioned as a lamp with a tap of a wand, releasing small floating lights that could illuminate an entire room. He really hoped that Daphne, whose love of herbology surpassed even Longbottom's, would like it. Harry picked up the first present, which happened to be a wizard's chess set from Blaze, with a note telling him to stop playing with his own set. Chess happened to be Blaze's favorite pastime, that is until Harry kept destroying him one game after another. He had to admit that Blaze wasn't that bad for an eleven-year-old, and Harry's experience in chess from his past life was an unfair advantage. Still, it seemed to motivate the Italian boy to improve himself, which was a plus in Harry's book. Smiling, the potter Sion put aside his new chess set which he knew was quite expensive and picked up Tracy's present which happened to be a large box of chocolate frogs. Harry smiled, knowing that she was practically buying for herself. Harry wasn't really fond of sweet food, and Tracy was probably planning on eating the chocolate herself when she comes back, knowing that Harry wouldn't touch them. Finally, Daphne's present happened to be a book and a fairly old one at that. Its title was Customs of Wizarding Nobility in Magical Britain after the Statute of Secrecy by Anthony Greengrass. It was a family tome that was practically priceless. Harry integrated himself into the magical world with the help of fiction books that were made there. Literature was a very good way of understanding how societies think, but those books were not written by members of former noble families, just struggling authors from normal families. Daphne must have noticed that Harry didn't really have the education of someone from an old pure-blood family and gave him a book to compensate for these gaps. Honestly, not a lot of people cared about these traditions and Harry didn't really notice anyone acting any differently or judging him. Still, it was a very thoughtful gift, especially considering how scandalous it is to give someone a family book. The letter cleared that up easily enough, where Daphne insisted that the book wasn't a gift, but that he would need to return it after the holidays. Still, with Harry's copy spell, it didn't really make an issue out of that stipulation. Harry was somewhat excited to see the contents of the book. Although Harry was surprised to see two more presents by the tree. He held up the one on the top which felt like a book. Harry was proven right when after unwrapping it, turned out to be a book on dueling. A letter fell out and Harry stiffened when he realized it was sent to him by Hermione. It said the following, I'm sorry, Harry, about what happened. I talked to my parents, and they told me how horribly I treated you. I know we'll probably be friends again, but I felt like I just needed to apologize properly. You mentioned that you were planning on joining the dueling club, and I thought that I would help you get a head start. Merry Christmas. Hermine J. Granger. Harry let out a bitter smile at the letter. It was too late. Hermione was friends with Neville and Weasley who saw him as an enemy because of his house. Still, some closure isn't a bad thing and while he was initially slightly hurt, Harry had moved on quickly enough after Hermione's betrayal, this was the final nail in the coffin that was any form of friendship or rivalry they might have had. The potter Sion didn't want to think about this further and chose to focus on the last gift. Above it was a small note with no name, your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time it was returned to you. Use it well. A very merry Christmas to you. Harry burst into laughter. Dumbledore really had taken the bait which was hilarious. Oh, Harry wasn't lying about the curse. There was a curse that could be activated with a certain ritual that would act like a locator spell and had the potential of killing off an entire bloodline. But Harry couldn't really activate it. The crest had shown him the ritual to do it, and he needed the crest itself to accept him fully because he would need the crest itself as an anchor to activate the curse. Harry didn't even lie once when he told Dumbledore about the curse, and if the man had used legilimency, he would have confirmed this. Harry was able to trick Dumbledore into sending him the cloak that the headmaster had tried to swindle. All that was left was to see if it was the real thing and not a cheap replacement. Back to the package, just to make sure, Harry decided to unwrap the present, which revealed a shining silverly piece of cloth. Harry knew immediately that this was his father's cloak. The potter Sion didn't dare touch it directly, fearing Dumbledore having spelled it somehow. He activated his arcane hearing to see if there were any spells or curses on his family heirloom and gasped at what he heard. There were obviously a couple of layers on the foundation of the piece of cloth, which was hidden somehow. Each layer was made by a different person, with different intentions. The first was cautious and distrustful. 
The charm's melodies reminded Harry of tracking charms slightly, with a slight tint of a trigger ward. It was obviously Dumbledore's work. It certainly sounded like his magic. Old, inflexible, with a tint of arrogance and pride in it. It was classical, orderly, and with a clear rhythm. Harry made sure to keep his arcane hearing activated after seeing the mirror of Ereast. He knew now that this was Dumbledore sizing him up. Harry was drawn by the classroom with the mirror, probably because of a compulsion charm. He didn't instinctively hear it because it wasn't exactly malicious in nature. The headmaster had unknowingly been able to bypass his own magical instincts without even trying, just because the man didn't actively wish him harm when casting the spell. Harry swore that he will now focus on the mind arts to prevent something like this from happening once more. He will also try to keep his arcane hearing up for as long as possible. He was quickly overwhelmed by the frankly absurd amount of magic in the castle, but he was going to live there for seven years, and ignoring his greatest strength was frankly absurd. Learning occlumency now became critically important. He had discreetly tried to see anything on the mind arts in the library but found nothing. It was probably in the restricted section. He'll either need to sneak into it, or maybe try to see if the Room of Requirements had anything to offer in that regard. Harry groaned, he was just finished with his Elder Futhark runes and planned a small break for the holidays to just relax, but Dumbledore had to make him learn the mind arts even sooner than he had planned. Back to his present, Harry pointed his wand at it and listened to the layer of magic that Dumbledore cast. He molded his magic to its inverse entirely and cast, finite. A white burst of magic impacted the cloak, and while nothing looked different from the outside, the entire layer of magic fractured and dissolved into nothing. Harry grinned to himself and looked at the second layer. It was infinitely more complex than Dumbledore's spells. Harry couldn't really make heads and tails of it, only that it wasn't cast with a wand, and that it was cast with protection in mind and restricted the cloak. Harry didn't even know how he could cast something like this, but his family crest burned providing him with the solution. Without really thinking about it, Harry used his wand to make a small cut on his hand and held it above the cloak. Drops of blood started to fall on the cloak and Harry spoke up, I, Harry James Potter, the last of the line of Ignotus Peveril, unbind this cloak. May it serve me and my descendants and frighten my enemies, let it remind all those who had forgotten the might of the Peveril family. With that done, and the seventh drop of blood touched the cloak, the layer of magic dissipated. Physically, the cloak transformed. It didn't look like a mere piece of cloth anymore but of some kind of flowing silverly liquid. Harry touched it and while he was able to grab it, it felt like he was holding a cool molten silver, not an invisibility cloak. The most surprising thing was that when Harry tried to activate his arcane hearing, he heard nothing from the cloak. Absolute silence. It was as if there was nothing there. Even normal objects had a spark of magic, no matter how small, but when the potter Sion looked at the artifact that his ancestors possessed, he couldn't help but wonder if this was the true power of a deathly hallow. Chapter 42, Cloak of Winter December 25, 1991, Hogwarts The most surprising thing was that when Harry tried to activate his arcane hearing, he heard nothing from the cloak. Absolute silence. It was as if there was nothing there. Even normal objects had a spark of magic, no matter how small, but when the potter Sion looked at the artifact that his ancestors possessed, he couldn't help but wonder if this was the true power of a deathly hallow. Harry couldn't help but wonder if theoretically, this cloak would make him invisible to magic in general, and not just to sight. The fact that the cloak was silent to his arcane hearing was proof of that. Attempting to test it, Harry grabbed one of his enchanted quills. He opened up his ability and heard it thrum faintly when he focused on it. The potter Sion then grabbed the cloak and put it over the quill and tried to sense it. He could feel absolutely nothing. It was as if there was nothing there, it was extremely disconcerting for Harry to put his hands up and grab something that for all his senses, shouldn't exist. He couldn't see it, he couldn't hear it, he couldn't sense it. It was as if anything underneath the cloak just stopped existing. Harry tested the phenomenon with different enchanted artifacts, and it always worked. There was only one thing remaining and that was putting on the cloak himself. When he put it around himself, it felt like it was a second skin, and everything around was still visible and Harry could still hear the object's magic using his arcane hearing. Did that mean that the cloak couldn't impede any casting from the inside? Harry shrugged and took out his wand while being under the cloak and used a basic cast to see if a spell could travel outside of it. Alas, the spell was washed away when it touched the interior of the cloak, and yet the chair that was touching the exterior of the cloak was broken. Harry hadn't even aimed at the chair. Curious about this phenomenon, 
Harry put some vases that he had gotten from one of the empty classrooms to practice some spells on, underneath the cloak and cast a stinging hex. The vase broke, but when he tried to do the same when there were clothes around the vase, it wasn't even touched, while the clothes were displaced by the spell. Oh, so the cloak directed the spells towards its surface. Touching the cloak would mean being affected by the spell as well. It wasn't a new effect. Harry did notice the same with regular clothes, but the cloak was far more durable than them, probably even indestructible. That meant that Harry wasn't impervious to magic attacks when he was under the cloak. It was why people could still be cursed even though the spells only hit their clothes and not them directly. But if they weren't directly touching the clothes, then they wouldn't be affected. Of course, it's far more complicated, where if you're touching something that's already touching the clothes, then you might be affected which is what happens when someone is wearing multiple layers of clothes. However, the spell will only travel a certain distance before dissipating, which usually depends on the material of the object touched, the magical output of the spell and the nature of the spell itself. Alas, it wasn't the time to focus on such an advanced subject of spell creation. Back to the cloak, it was such an amazing artifact, all things considered. Harry had decided to perform the final test, which was to try to sneak past the third floor corridor wards. One hour later, Harry found out that he was undetected. He was invisible to even the wards when he was underneath the cloak. He had spent so long experimenting with the cloak that it was almost dinner time. He hadn't even eaten anything since he woke up. The cloak provided him with an opportunity to sneak anywhere he wanted without anyone knowing about it. Still, it was almost dinner time, and Harry regretted not being able to have the cloak with him at all times. If only he could wear the cloak discreetly, he pondered. As soon as he finished this thought, the silver cloak morphed into a standard Slytherin cloak. Holy shit, it can shapeshift too? Harry put on the cloak and willed himself to be invisible. It didn't seem to work until he put on the hood while willing the cloak to activate. Harry's entire frame became invisible to everything around him. Well, at least he could use it at a moment's notice. Hearing his stomach growl, Harry decided to go down to the Great Hall for dinner. Harry had to admit that the hall looked like a marvel of Christmas. Festoons of holly and mistletoe hung all around the walls and no fewer than twelve towering Christmas trees stood around the room, some sparkling with tiny icicles, some glittering with hundreds of candles. Christmas decorations were everywhere on the four house tables. It was a very festive atmosphere. On those tables, a hundred fat, roast turkeys, mountains of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of cheap alatus, terrines of buttered peas, silver boats of thick, rich gravy and cranberry sauce and stacks of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. The Weasleys were already sitting at the Greyfinder table, pulling on magical Christmas crackers that exploded. At the high table, everyone seemed in a merry mood. Dumbledore was even wearing a flowered bonnet, and Flitwick had put on an elf hat. Harry almost burst into laughter when an obviously drunk Hagrid kissed Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who actually giggled and blushed, her top head lopsided. Harry sat down and ate like a man possessed. Yet, yeah, he really should have eaten something earlier. He was practically alone at the Slytherin table, so it wasn't as if there were other people that needed to eat. It was delicious, as always. The house elves really do go over and beyond during feasts. Harry would have called this a waste of food if it wasn't for preservation charms able to keep leftovers for months at a time. They were probably going to be eating leftovers from this feast until the end of the holidays. Still, Harry's meal just had to be ruined by Ron Weasley who walked towards Harry with a grin on his face. He was wearing a knitted maroon sweater with a big R on it. His mother had probably made it. The potter scion ignored the redhead and continued eating while reading his book. This went on for a good minute, and the redhead tried to get his attention by clearing his throat. Finally, the boy had enough and rudely closed down Harry's book. The young Slytherin looked up with a raised eyebrow, that was awfully rude, Ronald Weasley. The boy blushed at him using his full name before stiffening, well, you weren't paying attention to me. And why would I pay attention to you? Harry asked with a very dry tone. Because I was trying to talk to you, the redhead exclaimed loudly. Oh, I'm sorry, I was just so engrossed by my book. The curse breaker Dresden was just about to fight some giant crocodile in an ancient tomb, very exciting. You see. Weasley interrupted his little monologue, I don't want to know about your stupid book, Potter. Then why did you mention it, then? I didn't mention it, you did, the boy proclaimed. Harry simply shrugged, perhaps I did, and perhaps I didn't. We'll never know for sure. No, 
I actually know for sure because you're the one who talked about it. Then let's just agree to disagree, young Whitley, Harry responded. My name isn't Whitley. Ron shouted with his face as red as his hair. Harry was doing his best not to burst into laughter, it isn't. I thought your name was Ronald Whitley. No, it isn't. My name is Ron Weasley, the boy was practically foaming from the mouth. It's very nice to meet you, Ron Weasley. I'm Harry Potter. I hope we can get along, Harry responded. You know me, Potter, we don't get along, the redhead growled back. Harry just let out a shrug, that's a shame, you seem like a fine young man. Stop looking down on me. The Gryffindor shouted. How am I looking down on you, young man, Harry answered with a teasing tone. Stop it, just stop it. You're doing it again, the boy yelled. Harry was almost going to burst into laughter. It was so easy to revert to his past experience as a teacher in his old life, then perhaps you could tell me what you wanted to say to me. After all, you were the one who went all this way from his house table to mine just to speak. I did. The boy wondered while frowning, oh, that's right, I did. I was here to ask if you got any Christmas gifts. You certainly don't deserve any, the slimy snake that you are. The redhead was smiling victoriously as if he had won something. Harry rolled his eyes, well, I'm sorry to tell you, that in fact, I did receive gifts this Christmas. And for your information, snakes aren't really slimy. I've never touched one, but from what I read, they're quite smooth. And who would even get you gifts, the boy sneered back, maybe it was just your parents. Oh, wait, you don't have any. Harry suppressed the urge to punch the boy in the face. He went too far, and the Slytherin had no issue in retaliating. Instead of shouting and cursing the boy, Harry simply shook his head and put a sad expression on his face. Well, that was rather rude, Weasley. Here I am minding my own business and you throw my parents' death to my face for no reason. What a cruel thing to do. Perhaps you would have done well in Slytherin, Harry answered. Oddly enough, the boy paled, no, I wouldn't have. I'm a Gryffindor to the bone. Harry grinned at the reaction, oh, I think you would have. The hat did see it too, didn't he? All that ambition, to be respected, become more than your brothers. After all, one's a very talented curse breaker, one is already making waves in Romania as a dragon handler. Percy will obviously be rising in the ministry soon enough, and the twins will probably have their own joke shop by the time they graduate. They all have their talents, and their strengths. But you, you're just there, unremarkable, talentless, forgotten. You barely get a second-hand wand, which is stopping you from reaching your potential, while the others get new things. The forgotten Weasley, isn't that, right? The boy looked teary, no, I'm not. But you are. I can see it. You wanted to rise above it, not struggle with money anymore, to buy new things, and that the entire world would remember your name. The hat saw it, didn't he? He saw this ambition and almost sent you to the house you hated, but you pleaded to be with your family, to be with your idol, Neville Longbottom. Even now, you're barely more than the friend of the boy who lived, and that's all everyone will ever know you by. Maybe if you had chosen Slytherin, that wouldn't have been the case. Harry answered with a small smile on his face. The boy was shaken, and his eyes watered. Did Harry go too far? He did scratch at Weasley's insecurities, and somehow Harry knew how to dig in further. Alas, the redhead pulled out his wand and yelled out, Never. The potter scion ducked, letting the slug vomiting spell go over him. Of course, the staff ran towards the boy. Professor McGonagall ran towards the young Gryffindor with her wand raised and disarmed him, Mr. Weasley. In all my years as a professor, I have never seen such behavior, at Christmas of all days. Harry suppressed the grin as the redhead got over two weeks of punishment for starting a fight. But the Potter Scion didn't even care. After all, he was planning on sneaking into the restricted section using his new cloak. After all, he did need to get started learning the mind arts, and wouldn't that be a good place to start? Chapter 43, The Library Has Been Breached December 25, 1991 Hogwarts. Harry suppressed the grin as the redhead got over two weeks of punishment for starting a fight. But the Potter Scion didn't even care. After all, he was planning on sneaking into the restricted section using his new cloak. After all, he did need to get started learning the mind arts, and wouldn't that be a good place to start? Later that night, Harry crept out of his dormitory, down the stairs, 
across the common room, and went past the secret entrance. He moved up his way up the stairs, into the library. Finding himself in front of the locked entrance, Harry used his arcane hearing to get a feel of the magic inside the lock, to find the correct combination to temporarily disable the locking protection. After manipulating his magic to counteract the enchanted lock, he combined it with an unlocking charm and muttered, Alohomora. The library door unlocked itself. Satisfied with his casting, Harry put on his cloak and went inside to sneak past the library wards. They weren't anything special, really, since the library was technically public for all Hogwarts students and alumni, the books didn't really need to be hidden away. Oh, Harry wasn't under the illusion that, if someone actually tried to damage the books, much heavier wards wouldn't be activated. At least, Harry assumed they would, since if that wasn't the case then it would be a large security flaw, where a student might sneak into the library and burned it into the ground. The Hogwarts library was a huge asset to the school and provided a certain status to studying in this castle, even if the curriculum started getting restricted decades back. The library was pitch black and very eerie. Harry decided to use a Lumos Maxima to light the way. A ball of light appeared floating alongside the invisible student, guiding him towards the restricted section. It was right at the back of the library. It seemed separate from the rest of the library by a rope, but Harry could certainly hear the invisible wards stopping any intruder. They were very complex and very powerful, that's for sure. Without the cloak, Harry wouldn't even dream of trying to get past them. Stepping carefully over the rope that separated these books from the rest of the library, Harry suppressed the urge to laugh in glee. The cloak really was overpowered. It turned the protections of the most dangerous books in the castle into a simple magicless rope. Harry waved his hand to move the ball of light, allowing him to see the restricted section tomes properly. A few minutes later, the young Slytherin was slowly getting frustrated. It seemed like the restricted section lacked even the fundamental organization that the rest of the library had. Even the tome titles didn't tell him much. Their peeling, faded gold letters spelt words in languages Harry couldn't understand. Some had no title at all. One book had a dark stain on it that looked horribly like blood. The hairs on the back of Harry's neck prickled. Maybe he was imagining it, maybe not, but he thought a faint whispering was coming from the books, as though they knew someone was there who shouldn't be. Yeah, Harry was pretty unsettled by the damn place, but he was right to be. Harry remembers Tom Riddle's diary in the story and how it possessed anyone who wrote inside. Yeah, the Potter Scion was right to be wary of unknown books, especially when their melodies reeked of malice and bloodthirst. Seeing no point in just walking around endless books and decided to use a certain spell that he had found weeks ago. He waved the wand in a complicated manner and muttered, in Veniri Libros Verbus Mind Arts. A glowing beam of golden light was released from his wand and dispersed into countless smaller beams, each one connecting to a certain book. Harry smirked to himself. This was his modified spell of one that researchers used to find certain terms in a book, only on a much larger scale. It was a bitch to get down but Harry had practiced it in secret with his schoolbooks. The original spell was particularly helpful in potions when trying to find out about certain ingredients quickly. It was based on divination, weirdly enough. It didn't work on books protected against scrying, but people tended to neglect divination as a magical field. Harry still hasn't really tried to look into the magical field, but he was planning to in the future. If it wasn't nonsense, then it would be a very useful field to master. Still, it wasn't foolproof by any measure, and Harry wanted to fine-tune the spell to be invisible and have him use it in conjunction with his arcane hearing. Alas, he didn't really have the time to do it. Still, Harry noticed that most of the books with the words Mind Arts were grouped together in the middle of the library. When he walked there, practically every book was glowing, and Harry assumed that it was the section in the field. Satisfied with his search, the Potter Scion removed the cloak and started looking at the titled books. Well he understood why most of them were in the restricted section. Mind Curses, How to Break Down Your Enemies by Charles Claw sounded quite sinister. Yeah, there were books on how to curse people to insanity, on how to control their minds, on how to brainwash them, manipulate their very thoughts, and so much more. It was very horrific, and Harry was shaking by the end of it. He had forgotten how dangerous magic was, how terrible it could be. Magic was supposed to be beautiful, filled with wonder and amazement, but not this. After dozens of horrific titles, Harry found one that didn't sound very dangerous, an introduction to the mind arts by Xavier Harlaw. Finally, a book that wouldn't give him nightmares. Harry prepared to touch it, only to be warned by his arcane hearing of the wards that protected the tome. 
Harry spread his senses and found out that the ward wanted to see a certain identification magical mark to be disabled momentarily. It wasn't very complicated, since it did need to be heavily manufactured, all things con Harry focused and was able to weave an illusion to replicate the magical mark, and he could hear the ward's disabling as he touched the book. Grinning to himself, Harry decided to read the book slightly to see if it was interesting. The introductory chapter showed it to be an academic book focused on teaching. It was probably a supplementary book that was recommended whenever a student wanted to focus on the mind arts. As it said, it seemed to be an introduction to the field, but there didn't seem to be any chapters on occlumency and legilimency. Still, Harry decided to copy the book. He took out one of his modified dictation quills and charmed it to copy the book into his never-ending journal. With that done, Harry decided to change the command a little, in Veniri Libros Verbis Occlumency. This time the golden light was far smaller and was only divided into a dozen or so books. Harry walked towards the closest one and read its title, Occlumency and Legilimency, The Sword and Shield of the Mind Arts. It didn't have an author but when Harry took it out and schemed it, it looked like a brief summary of how occlumency and legilimency worked. Looking around the other glowing book, Harry selected three that looked to instruct the caster on how to protect their mind. Harry decided to take out a few of his spare books and charm his quills to copy them as well. Meanwhile, Harry started reading his fiction book. After all, his spell took hours to work finish, and Harry wasn't in a hurry. He cancelled the lights, put on his invisibility cloak, cast a small lumos underneath the cloak and started reading. It was better in case someone passed by. Harry wouldn't be surprised if Filch and his demon cat patrolled the library for some reason. Harry was thankful that he had locked the door on his way in. The squib caretaker shouldn't suspect a thing. A couple of hours in, the last book was copied, and Harry proceeded to put them back on their shelves, feeling their security enchantments resetting. Harry slowly walked out of the library, making sure to relock the door and felt the enchantment on the lock activate once more. He walked in silence to his dormitory, with a triumphant grin on his face. It was a good feeling. Sneaking around, bypassing the castle's protection while seeking forbidden knowledge. It was like an adventure. Was curse breaking like this? Harry could imagine himself sneaking into tombs, breaking wards to find hidden ancient treasures. It seems like an exciting profession, all things considered. The following day, Harry wasn't seen by any of the residents of the castle. Ron Weasley, who had been humiliated the previous day and wanted to give the Potter Scion a piece of his mind, ended up trying and failing to corner him. The young Slytherin didn't show in any of the meals, choosing to get some snacks from the kitchen. He was too absorbed by something new. Harry hadn't really found anything truly different for months. It was all extensions of his current studies. But an entirely new magical field, no. The last he had seen was alchemy and Harry needed to learn another runic language just to begin practicing it. Because that's what the mind arts really were. It was a magical field that was extremely obscure and very easy to abuse. Well, technically, there are charms and potions that could mimic its effects, but actual mind magic was just one a league of its own. It wasn't just defending the mind and attacking other ones. It was a subtle art that needed practice. It was the gateway to astral projection, sending telepathic messages, and even reading emotions. It was a therapist's wet dream, to be honest. It did explain why mind healers were such treasured and expensive commodities. Apparently, people who specialize in this field are only allowed to do so after finishing their normal healing education and taking an oath not to cause harm. It was sort of like the Hippocratic Oath but more binding. Afterwards, they would have access to thing knowledge, and it was terrifying. No wonder Voldemort was so terrifying. You can't really trust your own thoughts when you're at the mercy of a mind mage. Honestly, considering what he had read, Harry decided to learn occlumency as soon as possible. Funnily enough, it happened to be a somewhat obscure subject, even in the mind arts. The field was mostly targeted towards healers, who didn't really need to be discreet while entering another person's mind but they needed to be gentle and not cause any damage to their patients' psyches. A mind healer getting inside their patient's mind would need to prepare a pseudo-ritual to stabilize the connection both ways. Legilimency didn't do that. The subtlety of legilimency, which is an attacking form of mind magic wasn't really common. It was basically having access to the surface thoughts in one's mind, be it images, memories, dreams, or imagination. It was just a simple spell that collected the loud thoughts around a person. It didn't really involve any true invading of the mind unless the spell is overpowered, which is just as likely to turn the target into a vegetable as getting any useful information from him. Similarly, 
protecting yourself from mind magic was also not that common since it really wasn't likely that someone that has learned this magic properly to use it for harm. Acclumency took years to master, sometimes even decades, and that was just too much effort for small harm. It was a discipline, not a spell. It had many levels, firstly, learning how to stop errant thoughts, practically stopping anyone that could use legilimency from reading your mind. However, mind curses and similar artifacts could still affect you. Afterwards, the discipline is essentially how to control your own mind, so that it may never be manipulated without your permission. Alas, Harry wasn't going to even try to attempt doing something like this anytime soon. He was going to get started with the anti-legilimency before committing to anything like this without any research. It took two days and a pointed letter from Professor Snape until Harry Potter exited his common room. And for all the potion master's scolding, Harry wouldn't have had it any other way. After all, Harry wanted to get the most done before classes started again. Chapter 44, The Two-Faced Man January 12, 1991, Hogwarts Alas, Harry wasn't going to even try to attempt doing something like this anytime soon. He was going to get started with the anti-legilimency before committing to anything like this without any research. It took two days and a pointed letter from Professor Snape until Harry Potter exited his common room. And for all the potion master's scolding, Harry wouldn't have had it any other way. After all, Harry wanted to get the most done before classes started again. Well, before he knew it, classes were back, and school resumed as usual. Harry had spent the rest of the holidays practically reading every single book on the mind arts. It was far more extensive than he had thought, especially since its theory was aimed at fully licensed healers, that have studied for years after graduating from Hogwarts. Funnily enough, the easy part was the spells, especially the malicious ones. The Obliviation Charm can be mastered by any idiot with a wand, but you could spend years studying the disciplines dealing with the fragile intricacies of the mind, and you would only scratch the surface. Mind curses were disturbingly easy to cast. There was one to cause gradual dementia on the target, which acts like a worm, eating away the mind unless it is countered somehow. As for Acclumency and Legilimency, they stood places apart. Legilimency was a spell but one that can only be mastered by a decent Acclumens that was somewhat understanding of mind magics. You could easily accidentally broadcast your own thoughts in the spell, giving your target a slice of your memories while trying to get one of his. As for Acclumency, it was a discipline of mastery over the mind. It wasn't meant to repress emotions or feelings, it didn't give you a photographic memory, and it certainly didn't give you perfect recall of every little detail like a pensive. Oh, the practices involved would guarantee that the user is disciplined and has enough self-control, but it's not the magic but the exercises that guarantee this, and even then, they weren't foolproof. Voldemort was known as a master of acclumency, and he wasn't exactly the picture of mental or emotional stability. Still, Harry started to do the advised exercises and focus on a mental image every night to clear his mind. It was very hard and not that rewarding in the short term. No wonder Harry Potter from the stories was miserable at it. He was a hormonal teenager, angry at the world, that was clamoring for action. Sitting still for an hour a day to clear his mind wasn't really a thing he would look forward to, and that's not to mention Snape breaking into his private moments one after one. Thankfully, that wasn't happening to him, even if the method Snape used was technically viable, especially considering his counterpart's situation. The purpose was to get him to familiarize himself with his own mind enough that he would be able to feel every intrusion. It wasn't enough for him to stop broadcasting his thoughts, since Voldemort was already inside his mind because of the Horcrux. It was a bootlegged still of deep acclumency meant to recognize mind-altering spells and potions and stop them. And the boy was forced to do it without even mastering the basics since that would take too long. Still, with his magic circuits stabilizing after the ritual, Harry didn't need to do the ritual bath every day leaving him with a couple of hours of free time that he was going to use to do these exercises. However, for all Harry was excited to have all the time in the world to learn a new field of magic, he had missed his friends. He waited for them at the platform on the day they returned, one day before classes started. He was immediately enveloped by a hug from Daphne and Tracy, who seemed to have loved their presence. Blaze was slightly more subdued in showing his gratitude, but he was wearing the pin Harry had given him. With classes starting, things started to stabilize into a certain routine. Harry simply did his acclumency exercises in the morning, then went with his friends to class, went to the library after it was over for a couple of hours after classes, and then returned to the dormitory to hang out with them, do his homework, or practice his spell work. Normalcy had returned to the school of magic. At least in theory. 
although, for some reason, Neville Longbottom seemed to spend an inordinate amount of time in the history section of the library looking for Nicholas Flamel. It was extremely amusing from the outside since if he asked any upper year, he would have probably had an answer. Alas, he seemed to be stuck in the wrong part of the history section in a vain effort to be secretive in his quest to find out what is hidden in the forbidden corridor, and he was too stubborn to ask anyone about it. Harry wanted to see his face when he found out how much of a waste all this effort was. Although, the young Slytherin was somewhat sympathetic to McGonagall that looked hopeful that her student was taking his education seriously, only to be saddened by his even lower grades. Still, as long as he kept busy, Harry was all for letting the boy waste his time with this nonsense. He had barely even talked to a person that wasn't a Gryffindor first year or a member of his Quidditch team, which meant that he stopped harassing people and ignored Malfoy's crude attempt at antagonizing him, much to the blonde's obvious frustration. He really didn't know how to deal with it. As for the Philosopher's Stone, Harry had no desire to find it. Because the corridor is either a trap for Voldemort or a test for Longbottom. It was the only conclusion other than Dumbledore being simply insane and that was unlikely, no matter how much the man wanted the world to see him as an eccentric wise old man. It didn't matter if the trap used the real stone or not, because if it was the real thing, no matter how unlikely it was, then it could be easily tracked somehow, and Harry was not confident enough to fight out armies of wizards with dreams of living forever. Although, it was most likely a fake. Nicholas Flamel didn't really seem the type to give the key to his and his wife's survival to be used as a trap for a Dark Lord that's not all that different from the other Dark Lords he dealt with in his long life. It didn't matter, and even if Dumbledore had arranged to show him the mirror, Harry had no intention of being involved in the man's plots. Still, nothing out of the ordinary happened until one day, after his defense against the Dark Arts class, Professor Quirrell addressed Harry, Mr. Potter, could you please stay back for me? Harry gulped slightly while his friends left the classroom, leaving the young Slytherin alone with the possibly possessed professor. He was always hesitant whenever he was in Quirrell's presence. He never met his eyesight or the back of his head, he made sure to never be alone with him, and he never volunteered in any way during class. The man still kept fidgeting and jumping at every sudden noise, but the Potter scion knew that it didn't make him any less dangerous. The turban-wearing professor waited until the last student left the classroom before speaking, you must wonder why I asked you to stay, Potter. Harry nodded, the thought did cross my mind, Professor. Well, I couldn't help but notice how advanced you really are during class. I will admit to not having seen someone your age with your competence in a very long time. Harry simply shrugged, I just like learning about magic. It's just so amazing, what we can do with it. How could I not want to learn about it? Alas, the professor's words cut into his heart like a knife, you weren't raised by wizards, were you? Harry simply stood there stupefied. Of all the things he expected the professor to say, this wasn't it. The man grinned at his reaction, I thought so. Don't worry, I'm not planning on telling anyone. I could only imagine what might happen if this information was spread in your house. How did you find out, professor? Harry finally asked after a few seconds of silence. He tried to figure out where he went wrong. He didn't really do anything that any other pure-blood student wouldn't. So. How did Quirrell know? Oh, you want to know where you went wrong. That's the thing, Potter, you didn't, and that's what let me know. Your experimentations with your magic, and your passion towards learning more about it, aren't characteristics of someone who is used to magic as an everyday commodity. You treat your magic as a luxury, as a precious gift, as you well should. Your peers dismiss it. It's too normal for them. That's why I knew that you weren't raised around magic. Harry grimaced. The man really wasn't wrong, but he really wanted him to just get to the point. The professor continued, it's nothing to be ashamed of. You are part of a family that has existed for centuries and helped shape history in its own way. As far as I'm concerned, your attitude towards magic is an advantage, not a flaw. Which is why I wished to make you an offer. What kind of offer? Harry asked. Well, as you well know, you're allowed to choose a club to join this semester. Professor Flitwick was very excited when you showed interest in his dueling club, but I'm here to offer you an alternative. Dueling, while a noble art and a respected sport, is not really useful outside of sporting events. You won't really learn any new spells or magic, and in a real magical fight, the instincts wouldn't help you too much. What I propose is for you to study under me, and I will teach you magic beyond any student in this castle. Like what, Professor? The man grinned as if he had won something, well, 
there's the dark arts, the light arts, elemental magics, mind magics, rituals, anything really. It will depend entirely on you. I will make sure that you are the greatest student to ever come out of Hogwarts. The potter Sion internally grimaced, but he was still curious about something the man said, the light arts, sir? What are those? Well, Dumbledore probably kept this hidden, but there is a counterpart to the dark arts, called the light arts. They're not as nice as they sound. Honestly, they're not all that different from the dark arts. They're just as alluring, just as addictive, and just as harmful in the wrong hands. You could do a lot of good with both. You can heal with both the light and dark alike, just as you can cast curses with both light and dark arts. This is not magic that you will ever find at Hogwarts. The headmaster has made sure to put any of the books either in his own collection or in the restricted section. So, what do you say, young Potter? Would you like to accept my offer? Well, that was more information than he had on the subject in a while. Harry decided not to dabble in dark magic until he had enough of a foundation in magic while making sure not to hurt himself. Harry wouldn't deny that Quirrell's offer was attractive. He had to sneak into restricted sections, the room of requirements, fighting and figuring out every useful spell he could find, and having an official teacher would help speed things along. But with that came the downsides. Quirrell was dangerous, and Harry wanted nothing to do with it. The Potter Scion made a decision and shook his head, I'm sorry professor, but that would be taking the fun out of learning magic. I like figuring things out on my own, and a private tutor would rob me of that. And I am excited to test my magic against other students. I'm sorry, but I'm going to join the dueling club. Harry thought that for a second, the man's eyes turned to red before turning back to their usual brown, I'm sorry to hear that, Potter. If you ever change your mind, my door is always open. I hope that you will succeed in your endeavors and not regret refusing this opportunity. The young Slytherin shivered at the man's cold tone, an implied threat. He returned to his dormitory and stayed in his bed, realizing that he almost became the apprentice of the fucking Dark Lord in his first year at Hogwarts. He only hoped that the man wouldn't kill him for his refusal. Chapter 45, Dodging a Bullet January 13, 1991, Hogwarts The young Slytherin shivered at the man's cold tone, an implied threat. He returned to his dormitory and stayed in his bed, realizing that he almost became the apprentice of the fucking Dark Lord in his first year at Hogwarts. He only hoped that the man wouldn't kill him for his refusal. It was the following day and Harry was still shaking at what happened with Quirrell. There was just too much of a risk to spending a large amount of time with the defense against the dark arts professor. The topics that the man spoke of were far beyond the cowardly academic he pretended to be, and the passion in his voice did not fit his carefully mastered persona. Yet, Quirrell was probably possessed and spending any extra time with him was dangerous, let alone becoming his private pupil. This posed a substantial risk, especially with the knowledge locked deep in Harry's mind. His protection came from his anonymity. No one cared about the Slytherin quiet bookworm when Malfoy and Longbottom look all the spotlight and it suited him perfectly. However, Quirrell had noticed, Voldemort had noticed him. And while having one of the strongest wizards in existence teach him was a very attractive idea, it was simply foolish to spend time near a master of legilimency while having secret knowledge in his head. The fact that the castle was still standing and that things are continuing somewhat similarly to the stories in Harry's mind, was proof that no one was able to breach inside, but Harry was gaining attention and he couldn't let his knowledge into the hands of anyone but him. He didn't trust anyone to give them something that could shake the very foundations of magical society, and perhaps, he never will trust anyone for that. Harry didn't know if his past life was automatically protected from intrusion, but Harry rarely ever thought about it, and definitely not during class, which made him somewhat safe. Plus, legilimency was a spell, and Harry could hear spells that are malicious in nature thanks to his arcane hearing. It wasn't foolproof since Dumbledore accidentally got past it by getting an enchantment without negative intent affecting him. But direct spells like legilimency were like loud bangs for Harry. Oh, he was actively blocking his ability to not be overwhelmed by the castle's magic, but it was still proof that he wasn't infallible. Harry never turned off his ability when he was in Quirrell's presence, or Snape's for that matter. It was for self-preservation purposes, but he hadn't felt anyone attempt to breach his mind. Not that he was even looking them in the eyes in the first place. Still, having someone become your mentor without looking them in the eye was just optimistic. That's not mentioning whatever Quirrell's real plan was. Yet, getting away from that shit show was for the best. Nevertheless, Harry really needed to step up his acclumency training to avoid causing any trouble. 
To make sure that the offer is off the table entirely, Harry decided to speed up his joining of a school club so that Quirrell wouldn't try to sneak something past him. First years were only allowed one extracurricular activity, and if he joined a club, the possibly possessed professor would need to get him to quit before getting him to accept his offer. And so, after his charms lesson, Harry walked up to Professor Flitwick and spoke up, Professor, is it possible for me to join the dueling club? The half-goblin grinned, Oh ho, Mr. Potter, I have been waiting for a week for you to bring up the issue. I normally don't accept first years as they are liable to get hurt and often get left behind. I also need a whole year to train my students and prepare them for the dueling tournaments in the summer, and first years are only allowed to join a club in their second semester. However, Minerva did bend the rule to admit Longbottom to the Quidditch team, which sets a precedent for admitting you into the club, so it's only a question to if you can catch up to the other members, and if you can handle the extra workload. It will not be an easy task, Potter. Are you willing to put the effort in? I promise to do my best, Professor, Harry replied. All right, I will admit you as a probationary member of the club. In a month, I will personally review your membership based on your performance in the dueling ring, and your performance in your academia. If you prove to me, and the rest of the club that you can handle it, then you'll be a full member. You'll probably be the youngest member in almost a century, an impressive feat, all things considered. Do you agree with my terms, young Potter? The Potter scion had an intense look on his face, yes, I can do it. The former dueling champion jumped while clapping his hand, very well, you are now a probationary member of Hogwarts' esteemed dueling club. Our first meeting is tonight at six near the Great Hall. Don't be late. Harry understood the implied dismissal in the statement and left the room. He was immediately accosted by his friends, so, what did you want with Flitwick? Blaze questioned. The green-eyed boy shrugged, I just asked to join the dueling club. He agreed to let me join as a probationary member to see if I can handle it. Wait, what? Flitwick never lets first years in his club, Tracy remarked, I remember Montague complaining about it. Apparently, he wanted to join in his first one to fight in the under-12 European dueling tournaments, and he wanted Flitwick to train him. Flitwick refused and he ended up losing in the first round to some Bulgarian boy. Montague joined in his second year but he keeps telling everyone that Flitwick is the one who stopped him from winning the whole thing. Harry quirked his eyebrow, how is there an under-12 dueling tournament? Only 11-year-olds could use wands without blowing everything up and participate in the tournament. It's more of a joke tournament, Daphne replied, no one really takes it seriously since the best the participants could do is send prank spells at each other. It's why it's so sad that Montague still brags about it. He lost on the first round in a joke tournament, and he blamed Flitwick of all people for it. Harry simply nodded. It must be one of the small quirks of the magical world, and he didn't have any interest in actually fighting in a tournament if it wouldn't really be a challenge. Still, he decided to come back to the dormitory with his friend and forego going to the library that day. He didn't know how long the dueling meeting was going to be and he didn't to neglect his friends. Harry was broken from his thought when Daphne hit him with her elbow on the way to the dormitory, hey, what gives? The blonde girl glared at Harry, Granger is looking at you again. The potter scion suppressed a groan and looked discreetly at his former friend. She was looking longingly at him for some reason. The muggle-born kept doing that during class and it was very distracting. He didn't know why she wouldn't just come to speak with him. Ever since she had returned, she just acted weirdly whenever he was near. Oh, he was never going to be as close to her as before, but they were at least friendly acquaintances. Harry wouldn't really care, Hermione was free to do whatever she liked. He stopped being invested in their friendship months ago. Unfortunately, his friends had noticed the Muggleborn's behavior and commented on it, again, I don't know why she's doing that. A teasing smile appeared on Tracy's face, maybe she has a crush on you. Oh, it would be so romantic. A love that is forbidden because of the houses. The Muggleborn and the heir. It would make a great tragedy. It would be a trashy romance novel at best, Tracy, Harry protested but I really haven't spoken to her for months. I don't know why she's suddenly looking at me like that. And he wasn't even lying. Hermione's gift was a very nice gesture to apologize for her mistake and Harry did forgive her. But for some reason, she seemed undecided between talking to him and avoiding him, and Harry was very confused about it. The Potter scion simply did his best to ignore the girl and muttered, Troublesome. Blaze snorted in amusement at his comment, and the four Slytherins kept bickering until they reached the common room. They ended up playing a small chess tournament. 
Harry had wanted to try out his new chess set, and Daphne had surprisingly asked to play against him. It was odd because he and Blaze usually played while Daphne and Tracy gossiped in the corner. Still, Daphne wasn't that bad all things considered. Harry destroyed her, of course, but the green grass scion was competitive enough to keep trying until it was almost time for the dueling club meeting. Harry excused himself and hurried back to the great hall. The long dining tables had vanished and a golden stage had appeared along one wall, lit by thousands of candles floating overhead. The ceiling was velvety black once more and upper years were giving him questioning looks. One of them, an older raven claw, walked towards Harry, probably with the intention of asking him to leave, but Professor Flitwick walked up the stage, gather around everyone. I hope that you all had a wonderful Christmas, and I welcome you to the second half of your yearly dueling education. As most of you noticed, we have a new addition to our ranks. He pointed at the only first year in the room and Harry wanted to crawl away from their stairs. Montague turned to the professor with an incredulous expression, but he's a firstie. And I believe he can catch up to the second years easily enough. Do not worry though, his membership is probationary. I will personally judge his progress and see if he should stay a member. That being said, if I see any signs that someone is sabotaging him in any way, they will be expelled from the club, that's not mentioning the months of detention that they'll have to serve with Filch. Everyone shivered at the thought of spending that much time with the frankly despicable squib. Harry didn't really know why his post even existed. It's not like he cleaned anything since the house elves do it. All he does is run around with his cat and try to get students punished. And even if the post was necessary, this man had no business being anywhere near children, let alone handling their punishments. Harry didn't care that he was a squib. He did care that he was a spiteful angry sadist of a man, that relished at the thought of physically harming the students of the castle. The fact that Dumbledore hadn't fired the man was honestly disturbing. The charms professor simply shook his head and continued, All right, so a quick revision on the basics. Dueling is a sport, an art, where you show your mastery over tactics and magic in a martial manner. However, using dueling tactics while fighting a criminal is liable to get you killed. So, if you're expecting to list this club as some sort of advantage when applying to be an auror, you're more likely to be laughed at than anything else. Dueling is a demonstration of knowledge of spells and their counters, reflexes, certain skills, and tactics. There are strict rules and regulations, and there is an official list of allowed spells. Of course, not a single spell allowed to be used can be considered to be dark. Casting any forbidden spell in an official tournament is grounds for getting disqualified, and if the spell is dangerous enough, banned from competitive dueling altogether. Now, with that out of the way, let's start with a small demonstration between me and the seventh year current champion. Chapter 46, The Dueling Club January 13, 1991, Hogwarts Dueling is a demonstration of knowledge of spells and their counters, reflexes, certain skills, and tactics. There are strict rules and regulations, and there is an official list of allowed spells. Of course, not a single spell allowed to be used can be considered to be dark. Casting any forbidden spell in an official tournament is grounds for getting disqualified, and if the spell is dangerous enough, banned from competitive dueling altogether. Now, with that out of the way, let's start with a small demonstration between me and the seventh year current champion. A seventh year Greyfinder boy with blonde hair slowly walked up the dueling platform. Harry had heard Marcus Flint complain about him. Apparently, the guy was responsible for incapacitating Montague the previous year and causing him not to be ready for Quidditch. Alex Smith was his name, he was related to Zacharias Smith in Harry's year, who according to the stories was probably a descendant of Helga Hufflepuff. Still, the boy was an arrogant ponce, and his elder relative's sneer of disdain as he looked at Harry was not really promising to his character. Still, personality aside, his skill as a dueler must be impressive since he's the seventh year champion. The members of the club organize themselves by years since it wouldn't make sense to teach 12-year-olds and 17-year-olds the same things. Their mastery over magic is simply different, and they can incorporate more skill in their duels. There are small tournaments to declare who is the best dueler in each age group and at the end of the semester, the champions for every one fight, declaring who is the best Hogwarts dueler. It mostly ends up being a sixth or seventh year. Harry knew this because the final duels are available to the public and their results are logged in the library. And so, to summarize his little inner monologue, Alex Smith was the best dueler in Hogwarts, and he was going against a legitimate dueling champion and charm master. Both duelers stood at opposing sides of the stage, bowed to each other, and took some stances. 
Harry had seen them in the dueling book Hermione had gotten him. They served to minimize the target and be ready to cast a spell at a moment's notice. Smith was the one to start the duel. He cast some kind of purple spell at the professor who simply batted it away with a flick of his wand. Whatever this spell was it was very aggressive, at least that's what Harry felt using his arcane hearing. He didn't have time to analyze it because it traveled far quicker than any other spell he had seen. Still, the professor retaliated with a standard stunning charm that the seventh year dodged. And they kept at it, sending very quick spells at each other, dodging, countering, and shielding sometimes. They didn't speak a word, nor did they do any elaborate wand movements. Things started to look slightly boring until the professor sent a blasting curse at the student who redirected it to the ground before him. The wooden platform that was hit ended up into shards which the student used to banish the professor. A gust of intense wind appeared from the tip of the half-goblin's wand and redirected the projectiles towards the student who put up a shield to protect himself. The professor conjured a rope that he animated to discreetly slither down the shield, as he peppered the shield with small spells. Finally, the professor cast a powerful shield breaker which momentarily broke the shield and let the rope through. The hidden object tripped the teenager and the professor used this to disarm him and banish him out of the arena. It was an impressive display of skill by the professor that didn't really look tired. He was holding back massively, but he was somehow able to animate a construct while casting other spells, something that Harry didn't know was even possible. Smith wasn't really that bad. Spell redirection is a very impressive skill, and his use of his surroundings was good, but he simply didn't come close to matching the professor. The entire classroom clapped at the display of skill and Harry understood why this could be considered to be a joke to Aurors. Yeah, the reflexes are all right, but the common use of shields wasn't something that's commonly seen especially when unknown spells are being fired. The fact that the spell repertoire was limited, is good for the safety of the duelers, but not really for actual fighting. The two fighters didn't really move closely towards each other. Duelers are only allowed to move in certain locations, making any kind of close combat absolute. That meant that duelers simply won't know what to do if they were attacked by a dark creature. Yet, yeah, Harry could see why Aurus would laugh at duelers, but he could also see the beauty of the sport. It was about making the best of what you're allowed to do, and Flitwick showed that. It's about being creative, fast, and strategic. But the way spells were sent around and countered so effortlessly by both sides was simply breathtaking. Using counter curses in the middle of a fight was suicidal, but with a locked repertoire, it wouldn't surprise Harry if people knew a counter for every available spell. Still, all things considered, Harry was excited to be able to do half this stuff, and from the looks of his fellow club members, he wasn't the only one. The professor and Smith bowed to each other again and turned towards their spectators. The half-goblin was smiling widely, now that you've seen what you're supposed to achieve coming here, it's time to talk about the logistics. As usual, every year group will have a slot during the afternoon, except for Sunday that is. Mondays will be for second years, Tuesdays for third years, and so on. We will meet every week at seven, after dinner, and I will give you small assignments and spells to learn mostly, during each session. We will meet near the Great Hall, but our lesson will be in a different room. Now, as it is a Monday, everyone that's not a second year, or first year student for that matter, is to leave the hall so that I could start my lesson. The upper years thanked the professors and slowly started to leave through the main door. It left Harry with five other students, a familiar Greyfinder named Cormac McLagan, a Hufflepuff boy that was sneering at him who Harry didn't even know. There was another Slytherin, a girl this time. Her name was Roll or something, and two Ravenclaws, a black-haired boy and an Asian girl. The professor clapped their hands, All right, students, as you can see, there is a new member in our little group. So, everyone, introduce yourselves. McLagan started up, Hey, I'm Cormac McLagan, I'm in Greyfinder, and I like Quidditch and Transfiguration. Hey, that wasn't so bad. Harry had assumed that he was the Greyfinder version of Malfoy or something. Of course, the boy had to ruin it, oh, and my dad works at the ministry so last year an aura friend of his showed me a few moves. Yeah, he's a spoiled brat all right. The Asian girl rolled her eyes at him, Cho Chong. It's nice to make your acquaintance. I also like Quidditch, I'm hoping to apply to be a seeker next year since the Ravenclaw one is in his seventh year right now. The other Ravenclaw introduced himself as Patrick Jones and said that he wanted to be a dueling champion someday. The Slytherin girl introduced herself as Rowena Roll and didn't say anything else. Finally, it was time for the Hufflepuff to introduce herself, and he seemed to keep glaring at Harry for some reason, my name is David Abbott. 
that should tell you everything you need. Honestly, Harry didn't know why he was pressing his voice when he said his last name, and he didn't really understand what he was talking about. He had the last name of one of his Hufflepuff classmates, nothing more. Harry simply shrugged which seemed to incense the boy even further. My name is Harry Potter, I like transfiguration and charms. I'm in Slytherin, obviously, and I'm happy to be part of this club. The half-goblin clapped his hands, well done, now for Harry's benefit as well as yours, what can you tell me about what you have learned in the last semester? Cho raised her hands, well, we learned the three basic stances attacking, defending, and flexible we learned two shield spells, the Contego and Repelio, as well as the Punching Jinx, the Disarming Charm, and the Jelly Legs Curse. We also learned a few dueling tactics and practiced our spells on the training dummies. It wasn't really that impressive, all things considered, but it was a good introduction. Two defensive spells, three offensive ones, and a few stances seemed like a good grounding for dueling. Not that Harry knew for sure, but he had faith that Flitwick knew his stuff. The professor nodded profusely, well done, Ms. Chong. You're right, most of what we have done before was theoretical work, and this semester we'll start focusing on the practical part. At the end of each session, each one of you will duel another student. The students grinned at one another, all right, now, I want each of you to cast the three attacking spells I taught you on the training dummies, just to make sure you haven't forgotten anything during the holidays. The six students stood in front of a training dummy each, which seemed to be slightly animated and was holding a stick. Harry nodded to himself and prepared to cast at his dummy, but his hand was held up by the professor, not so fast, Mr. Potter. I want you to use the attacking stance before casting a spell. It's good that you're standing sideways, but you need to widen your legs a little and bend your knees slightly. Yes, that's perfect. Well, then, Harry, show me what you can do. Harry nodded to himself and murmured, Expelliarmus. A small jet of light emerged from Harry's wand and hit his opponent's hand, disarming him. The professor clapped his hands in excitement, a perfectly executed disarming charm. Now, show me the jelly legs curse. Harry nodded once more and cast, Locomotor Wibbly. The dummy's wooden legs seemed to turn to jelly, and it fell down with a bang. Finally, Harry cast the punching jinx, and the dummy was hurled away from the impact. The charm's master seemed to be smiling very brightly, I was correct. It seems you'll be able to catch up easily on the offensive side of dueling. Now, show me your shields. Harry cast the Contego and Repelio shields many times, with the professor testing them with basic casts at different powers. He seemed to be satisfied, even if he told Harry to fix his defensive stance many times. By the end of the session, the professor simply told him to practice his stances for the next meeting. Finally, he addressed the rest of the students, All right, it seemed that you're all caught up. Starting next week, we'll start with the duels. Now, as homework, I want you to look up what spell chains are and how they're commonly used. That's what we're starting with in our next sessions. Now, off you go, it's almost curfew. Harry smiled and turned to leave, only for Abbott to bump into him violently on the way. What's his problem, he murmured to himself. Cho gave him an unreadable look, don't you know? A branch of the Abbott family lived in Godric's Hollow. David lost his parents and everything that belonged to them to that fire, the fire that you survived while being completely unharmed. Apparently, he was at his cousin's for the day, so he wasn't there. I'm not saying that it's your fault, but I guess he's still bitter about it. I know I would be too if it was me. That night, Harry dreamed of cursed flames and screaming. Chapter 47, Reparations January 15, 1991, Hogwarts. Cho gave him an unreadable look, don't you know? A branch of the Abbott family lived in Godric's Hollow. David lost his parents and everything that belonged to them to that fire, the fire that you survived while being completely unharmed. Apparently, he was at his cousin's for the day, so he wasn't there. I'm not saying that it's your fault, but I guess he's still bitter about it. I know I would be too if it was me. That night, Harry dreamed of cursed flames and screaming. It had been two days after his dueling session, and Harry was engrossed with the sport. The demonstration of skill and precision that Professor Flitwick and Alex Smith demonstrated was breathtaking, and the Potter Scion wanted to surpass them. He had holed himself in the library as much as possible researching rules and regulations on the sport, and that was fascinating. Apparently, the spell limitations were far more complicated than he assumed. There are multiple levels of dueling circuits separated by age, and rule. 
there are circuits dedicated to a single magical branch but were more relaxed in the restricted spells, while there are what are essentially fight clubs where you can use any legal spell without being disqualified. Deaths were fairly common in these circuits. Still, from the sound of it, Professor Flitwick wanted to prepare them in the standard dueling circuit, which is mainly divided by age. The 11 and under tournament was a bit of a joke, where only a handful of spells could be used. The 13 and under tournament also had a relatively restricted set of spells, but it's enough to make duels at least somewhat exciting. The 17 and under tournament also had a restriction on spells, but they can be summarized into a tome per magical field. The allowed charm spells alone were in a book that was almost as thick as all of Harry's school books put together. And that was just a list of spells with their effects, nothing more. The adult tournament, on the other hand, was far more forgiving. Transfiguration and charms were allowed, even unknown spells, but there was still a list of curses, jinxes, and hexes, that could be used. Apparently, dark magic was simply too dangerous to be used willy-nilly in a sporting tournament. Yet, Harry could see why this decision was wise. He still didn't really understand what made dark magic, well, dark, but a common property of dark spells was how lasting their effect could be. Harry had tried to research this topic further, alas, he was completely stumped. There were no books in the library on the matter, and the restricted section was too big for such a broad topic as dark magic. The room of requirements was of no help at all, and Harry finally understood why he couldn't really use it to get any forbidden knowledge. Funnily enough, it was in one of the books on the castle in the forbidden section of the library. Harry had experimented every time he visited the room of requirements, and for every topic, the book selection was very random. In the end, he ended up using his spell to look for any book with the words room of requirements on it. And yet, a wizard 500 years back had researched the room entirely. He renamed it the Room of Illusions, and from what he had found, it made sense. The room could sense the thoughts of whoever wanted to enter it and use some kind of expansion enchantment to fit his desires. The rest of the room is filled with conjurations and illusions, nothing more. It wasn't some miracle room that could do everything. It couldn't even materialize the books in the room of hidden things. The room was only allowed to conjure things that can either be pictured in the user's mind, or in the public rooms in the castle. It was the same for books. Conjuring a replica of a book was similar to using a doubling charm, and most books, especially ones with delicate knowledge, were protected against such enchantments. It was why every time Harry had tried to get any book, the results will always be completely random, and it couldn't even take a single book from the restricted section, since they're especially warded. Harry will simply have to settle for sneaking in with his cloak. Although Harry wondered where it had gotten the book on family crests. It must have been hidden either in the room of hidden things or somewhere else in the castle, where the room could find. Still, the room was very useful for practicing spells anyway, so that wasn't a waste. Plus, Harry was planning on raiding the room of hidden things as much as possible to find any hidden treasure inside that might help enrich his house once more. Alas, Harry was probably going to use the room to practice his dueling. The room could theoretically conjure moving targets that could send projectiles at him. Yet, having dummies cast actual spells was a little out there, probably impossible so projectiles will do. Harry was so engrossed in a book about dueling tactics, that he didn't notice someone sitting next to him until they bumped into him. The Potter Scion stiffened in surprise, only to relax at seeing a familiar mess of bushy hair next to him. Hermione Granger had finally deigned to speak to him for the first time in months, hey, Harry. The young Slytherin nodded to her, Hermione. The girl was fidgeting in apprehension, I see that you got into the dueling club. Harry shrugged, I'm just a probationary member. I'll be an official one in a month after Professor Flitwick sees if I catch up. Again, the girl seemed to not know what to say. Harry could understand her pain. He was also extremely socially awkward, did you get my present? Yeah, it was a nice book. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't get you anything. I thought that we weren't friends anymore. The girl couldn't really hold it anymore, I'm so sorry, Harry. I didn't know how horribly I treated you. I was like the mean kids in muggle school who ignored me. I hope you could forgive me. Harry couldn't help but pity the girl slightly, I have forgiven you months ago, Hermione. So, does that mean that we're friends again? The girl asked with a hopeful smile on her face. That was a very weighted question. Being friends with Hermione was surprisingly easy. They just connected, oddly enough. But with her having chosen Longbottom and Weasley over him, he just couldn't trust her. 
and with the boy who lived being a trouble magnet and the center of attention of Dumbledore and Voldemort, Harry didn't want to get involved. It was why he didn't take credit for saving Hermione from the troll in the first place. A friendship with Hermione was more trouble than he knew how to deal with it at the moment. No, Harry simply answered, I said that I forgave you. I don't hate you nor am I angry at you, I'm just disappointed that our friendship didn't last. Look, all you proved to me is that you didn't think that being friends with me was worth the effort of sneaking away. You chose Longbottom and Weasley, and I will respect your decision. What I will not respect is you changing your mind over and over again. Just stick with the choice you made. The girl's eyes were teary, but I'm sorry. Look, being sorry is good and everything, but the reasons why you chose your housemates are not gone. We won't be friends again, but that doesn't mean that we have to hate each other. If you near help with anything, I'll hear you out. At most, we'll be friendly acquaintances. What do you think? The girl sniffed, I guess I'll take it. Harry snorted and went back to reading his book. A couple of minutes later, Hermione hit him on the shoulder, Um, there's something I don't understand about our transfiguration assignment. The book says that you need to change the entire set of wand movements to turn the mouse into a snuffbox, and why the spell to do the opposite is a lot more difficult. The potter Sion inwardly groaned. He had spent an hour the day prior explaining this very topic to Daphne, well, the previous semester we were focusing on inanimate to animate transfiguration. The most a spell had to deal with was turning a state of matter into another, like a liquid to a solid, and vice versa. But here, you're turning a being that is alive, and when you cancel the transfiguration, you want the mouse to still be alive. This means that excluding the material transfiguration, you need to preserve its consciousness as well, hence the extra wand movements. It's a really advanced transfiguration theory which will take somewhere after our owls since we'll need to know it before trying out any human transfiguration. It's also why the animagus transformation is so dangerous. The two forms, animal form and human form, handle consciousness differently, which can somewhat overlap, making the casters react more like their inner animals even in their human forms. The Muggleborn looked thoughtful for a moment and nodded to himself. Harry was under no illusion that she wasn't going to research this on her own later, what about the snuffbox to mouse transfiguration? Harry snorted, that's because you are not really turning a snuffbox into a mouse. You're turning the snuffbox into the body of a dead mouse and then animating it to act like it. It's a combination of two spells, a transfiguration and a charm, hence why it's more difficult, and we'll learn it after we're done with animation charms with Flitwick. How do you know all of this? Hermione asked. I get bored easily, replied Harry while shrugging, I thought you would do the same, to be honest. I get distracted by Neville and Ron's antics. They've been especially restless since Dumbledore decided to make Snape the referee in the next Quidditch game. Yeah, it was a bit of a scandal when that happened. Apparently, for the first time in a decade, Dumbledore was personally attending a Hogwarts Quidditch game, and Snape of all people, was refereeing. Harry couldn't see the Potion Master being fair, and the Gryffindors felt the same considering how outraged they all were. Harry snorted, I still don't understand why people find that game enjoyable. Yeah, it's driving me mad. Ron and Neville spent the entire time practicing for Quidditch. They even stopped helping me search for Nicholas Flamel. The Muggleborn immediately panicked, she probably hadn't wanted to reveal that tidbit, especially with the perceived danger involved. Harry really wanted to burst into laughter at her expression, but just gave her a questioning look, Hey, why are you even looking for Flamel? He hasn't been seen in public for a while, as far as I know. It would be all over the French news if he and his wife did. Wait. You know who he is? Hermione asked him with an incredulous tone. Well, yet. Yeah. Practically everyone who knows anything about the magical world knows who he is. Half the first years, at least, and almost all of the upper years. So, who is he? The Muggleborn questioned with an excited look on her face. You seriously don't know? It's like common knowledge. Hell, he's even known in the Muggle world, I think, Harry replied. Just tell me who he is, will you? Fine, Nicholas Flamel is the single greatest alchemist to have ever existed. He personally taught Dumbledore back in the day, and they made some discoveries about the properties of dragon blood. I didn't really read much on it, to be honest, since I don't know a lot about alchemy. Still, what Flamel is known for the most is his creation, the Philosopher's Stone. It absolutely circumvents the basic laws of alchemy and can turn any metal into gold as well as make something called the elixir of life, 
which extends the natural lifetime of its drinker and can even serve as a healing agent, as well as remove curses. There's not much known about his private life, only that he and his wife, Pernell Flamel, have lived for over 600 years. So, why are you researching Flamel in the first place? Harry barely finished speaking when he saw the Muggleborn girl had run away to another corner of the library. He suppressed a small grin. That girl was so predictable. Chapter 48, The Howling Banshee February 24, 1992, Hogwarts There's not much known about his private life, only that he and his wife, Pernell Flamel, have lived for over 600 years. So, why are you researching Flamel in the first place? Harry barely finished speaking when he saw the Muggleborn girl had run away to another corner of the library. He suppressed a small grin. That girl was so predictable. Well, it didn't take long for Harry to regret giving that tidbit of information to Hermione. Yet, yeah, she would have gotten it eventually, probably by accident, but the Potter Scion should have expected Longbottom's reaction to it. Yet, yeah, it started with Quidditch of all things. For some reason, Dumbledore thought it was a good idea for Snape of all people to referee a Quidditch match that involved the house he's known for harassing. Harry didn't know what Dumbledore was expecting but sending a biased teacher to perform as an unbiased referee in a sport he's not specializing in, for an official Hogwarts game, was a bit out there. The Quidditch games in Hogwarts were available for spectators, and most importantly the scouts. The British Quidditch teams hire exclusively from either Hogwarts or from specialized Quidditch training camps. Playing professionally is not as out there as it is in the Muggle world. The population in Magical Britain is not as immense in the Muggle world, meaning that someone who works hard can become a professional Quidditch player. Turning the games at Hogwarts into jokes will hurt the students' chances of being taken seriously by the scouts. People could lose their real chances at achieving their dream, and all because of some decision made on a whim by the headmaster. Really, people tend to forget how powerful the headmaster position is in Britain. The man could affect entire industries if he wanted to. Hell, he already has, by banning certain materials from being taught. Severus Snape alone is responsible for a drop in professions that require a newt in potions because of his requirement for students to get an O in their owls to continue. That's not even counting his attitude. His newt students are far more competent than in any other institution, but this competence isn't really required in professions just needing a passing grade. Well, back to the Quidditch game, as expected, Gryffindor lost by a very bad margin. Snape practically fouled the Gryffindors every time they had the upper hand and after a couple of hours of what was essentially bullying, Cedric Diggory caught the snitch, pretty much destroying any chances at Gryffindor winning the Quidditch Cup. Longbottom had especially been harassed about it since the entire team was counting on him. There was already talk of him using his fame to be part of the team. As expected, without his research in regard to Nicholas Flamel, and the constant Quidditch training to distract him, the boy went nuts. As expected, he started bullying the Slytherins and well, things started to escalate. Harry had started the day with his friends. It was Sunday, so he had no classes and he wanted to take a day off studying just to hang out with his friends. It was too cold to get outside, and they didn't really want to stay in the common room, so they decided to walk around while exploring the castle. Well, they were exploring the castle, Harry had done that in the first month of classes and had a good idea of how it was built. Oh, there were countless secrets that he hadn't discovered, but he knew far more than his friends did. Unfortunately, when they were walking on the second floor, there was S group of Gryffindors waiting for them. Among them was Longbottom, well, well, well. If it isn't the traitor. Harry audibly groaned in exasperation, again with the traitor thing. We barely had more than five conversations, all of which you insulted me and called me a traitor. How can I betray you before even meeting you, you utter imbecile? Daphne elbowed Harry in the chest who promptly shut up. Fine Longbottom started to get under his skin slightly. For some reason, practically the entirety of his Gryffindor classmates called him the traitor. Harry wouldn't have been bothered about it if it just made sense. But they're just repeating what Longbottom is spewing, which was absolute nonsense. Don't pretend like you don't know, traitor, Neville responded with a glare. You know what, I don't care. I betrayed you, or I didn't betray you. I can't be bothered about it. Just think whatever you want but just stay away from me. I don't want your stupidity to be contagious. Weasley interjected, don't you dare talk to him like that. He's the boy who lived. Which means absolutely nothing when you think about it and is not relevant to this conversation in any way, Harry drawled back. 
I bet you were glad when Snape was the Quidditch referee, Potter. Your team wouldn't have had a chance to win the cup without him cheating, the redhead continued. Weasley, look at my face. Take a very good look at it, Harry responded with a dry tone while pointing at his face, now answer me. Does this look like the face of someone who gives a crap about Quidditch? The boy's face was as red as his hair and looked like he wanted to yell at Harry. Alas, the Potter scion raised his hand, look, Snape screwed you with the match. I know it, you know it, the entire school knows it. However, what I'm trying to understand is what you're trying to achieve here. We're just reminding you of your place, you slimy snakes, Longbottom answered. Harry raised an eyebrow, you know, it's amazing. You keep moving your mouth, making noises, but absolute garbage comes out of it. That's it, you're so getting it, Longbottom yelled and raised his wand. Harry discreetly pushed his hand windlessly making him miss his teeth growing hex. The young Slytherin gave him a dry look and raised his eyebrow, now, Longbottom, why are you so angry? You're not mad at me, not really. So why all of this aggression? For losing a Quidditch game? Well, if things keep on the way they are, you'll be playing a lot of these in the next few years. Is it about Snape being unfair? Then why don't you try to harass him and not us? So, what is making you so angry that you're trying to lash out at the world around you? Shut up! The long bottom scion yelled. Harry didn't seem bothered by it and continued, so, I'm getting close. Is it about the points you lost while doing the right thing? Yeah, that happened. Apparently, one day the Gryffindor hourglass was practically empty. It was already getting smaller every day because of Longbottom's behavior, and apparently, the upper years were kinda sick of it. They had complained to McGonagall many times, to no avail. No one knew what happened, except that it was because of Longbottom who practically became a social pariah to the upper year Gryffindors. Yet, yeah, peer pressure at its best, ladies and gentlemen. Harry knew what it was about since Draco kept bragging about how he tricked the Golden Trio into getting caught with a baby dragon of all things. Harry assumed quickly enough that it was the Gryffindor trying to help Hagrid who had ended up with a poisonous baby dragon somehow. It was what the stories had told, but considering how restricted the sale of dragon eggs really was, Hagrid had to know that there was something shady going on. The story was really unbelievable if you think about it. Dragon eggs are worth more than mansions in the black market. It was very unlikely that someone would bet one in a pub in Hogsmeade of all things. Still, McGonagall had caught the golden trio with a caged baby dragon and ended up losing a stupid amount of house points, according to the Malfoy scion at least. Apparently, he was the one who set them up or something. He kept pretending it was some sort of elaborate scheme while all he did was follow them around and tattle to a teacher about it. Well, Longbottom was very angry about it. It would explain the rise in malicious pranks that have been going on for a week or so. Harry had found the pressure point and kept digging at it, oh, so that's it. You're angry because it's not fair. You helped your friends, like a good Gryffindor was supposed to do, protected the school, prevented him from getting hurt, and you were punished for it. Longbottom stopped being coherent anymore and just kept sending spell after spell at Harry, who shielded with a contego. The spell simply washed away on Harry's shield. The dueling practice really did help the speed and stability of his spells. By the end of it, Longbottom was gasping in exertion and Harry continued talking casually, you're not angry at me. I'm just a convenient target. You're angry at the professors, at Dumbledore, who let Snape of all people be a referee to your game, who made you get punished when things would have been worse if you hadn't done what you did. But you can't hex them, can you? You can't yell at them, so you yell at the people you're expected to hate. The Slytherins. Me. How dare you? Weasley tried to speak only for Harry to wave his wand and murmur, Flipendo. The group of first years were pushed back slightly. Harry had made sure to underpower the spell, but they still fell over. Mr. Potter, Mr. Longbottom Harry heard a severe voice coming from behind him. It was Professor McGonagall, my office, now. Harry ignored Longbottom's sulky look and followed the professor. He shouldn't have been so riled up because of him. But Longbottom kept actively looking for him, and after the first few times, it was getting irritating. The two students followed the professor to her office. When they were inside, she motioned them to take a seat and they did. Do you know why you're here, Mr. Potter, the professor asked him. Neville started to answer, Professor. I wasn't talking to you, Longbottom. I'll deal with you later. Believe me, you're in enough trouble already, 
the transfiguration mistress answered her student who gulped. She then turned back to the young Slytherin, So, I ask you again, Potter, do you know why you're here? No, he simply answered. You do not? Well, as you well know casting magic in the corridors is prohibited, the professor started. And yet Longbottom cast dozens of spells at me, while I used two, one of which was a shield. I don't know why you're singling me out here, Harry interrupted her. Yes, and he will be punished accordingly but unlike Longbottom, I expect you to act like a proper polite young wizard. You rarely let yourself be provoked as you were. So, why now? He just wouldn't leave me alone, Professor. Every couple of days, he just does his best to follow me, like he's trying to achieve something. After the first five times, I found that ignoring him just doesn't make him go away, so this was my alternative, Harry retorted. The long bottom scion's cheeks were almost as red as Weasley's hair. He tried to retort back and yet was silenced by a glare from the transfiguration mistress. You say that, and yet you're still trying to provoke him. You really should not treat your classmates this way, especially in front of a professor. No, what shouldn't have happened is Longbottom minding his own business. I am entitled to feel safe in this castle. This is not some battleground, this is a school. And I should be free to walk around without fearing being cursed in the back, and study without looking for dung bombs everywhere I sit. I tried being civil, I tried ignoring him entirely, I tried being witty. If Longbottom only responds to violence, then that's what he'll get. And it's not just me. The upper years are getting sick of their little brothers and sister coming back with no hair or smelling horrible. And they will not be as considerate as to only send an underpowered pushback spell at him and his little gang. The professor seemed mournful for a second, and Mr. Longbottom was punished for every single transgression. I will admit that our punishments do not seem to deter him. He and his friends will serve detention until the end of the semester. He and Weasley are really stressing our patience here and are this close to being expelled. She finished answering while slowly looking at the shaking Greyfinder. Then why don't you just contact his grandmother? The boy just gave his head of house a pleading look and actually started shaking. McGonagall shook her head, I am not here to speak about Longbottom's punishment with you, but your own. You will serve your detention with him and his friends next Sunday. Harry just nodded and left her office, hearing the professor start tearing into the young Greyfinder, as for you, Longbottom. When he made his way to the Great Hall, he found out that dinner was over, and he simply decided to simply go back to the common room. His friends were waiting for him, and they ranted with him about the unfairness of the situation. It was just nice to have people in your corner. By the time he went to bed, he had almost forgotten all about Longbottom and McGonagall, having been distracted while hanging out with his friends. As usual, his sleep was peaceful until something happened. In the middle of the night, Harry heard something scream. Something horrible had happened. He looked around and saw that no one seemed bothered by it. No one seemed to hear it in the first place. The screaming persisted during the night, and Harry didn't get a whiff of sleep because of it. Chapter 49 Eventful Detention March 3, 1992, Hogwarts As usual, his sleep was peaceful until something happened. In the middle of the night, Harry heard something scream. Something horrible had happened. He looked around and saw that no one seemed bothered by it. No one seemed to hear it in the first place. The screaming persisted during the night, and Harry didn't get a whiff of sleep because of it. Harry got the breakfast with his friends with red eyes, and eye bags visibly sagging. He was obviously grumpy to everyone around him and kept grumbling to himself. Daphne gave him a comforting hug, still can't sleep, hey. The Potter Scion repressed to urge to snap at her. It wasn't really her fault that he hasn't been able to sleep for over a week. Normally, Harry treasured his arcane hearing, but he didn't expect such a downside. Every night for a week, magic itself cried out. Something was wrong, violating something truly fundamental to the world. It was horrible. It felt like someone was being tortured over and over again, and Harry was the only one capable of hearing them scream. The worst thing was that it was so loud. Harry had no idea where the noise came from, nor who was responsible for it, only that magic itself was suffering, and it made its pain known to anyone who could hear it. It only happened at night, that's the thing, when the castle is asleep, after midnight, the infernal screaming made itself known and did not stop until the sun rose once more. Harry hasn't been able to have a wink of sleep for almost a week, and the professors were starting to notice it. From falling asleep during class and the occasional potion mistake and miscast spell, 
the professor expressed their disappointment whenever it happened. Harry took their scolding without truly caring. Nothing could really compare to the screaming he was forced to hear every night. Maybe nothing ever will. And worse, the Potter Scion still had to attend his detention with Longbottom of all people. He still had no idea what was happening. As if it was mocking him, a small note appeared next to his cup of coffee. It spelt the following. Your detention will take place at 11 o'clock tonight. Meet Mr. Filch in the entrance hall. Professor McGonagall. Harry grumbled to himself about his miserable position. He was already having trouble sleeping and the detention was in the middle of the night. Tracy looked up, did you say something? He shook his head, nothing. I'm just tired. Just take a dreamless sleep potion. Pomfrey would give you a dose if she saw how sleep-deprived you really are, Blaze said. Harry stifled another groan, they seem to think that he has nightmares. A dreamless sleep potion wouldn't do anything to help him. The only thing he might need is a way to sleep without waking up, and the only potion that fit was the draft of living death, which Harry was not prepared to risk. But it's not like he could tell his friends what was really going on. They wouldn't understand really, and his arcane hearing was something he knew in his gut that he needed to keep as secret as possible. And Harry trusted his gut. The young Slytherin had no intention of arguing with his friends again, and just grumbled and walked away from the table. He slowly made his way to the seventh floor, to the room of requirements. Harry had desperately tried to enter the room while wishing that the noise would stop one night. It did not work one bit. The screaming was as agonizing inside as it was outside. But since the screaming only happened at night, Harry had no issue just sleeping during the morning. It was the weekend, after all. Harry had done his best in completing his assignments either during classes, or during the previous day, and now he had a day of rest. Things weren't looking good for Harry. His entire magical education was on pause. He hadn't practiced his occlumency for a week, and he has barely had time to read a book either. He was barely handling dealing with his schoolwork with little sleep, he did not have the energy to experiment with his magic. Harry went to the room of requirements and walked in front of the hidden entrance while repeating, I wish for a place to sleep. I wish for a place to sleep. I wish for a place to sleep. As expected, the room turned into a giant bedroom with a ridiculously comfortable bed. Harry had almost immediately fallen asleep when his head touched the pillow. When Harry woke up, he was strangely comfortable. Oh, he was nowhere near his best, but he could at least think clearly. As if by reflex, he cast, Tempus. He stood up suddenly when he realized that it was almost time for his detention. He had slept for over 13 hours. He needed to rush and not risk the caretaker's ire. Heaven knows that he's already sadistic enough already. After running down seven floors, Harry barely arrived at the entrance hall in time. Filch was already there, as were Longbottom, Weasley, and Hermione. Harry stifled a groan, he really didn't have the energy to deal with them. Cutting it a little close, aren't you, Potter? Filch remarked, no matter, follow me. He lit up a lamp and lead them outside and started acting creepy. I bet you'll think twice about breaking a school rule again, won't you, Ed? He said, leering at them. Oh yes, hard work and pain are the best teachers if you ask me. It's just a pity they let the old punishments die out, hang you by your wrists from the ceiling for a few days, I've got the chains still in my office, keep em well oiled in case they're ever needed. Right, off we go and don't think of running off, now, it'll be worse for you if you do. Honestly, Harry wondered who let that man anywhere near children. This kind of sadism, especially towards preteens, was just not normal. Anyway, they marched off across the dark grounds and Harry started to slowly realize what their punishment was. No way. No fucking way. They were not going to deal with a unicorn-killing monster that was secretly the Dark Lord possessing their defense against the Dark Arts Professor. Someone had to be laughing at him somewhere. Why of all the detentions, he had to attend that one. Who even lets first years spend their detentions in the forbidden forest of all things? The culprit revealed to himself to be Hagrid, who exclaimed, Is that you, Filch? Hurry up, I want to get started. Harry's heart sank, and he let out a small whine. Longbottom smirked at his expression for some reason. Of course, Filch wanted to take a last dig in, I suppose you think you'll be enjoying yourself with that oaf? Well, think again, boy it's into the forest you're going and I'm much mistaken if you'll all come out in one piece. Yeah, that sealed the deal. They were going to the forbidden forest. Hagrid came striding toward them out of the dark, a large dog at his heel. 
he was carrying his large crossbow, and a quiver of arrows hung over his shoulder. The groundskeeper and the caretaker ended up insulting each other. Harry ignored most of it since he was slowly paling in fear at what was probably coming for them. After the asshole of a caretaker left, Hagrid knelt down at them and spoke seriously, right then, listen carefully cause it's dangerous what we're gonna do tonight, and I don't want no one talking risks. Follow me over here a moment. He led them to the very edge of the forest. Holding his lamp up high, he pointed down a narrow, winding earth track that disappeared into the thick black trees. A light breeze lifted their hair as they looked into the forest. Look there, said Hagrid, see that stuff shining on the ground? Silvery stuff? That's unicorn blood. There's a unicorn in there been hurt badly by Summit. This is the second time in a week. I found one dead last Wednesday. We're gonna try and find the poor thing. We might have to put it out of its misery. Harry audibly groaned, did you seriously ask us to follow you in a forest with something capable of killing a unicorn and drinking its blood? What? Are you scared, Potter? It's just unicorns long bottom taunted. Of course, I'm scared, you idiot. Do you know what's capable of killing a being as innocent as a unicorn? A monster, that's what. To do so, you have to stomach doing truly horrible and accept the curse that comes with it. Am I the only one who is scared of something like that? Harry responded. Hagrid looked uncomfortable, but Weasley interjected on his behalf, You're over-exaggerating, Potter. You're just afraid of the forest. I don't care what you say, I'm not going inside that forest, Harry protested. Yet or if ye want ter stay at Hogwarts. Ye've ye done wrong and now ye've got ter pay for it. Besides, it's probably an accident. The deaths only started a week ago. There's nothing that lives in the forest that'll hurt ye if you're with me or Fang. Harry wasn't convinced one but stiffened, one week, you say. The half-giant nodded, and the potter scion had a lot to think about. This was too coincidental. The magical screaming every night, with such intensity, could be explained by the unicorn killings. The timeline fit. But Harry had never witnessed something this profoundly wrong in his life. It was an abomination. He had never seen a unicorn before, so he didn't understand. But as Harry's magical crest started burning slightly, the young Slytherin felt an irrational revulsion towards whoever was responsible for the horrible act of slaying a unicorn before its time. He couldn't ignore it even if he wanted to. Maybe it was the crest, or maybe it was the desperation at the idea of finally being able to sleep, but Harry irrationally wanted the unicorn killings to stop. He couldn't even say no anyway, so that made no difference. They ended up splitting up while Harry's protest at the idea was completely ignored. Hermione just kept alternating from looking at him guiltily and glaring at her Greyfinder friends for some reason. In the end, Hagrid, Hermione, and Ron ended up forming a group, while Neville, Harry, and Fang made up another one. They followed the silver unicorn blood, walking past a mossy tree stump. Harry could hear running water, there must have been a stream somewhere close by. There were still spots of unicorn blood here and there along the winding path. Longbottom was the one who broke the silence. What's the deal with you and unicorns? You have no idea how dangerous this is, do you? Honestly, I would have been fine with the Thestrals, the fucking giant spiders, the centaurs, and countless magical creatures. But killing a unicorn, that's just wrong. There's a reason we only use the horns and tails, which are harvested after their natural deaths, or sometimes even given away by the unicorn, but killing something this pure, this innocent is abominable in a way that cannot be expressed with words. It would stain your soul and curse you with misfortune. You would live a half-life, a cursed life. It's not a fate I would wish on anyone, but if they killed a unicorn, then they would deserve it. Harry answered passionately. The long-bottom scion seemed nervous about Harry's seriousness in the situation and simply stayed silent. They walked for nearly half an hour, deeper and deeper into the forest, until the path became almost impossible to follow because the trees were so thick. Harry thought the blood seemed to be getting thicker. There were splashes on the roots of a tree, as though the poor creature had been thrashing around in pain close by. Harry could see a clearing ahead, through the tangled branches of an ancient oak. They stayed frozen when they saw it. It was the unicorn all right, and it was dead. Harry had never seen anything so beautiful and sad. Its long, slender legs were stuck out at odd angles where it had fallen and its mane was spread pearly white on the dark leaves. It was bright in a way that Harry never felt possible, and yet so sad. It didn't look real at least not in terms of flesh or blood. It was a being of energy, of light, of innocence, and purity. 
Harry could understand now why it was such an abominable thing to willingly harm such a being. That was when Harry noticed the hooded figure appear from the shadows. It was so malicious, so horrible that Harry shivered. It was wrong in so many ways. Harry watched transfixed as the cloaked figure reached the unicorn, lowered its head over the wound in the animal's side, and began to drink its blood. The moment the blood touched the man's lips, something fundamentally changed. Harry ignored Longbottom's moans of pain as he reached for his scar, too preoccupied at the utter agony and wrongness that seemed to magically scream to everything around it. The world itself cried out at the act, and Harry was deafened by its screams. Chapter 50, Of Rage and Jealousy March 3, 1992, Hogwarts Neville Longbottom hated Harry Potter. Everyone knew that, especially his friends. Ron didn't understand it but accepted it because he was a Slytherin. Hermione really disapproved of it, especially considering how Potter rarely provoked him. Even Neville didn't really understand it at first. When he met Ron in the Hogwarts Express, they became fast friends. They just clicked together. Well, Neville might have latched into him a little, when he rarely interacted with people his age before. His grandmother, Augusta, had practically locked him away in a mansion for all his life, allowing only his family members to visit. After losing her son and her daughter-in-law, she was desperate in protecting her only grandson. The only contact with the outside world he had was with family, like his great-uncle Algy and his wife, who were delighted that House Longbottom had a hero of his caliber and fame, that would be in the annals of history. Because Neville had destroyed the Dark Lord when he was a baby, they all wondered what he would become when he was fully trained. Greatness was expected of him, and every day, he could see their enthusiasm lessen, as he showed them how normal he really was. He wasn't a genius, outside of herbology that is. He is pretty strong for his age, but not that much stronger than his own father, according to his grandmother that is. He wasn't Merlin reborn like everyone expected him to be. Oh, he wasn't a bad student, not at all. He was in the upper bracket in all his classes, and practical magic came easier to him than most. But every day, he could see the hope in his professor's eyes dim slightly, especially with someone like Potter showing him up. Neville didn't know why he immediately disliked the young Slytherin. He never insulted him, he never hexed him, and he never laughed at Malfoy's jokes. But it was the constant comparison to him that angered him. You have trouble with this spell. Potter got it in ten minutes, why can't you? It was the same everywhere. Even his grandmother sent him a letter telling him to be more like the young Slytherin. And they were supposed to be brothers in everything but blood. Neville's grandmother had told him tales of the brave James Potter, the fiery Lily Potter who fought alongside his parents against the terrible Dark Lord. They were so close that his mother was Neville's godmother, and Neville's mother was his godmother. If one of them had survived, they would have probably been raised together as brothers. And so, Neville had expected Potter to be the same. To be together in Greyfinder, hang out, and become fearsome fighters against the Dark. When Potter was sorted into Slytherin of all places, Neville took it as a personal betrayal of his hopes of having a brother, a betrayal of his own family that fought the parents of the people he shared a dormitory with, and a betrayal of everything Neville's parents died for. But he elected to suppress the hurt he felt. He pushed it down, but with every achievement, every congratulation Potter got from the teachers, it kept boiling on and on, until it turned into hatred. Neville Longbottom hated Harry Potter with all his heart. It didn't help that the other boy was just aloof all the time. He just hung out with his friends in Slytherin but ignored Neville completely. He had to instigate anything to get Potter to react, and it never ended up well for the boy who lived. He just ignored their bond, their supposed brotherhood, for no reason. He never gave Neville the time of day, and that made Neville want to blow things up. Oh, Neville hated Malfoy, for being the son of a Death Eater, for insulting him and his family, and for using Snape to punish him but at least he reacted to him. Potter just stays silent, raises an eyebrow or snorts in amusement, and just leaves. Even when Neville had told him about their relation, Potter just didn't care. He didn't react at all. At first, Neville ignored it, he was already busy with finding out who Nicholas Flamel was, and his quid-ditch practice. Well, Hermione had ended up finding Flamel in an alchemy schoolbook of all things, and they had discovered that the third-floor corridor was hiding the Philosopher's Stone, an artifact capable of creating endless riches and providing an elixir of immortality. And well, Quidditch was a lost cause with Snape being the referee. Their hopes were on Neville finding the snitch early, and that simply hadn't happened. He didn't have a stroke of luck like in the Slytherin match and accidentally swallow the snitch. 
Diggory was the one who ended up catching the snitch, in a match that absolutely destroyed Greyfinder's chances at winning the Quidditch Cup. That resulted in Neville just being angry all the time. Wood stopped their endless training sessions, and the mystery of the Forbidden Corridor was solved. He, soon, found something else to preoccupy himself with. Hagrid had hatched a dragon, and Neville took it upon himself to sneak the fire-breathing reptile to a dragon reserve in Bulgaria where Charlie, Ron's brother, worked at. Unfortunately, Malfoy ended up finding out about the entire thing and told them to McGonagall. Yet, yeah, being discovered doing something that could land the average wizard a stay in Azkaban was not a good idea. Dumbledore was able to send the dragon to the reserve and fixed the situation, but they were all given detention every day until the end of the year. And worst of all, they called their guardians. Hermione was in tears after a letter from her parents came through, and Ron's mother had shaken the castle yelling at him. Neville's grandmother on the other hand just gave him a disappointed look and told him that his parents would have been ashamed of him. She even threatened to take him out of Hogwarts and get him taught privately in their mansion. He tried to do the right thing. Why couldn't they all see it? He tried to save a friend, and no one would have gotten hurt if it wasn't for Malfoy. It wasn't his fault, and that was the last straw. Neville was angry. Hogwarts slowly stopped feeling like home and more like a prison. And with all that rage inside of him, he chose to take it out on the Slytherins. They were acceptable targets, right? Well, not according to Hermione, who practically stopped talking to him altogether. He tried to corner Potter multiple times, but he would just not respond. He would ignore him and his friends, and it was driving him insane. He kept going at it, again and again, until Potter finally retaliated, which landed them in this hellish detention. Neville trusted Hagrid, he really did but serving detention in the Forbidden Forest was a monumentally stupid idea. He didn't really understand Harry's aversion to someone killing a unicorn, but when he first saw it, he could understand why such an action was so disturbing. With only Potter at his side, Neville saw a cloaked figure drinking the blood of a unicorn. It was wrong on so many levels, but Neville didn't have time to focus on it, because a pain like he'd never felt before pierced his head, it was as though his scar were on fire. Half-blinded, he staggered backwards, and could do nothing but yell in pain. The hooded figure raised its head and looked right at Neville Unicorn blood was dribbling down its front. It got to its feet and came swiftly toward Neville he couldn't move for fear. Fang, Hagrid's dog, was nowhere to be found. It probably ran away from the cloaked monster. And while the long bottom scion stayed unmoved from his panic and the pain from his scar, he barely saw the sickly green spell coming at him until Potter tackled him out of the way. That was a killing curse he recognized it from the nightmares that haunted his sleep. Potter had just saved his life. He didn't even have time to process it because of the pain, but Potter seemed to send spell after spell at the figure who weaved its way out of it without any problem. Potter even sent a bolt of lightning of all things at the figure who was able to counter somehow. Was the Slytherin holding back that much against him? Neville did not know, but he was outclassed by the Unicorn Slayer, nonetheless. Finally, Potter ended up being banished away his wand slipping from his fingers, away from any trouble. The figure slowly walked towards the boy who lived who was trembling in fear and pain with every step the monster took. At least, that was until he saw Potter run towards them without his wand in his hand. And yet he was different somehow. His eyes were glowing like emerald flames, the magic in the air was so powerful that Neville could taste it. Potter wasn't holding his wand, but he looked intimidating even without it. The cloaked figure froze in its steps as well. The student and the monster stared at each other for what felt like minutes, until the cloaked man moved to attack, where Potter just held out his hand and a circle of weird symbols floated in the air, glowing in white. The young Slytherin was murmuring in a language that Neville simply didn't understand, and as he spoke the circle looked more stable with every syllable to boy spoke, with some kind of blackbird being in the center of it. When the cloak was inches in front of Harry, he moved his hands and spoke with a deep voice, Be gone. A sphere of white magic simply banished the cloaked figure away and the forest seemed to be clearer in a way. It was like there was this tension present ever since they stepped foot inside that was lifted away from Potter's spell. The boy who lived looked at his supposed rival in fear and awe. For the first time since the encounter, the Slytherin turned towards the long bottom scion who flinched at the hard gaze. Before he could do anything, he spoke in the same deep voice, forget, and everything turned black. When Neville woke up, he was still in the forest. He was next to an unconscious potter. Wait a minute, what had happened to them? Oh, yes, the cloaked figure that was killing the unicorns. Potter saved him from a killing curse, fought it, 
and lost badly. Then what happened? Where was the cloaked figure now? All he remembered was the blinding pain in his scar. Hell, he was still in pain. It took a minute or two for the pain to subside and be able to think clearly. When he looked up, there was a centaur standing over him asking softly, Are you alright? Yes thank you what was that? Neville asked. The centaur didn't answer. He had astonishingly blue eyes, like pale sapphires. He looked carefully at Neville, his eyes lingering on the scar that stood out, livid, on Neville's forehead. You are the long bottom boy, he said. You had better get back to Hagrid. The forest is not safe at this time especially for you. Can you ride? It will be quicker this way. Yes, but my friend is hurt. The centaur looked at the unconscious Slytherin and murmured, he used too much magic. He'll be all right in a few days. Make sure you hold him tight so that he doesn't get hurt. My name is Ferenza, by the way. The rest of the way was far less eventful. Ferenza ended up having an argument with another centaur called Bane. Something about interfering with the stars or something. Neville was too tired to care. When they arrived at the edge of the forest, Ferenza lowered, allowing the two boys to get down. Neville asked, Ferenza, what was the thing drinking the unicorn's blood? Neville Longbottom, do you know what unicorn blood is used for? I don't know. Potter said something about it being an abomination and being cursed. He's a wise boy, you friend, the centaur remarked, it is a monstrous thing to slay a unicorn. Only one who has nothing to lose, and everything to gain, would commit such a crime. The blood of a unicorn will keep you alive, even if you are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. You have slain something pure and defenseless to save yourself, and you will have but a half-life, a cursed life, from the moment the blood touches your lips. Neville stared at the back of Ferenza's head, which was dappled silver in the moonlight. But who'd be that desperate? He wondered aloud. If you're going to be cursed forever, death's better, isn't it? It is, Ferenza agreed, unless all you need is to stay alive long enough to drink something else something that will bring you back to full strength and power something that will mean you can never die. Mr. Longbottom, do you know what is hidden in the school at this very moment? The Sorcerer's Stone. Of course the elixir of life. But I don't understand who dash. Can you think of nobody who has waited many years to return to power, who has clung to life? awaiting their chance. Neville shivered in fear, no, he's dead. I killed him when I was a baby. It's impossible. In this world of magic and wonder, very few things are impossible, young Longbottom. Before he could ask anything, he was accosted by Hagrid, Hermione, and Ron. After reassuring them that he was all right, he turned to thank the centaur, only to find out that it was gone. First, he needed to get Potter to an infirmary, then he needed to tell his friends about what happened after they go back to the common room. He needed to be discreet. His grandmother can never know, she would take him out of school for fear of him getting hurt. As for Potter, perhaps Neville had misjudged him. He might have been a Slytherin, but he had saved his life. He had to acknowledge that debt after all. He needed to think about what to do later. You know whose possible return was a far more important issue than Potter, after all. 